Chapter 13 I wish I could say what happened that week, but I was in and out of it so often that I honestly couldn't remember much. I passed out a few more times. I slept a lot. I missed a lot of class. By the end of the week, I was feeling better and more like myself again, but it was kind of scary to think about all the stuff I'd spaced out on. I'd literally been walking around like a zombie all week. My clearest memory went back to the day of the soccer game before it blanked out. Playing soccer with everyone had been so much fun. I really missed doing stuff like that. I wanted to be active again, but the whole reason I'd sat out in the first place was because I worried something bad could happen. It should have been fine for me to play, but I pushed myself too hard and I embarrassed myself again. I didn't want to be Superman. I just wanted to do the same stuff everyone else could. But something else worried me. Last semester, I would have been able to play a game of soccer just fine. After all, the tournament was ten times worse than that, and I'd gotten along mostly okay until the end. I knew what it meant. I was getting worse. The first week of March, I got another letter delivered by Baxter from Perot. I headed down to his office, hoping he'd have something other than disappointment to offer me this time. Perot seemed somber. Sit down, Liam. I did as he said, and he immediately launched into business without messing around, which I liked. As far as the data shows, you're in the clear to begin using magic. It seems that your element has a different effect on you than what I thought. So I can use my element again, I said. Not that I've been following the rules much. I'd been cheating the past week or so. Perot nodded. Yes, but be aware it's more or less poisoning yourself. Your magic is hurting you, but it's clear that not using it harms you more severely in the short term. It's a case of you having to use the very thing that's killing you slowly to keep yourself alive. That's typical, I crossed my arms. So if I can't stop using the thing that's killing me, how do we get closer to figuring out how to offset the symptoms? I didn't want to say, find a cure. I wasn't that optimistic. We need to find a way to replace the magic that's being drained, Perot said, though I'm not sure that's possible. You can't exactly transfuse magic. It's not something that's transferable. Perot rubbed his face. Not since the days of Anarchy, anyway. What do you mean? I asked. That's how they used to heal. Anarchy transferred their powers into the bodies of their patients, and the patient's own systems would be bolstered by the magic, using the spirit element to heal itself. He shook his head. That's impossible for anyone that isn't from the soul house. Aren't there other magical races that can heal? I asked. Yes, but their powers are different from ours. They wouldn't be able to help you, Liam. Our magic comes from spirit, and spirit is what your body needs to repair itself. Perot looked different than he ever had. He seemed sad. Liam, I want to tell you something. This is difficult for me to say, as you've become rather like a son to me since we've started these sessions. I know you're young, but I'd advise you to start thinking of... Perot dropped off. It felt like every organ in my body, heart, lungs, everything, stopped working then. Just say it, I said. I can take it. Perot's voice was heavy. The data is clear. Your organs are failing, Liam. Every system. And I don't know how to fix it. That was like a punch to the gut. My head went kind of foggy. It was hard to hear what Perot was saying as he continued. There's been a lot of damage already, and it's only getting worse. If we can't find a way to stop the deterioration, there's no way to repair what's already been done. I I'm sorry. He kept saying he was sorry. I wanted him to stop. It was like he was talking through a fishbowl or far away. It was hard to comprehend. I heard his words in disconnected sentences. What? I'm saying you might want to get your affairs in order, Perot said gently. Just in case it doesn't work out. I'm not sure how much time you have. Months? A year, maybe? I'd said a similar thing to Sophia at the start of the year. Just in case it doesn't work out. Sophia. 
I stood up. My legs were wobbling. Thank you for trying to help me, Professor. I headed for the door. It was like I was drunk. I'm not giving up yet, Liam, Perot called after me, but it barely registered. My mind was too busy, frantically whirling with what I was going to do. As I left the room, it felt like my head was buzzing with a hive of bees. My head kept jumping from place to place. I didn't know what to do. Maybe I wouldn't need to bring Nishoma back after all. What was the point? He'd just die again right after I did, which, according to Perot, wasn't going to be much longer. Fuck, how was I going to tell my family? How was I going to tell Sophia? Fuck yeah, I was scared. I didn't want to die. But what nobody told you about dying was that leaving the people you loved behind was the worst part of it. I wasn't ready to be without them, and I knew they weren't ready to be without me. I didn't really know where I was going to go, but my legs carried me to the Toakwa dorms. I saw my brother sitting on the couch with Diami perched on his knees, laughing at a joke somebody told him. It was early, so there weren't that many people in here. Seeing as fucking killed me. What was I going to say to him? Ezra was smiling. He was having a good day. He'd always been such a cheery kid. Kind of dumb, yeah, but the guy had a heart bigger than California. The news would crush him. I decided then. I'd keep it quiet from my family. For now. When stuff started getting really bad, I'd tell them the bad news. But I didn't want them to worry right now. There was no need for it. Liam, hey, Ezra said, and he got off the couch. Diami went fluttering into the air and landed on a nearby perch. His friends went off to swim in the pool, leaving us isolated on the other side of the room. I got a problem. It physically fucking hurt to look at him. What is it? I asked in a leaden tone. He took it as my usual pissed offness and didn't notice. Well, I like Marina, and she's really sweet, but I like Kata, too, and she's so funny, and they're both pretty hot. Thing is, they're jealous. I promised them I'd take them both out for a date on Saturday, but I forgot, so now I've got to let one of them down. Which one do you like better? I wished I could be like Ezra, where my biggest problem was which girl to take out on a Saturday. I rolled my eyes. I swear to the ancestors, I don't know where you get this obsession with girls from. You tell me. Sophia sounded like she liked it when you guys were getting it on in the commons. Ezra grinned. My face turned fucking red. What the fuck? How do you know about that? I walked in on you guys. That was you, I said, recalling the loud noise from that night. Hey, I'm the least of your worries, Ezra said, throwing his hands up. You should be glad it was me and not somebody else. I guess that was true, but it was still embarrassing that it had been my little brother. My tone turned suspicious. Hey, what were you doing out so late that night anyhow? It was a Friday night. Everybody stays up late, he said. Sure, I said. I bet he'd been coming from or going to the same thing me and Sophia had been doing. Hypocrite. Relax, I'm not going to tell anyone. Ezra leaned in. So, was it good? Shut up. I shoved his face away. Ezra laughed. He then turned serious. Oh, uh, by the way, Mom wants you to bring Sophia over tonight for dinner. We're celebrating me bonding, but she made it clear she wants Sophia there. What? No, I said immediately. Why? You tell me, Ezra shrugged. She says it's because she wants to get to know your tournament partner better, but if that were really true, she'd invite Jonah and Imogen too. I personally think she suspects something. You didn't tell her anything, did you? Me? No. He shook his head, then paused. Unless Maddie said something to her. That has to be it, I said under my breath. Madeline and her stupid visions. I hope to the ancestors Maddie's magic hadn't shown my innocent little sister anything too explicit. But I hardly thought Mom needed her prophetic daughter to tell her anything. Mom was the type of person who knew everything, didn't matter what tribe you were from. She was friends with everybody, including the professors at Arenda, and therefore always heard news first and had the best gossip. Mom also ruled the house. Bringing Sophia over was definitely not a request. 
Fine, I grumbled. I'll bring her. Is dad going to be there? Yeah, you better hope to the ancestors he doesn't find out about you too, Ezra said. Let's just pray he doesn't walk in on you. You want to see him blow his fucking top? Because I don't, I said. I'm not stupid enough to screw around at home. Can't say I would blame you. Sophia is sexy. Ezra nodded in approval. She's going to be the hottest sister-in-law ever. Do you ever stop talking? The room wavered again. I reached out and put a hand on the wall to steady myself. You okay? Ezra's brows knitted together. I'm gonna go lie down, I mumbled, and I moved around Ez to go to my room. I laid on my back on my bed and formed a water ball out of what had been left sitting in a glass, then weaved it above me, making it churn and form into different shapes, tossing it from one hand to the other. I used to do this for hours when I'd gotten my powers. It helped me think. Perot said I was dying. Not something I didn't know, but also I didn't know I was dying so quickly. He said I had a year at most. I was 21 years old. How could I have less than a year to live? Did it change things when it came to the Tawakwa elders and their plot to murder Sophia? No, it didn't change a damn thing. It didn't matter if I was dead or not. If they thought Sophia was the prophesied one, they'd find someone else to take her out after I was gone. And the next person might not be so reluctant to do what they asked. I wouldn't be around to protect her which meant I needed to do what I could, now, and find a way to convince the Tawakwa elders I was committed to this thing, committed to killing her if I couldn't prove her innocence. I had to buy her some time with what little time I had left. Fuck, how was I supposed to do that? One thing was for sure. If I didn't have long, I didn't want to lie around in this bed all day and wait to die. I forced myself to get up and take a shower, because I hadn't earlier, and got ready to go find Sophia. I found myself playing with the droplets in the shower. Hadn't done that in a while. We'd talked about meeting in the Navita Gardens yesterday, which was the one thing I did remember, thank the ancestors. By the time I got out there, it was nearly noon. I hoped I hadn't kept Sophia waiting for too long. It was a gorgeous day, hot for March. Spring was finally coming back to Northern California. The Navita Gardens were beautiful and filled with every type of flower, including hedges shaped in the sculptures of various magical creatures. One large hedge in particular in the shape of a tree was in the center of the garden, surrounded by a huge maze. It was ironic that there was a plant sculpted in the shape of another plant out here, but hey, it wasn't my garden. There were a lot of Navita in the garden with their creatures, tending the plants and playing with their familiars. The garden was loaded with butterflies of all sizes, some small and some almost as big as a small child. They terrified some people, but I didn't have a problem with insects, so I just moved around them. I remembered that Sophia and I had our second kiss out here during the elemental ball and smiled. That had been a nice memory. I spotted Jonah and Imogen before I did Sophia. They'd built some sort of wooden runway and were ordering Squeaks and Sassy to walk back and forth on it, changing various outfits every time they got to the end. But they weren't the only ones. Jonah was also changing outfits and was prancing up and down the stage like it was his personal walkway. People in the garden pointed and stared, but fuck them. At this point, it started to become a compliment for the reject team. My eyes searched the garden for Sophia. I found her in front of the stage, a textbook and a bunch of papers gathered around her as she sat cross-legged in the grass. She'd worn a dress like I'd asked, a pretty blue one that looked really nice on her. It got me excited that she'd worn one just for me. I couldn't wait to get to that later. Essis kept on pointing to various pictures in the book she was reading, but she shook her head each time. He looked frustrated. She hadn't noticed me yet. I pictured her face when I told her the news that I was dying and how it'd fall apart. I couldn't keep this to myself. It was too hard. Fuck, it felt like I was gonna explode just carrying it around or wither away inside. I just wanted the whole world to know without me having to explain it to them. When I caught her eye, I knew I couldn't lie to her. This was too big a burden for me to shoulder by myself. 
I wasn't even that strong. I wanted to tell her, and I knew I needed to. But not today. I'd put it off today. I wanted to forget and be happy. I sat next to her on the grass. Hey, I said. I nudged her and she looked up. Her confused expression instantly cleared. Hi, she said. I'm glad to see you. I worried you weren't coming. I'm feeling fine today, I said, already knowing what she was getting at. I pointed at her papers. What's with that? It's our day. No homework, remember? I know. She stroked Essis's ears back and he grumbled. But this project's due next week and I haven't even started. That wasn't like her to be behind. I went to ask her what was up before I heard exaggerated arguing above us. Jonah, just put it on, Imogen said, waving a really ugly scarf his way. He shook his head. Nah, hon, purple is my color. Red's my color. Mauve is most definitely not my color. What are you guys doing? I asked. I have to do a project for my Hawkeye fashion design and merchandising class, so I chose a runway show, Imogen said, turning to me. And I'm the star, obviously, Jonah put in. We're practicing. But it's my grade, so you should do as I say, Imogen put in. Jonah took his hair out of his man bun and shook it. Then you should pay me more, darling. I'm not paying you anything. You guys will work it out. Sophia dug around in a picnic basket by her side. We packed a lunch. You hungry, Liam? I shook my head. I didn't want to eat. I threw up everything that I took down lately if it wasn't water or toast. Jonah and Imogen came off the stage, and Sophia distributed sandwiches. Essis took three for himself and sucked them down in seconds before he gave a few to Squeaks and Sassy. Imogen argued with Jonah about the fashion show, and he argued back with a full mouth. I kept watch on the other people in the garden and played with the strands of Sophia's hair when nobody was looking. Sophia kept working throughout lunch until she slammed her book shut and said, Ugh, I hate this. Somebody kill me. My stomach lurched, though it had only been a joke. Jonah swallowed his fifth sandwich and said, I could try to oblige, but it probably wouldn't work out. I don't think there's a murder weapon lying around you could use, Sophia joked back. Not like that. There are lots of ways an elementi can kill people, Imogen said. Ooh, Sophia wiggled her eyebrows. Tell me, I totally love those crime shows on TV. This is like way better. My friends were fucking morbid. Nothing like having a fashion show and then discussing murder in excessive detail. Well, Kuigni have it easiest, obviously, because they can just burn you to death, and Navita can crush you and strangle you with roots, but Toaqua and Yapluma can get away with it, Jonas said. How so? Sophia asked. Well, a Yapluma can take all the air from your lungs and suffocate you, but it's really hard to do. Not a lot of Yapluma are able to, you know, because of the natural magic that flows through an Elementai's veins that protects them. Jonah said. To aqua are the same way. They can make all the water in your blood rush to your heart. It's quick and painless, but most water elementi can't harness enough energy to fight against the body's natural impulses. And if the victim is magical, the magic that's naturally in the blood. It sounds hard. I understand why most to aqua can't do it, Sophia said. Liam can, Jonah said, and I cringed. He used to do it all the time when we were hunting with his dad, kill animals quickly after we shot them so they wouldn't suffer. Liam, you're really talented, Sophia said, almost in awe. I wish she wouldn't take it that way. The ability to kill someone easily was nothing to celebrate. Yeah, he is, Jonas said with a side glance at me. Good thing he's sick, otherwise the rest of us would be in fucking trouble. I was made that way so the rest of you would have a fighting chance to keep up, I said. I couldn't resist giving a smirk. Thankfully, Imogen and Jonah went back to what they had been doing after that, so we stopped talking about how to kill people. Sophia returned to her project, but now that the topic had been brought up, I couldn't get it out of my head. If I had to do it, if the Tawakwa elders forced me to kill Sophia, that would be the way. I'd rush all the blood to her heart. She wouldn't even feel it. She'd be here one moment and gone the next. 
I'd do it to her and Essis at the same time, so that neither one of them would know what was happening to the other and they could go together. I think if I had to stop Sophia's heart, it would stop mine too. Maybe, hopefully, my illness would kill me off before it got to that point. Like I had that kind of luck. Sophia kept on letting out impatient huffs, and Essis did the same whenever she did. This was getting annoying. I saw that the textbook was for Hawkeye careers. Are you still having trouble with that class? Yes, she slumped her shoulders. I can't pick anything I want to do for the rest of my life. I'm going to fail. You're not. I took the book from her and closed it, tossing it aside. How about you try talking about it instead? I feel like I should just know. She put her head in her hand and looked at me. How did you figure out what you wanted to do? It was chosen for me, I started, but it didn't really matter. Deep down, I always wanted to be chief. I don't really know what's left for me now because that's impossible. So what are you going to do now since you can't be, she asked. It hurt to hear the question because my automatic response was, no worries, I'll probably die before I graduate. But I forced out, I'll go wherever dad puts me. It doesn't matter where. I always wanted to serve the tribe. You deserve to be chief. You're a good leader. We wouldn't have made it through the tournament without you, Sophia said. Bullshit, you would've, I said. No, we wouldn't have, Jonah called back overhearing us. Then he went back to shaking his ass. It looked like the runway session had turned into practice for a strip show. Squeaks and Sassy were copying him. Imogen looked like she was having a crisis. There was something Sophia wasn't telling me. I don't buy that you have no idea what you want to do, I said. Everybody has at least one small dream. Even if, apparently, it's to be a professional stripper like Jonah. Sophia laughed aloud before her face became worried. It's stupid. I won't think that it is. She sighed and laid backward on the grass, throwing her arms over her head. Okay, I haven't told anyone this, but all I really wanted to be since I was a kid was... Well, a mom. Really? I was surprised. You don't seem like the barefoot and pregnant type. She gave a half-hearted laugh. <laughs> That's because I hide it. I totally am. She let out a huff, and Essa started braiding the hair that had fanned around her head. She kept talking, rambling now. I can't imagine having a career because when I look into the future, all I see is me having kids. I always wanted this big family. I didn't really want to go to work, but not because I wanted to be lazy. I just wanted to stay home and raise children. But in this country, I didn't think it was possible. Families need two incomes to survive now. Unless I married a guy with a bajillion dollars, it's impossible. She sighed in frustration. I see. Sophia had given me a lot to think about. Is that dumb? Her eyes searched me. Her expression was worried, like I was going to judge her or something. No, I looked at her. I don't think that it is. Secretly, I thought that it was kind of hot. I'd always wanted a big family, too. When I was dating Mia, she was fine with staying home. But it was because she didn't want to work, not because she wanted to have a bunch of kids. She told me she'd have one child to fulfill the requirement to pass on the chiefhood, and she was done. I'd been disappointed. Mom had stayed home to raise us, and it was a good thing, too. Dad was so busy with the chiefhood that he needed her help all the time. I didn't think our family or the tribe, really, would have gotten along without her if she was busy working a job instead of helping my dad. I wanted someone like her to be my wife. My mom meant a lot to me. You should do your project on being a stay-at-home parent. Really, I added as Sophia gave me a skeptical look. Do it on how crucial children are to the tribe. I'll totally fail. You don't get paid for having kids, she said. No, but it's still important, I told her. And you're not making any headway as it is. The project's due soon. You'll fail anyway if you don't turn anything in. What do you have to lose? She bit her lip and stared up at the sky. I guess you're right. Thanks, Liam, for helping. Anytime. Sophia could ask for my help whenever she wanted to. Even though I was water and she was fire, the closer we got to each other, the more perfect of a fit we seemed to be. 
Our values and what we wanted long-term out of life matched up. If we were from the same tribe, things would be so different. But she wanted kids. Even if Perot managed to figure out a miracle cure and I survived, that was something we could never have. But that's the one thing she wanted out of life, to have a family. If she was with me, that couldn't happen. Could I really take away her dream? That wasn't right. So we just don't have kids. Simple, she'd said in the gardens last year, like it was. No, Sophia, not so simple. Was she really willing to give that all up for me? Man, she crazy loved me. Imogen was at her limit. Stop, 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 she said, bringing the fashion show to a screeching halt. I need to redo some of these outfits. You ripped them, Jonah. Oops, Jonah said, looking at the hole in his pants he'd torn. Sorry, baby cakes. Imogen packed up her things and complained that the repairs would take her all afternoon. Jonah was going on about how there were tryouts for the school's college soccer team later. Sophia and I didn't have anything else to do before dinner, so we said we'd come watch. We made our way down the staircase so we could get to the soccer fields out back. We were interrupted when we ran into a group of people in the hallway that I never wanted to see again. When Jonah saw them, he screeched to a halt. A vaguely disguised expression of horror flashed across his face before he quickly rearranged it into a pretend mask of happiness. Motherfucker, I muttered under my breath, and Sophia heard. Who's that? Sophia whispered to me as a group of people approached. Jonah's family, I said back quietly, then kept my mouth shut as they stopped in front of us. Jonah's parents were both short, barely five feet, very thin and small. They wore clothes that boasted how expensive they were and had equally tight and pinched faces that looked like they sucked on lemons for a living. His mother, Joyce, had a small monkey perched on her shoulder while at his father, Jason's side, walked a Tasmanian devil. His sister, Jenny, was the same as they were. She had her hair cut short and couldn't have weighed more than 120 pounds. Her girlfriend, Charity, was by her side and holding her hand dutifully. They looked like the perfect couple. Jenny had a wolverine at her feet, while Charity carried a tiny rabbit in her free arm. Jason and Joyce Chani were the most self-important big heads that I'd ever had the displeasure to meet. Why did these assholes have to show up here? Orenda was the one place Jonah could get away from them and their shitty influence. Squeaks eyed them hatefully. She stood close with her body wrapped around Jonah, and her wings posed at the ready as if to fight them like she had Raynar's familiar Alvaris. Even though Jonah towered over all of them, he seemed to shrink five feet in their presence. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad, he said weakly. What's going on? Where were you yesterday? Jason barked without even a greeting. Jonah visibly cringed. I told you guys I had homework to do. I've been really busy with school, Jonah replied weakly. That's no excuse. I don't understand how you could do this to us. Since you've come to school, you never visit. Joyce sniffed. Jenny gave a grin that could make honey taste sour. He probably thinks that he's better than us now, seeing since he won the cup. I do not, Jonah mumbled meekly, but it was so small that you could hardly hear him. That's no excuse. You think you're so great now that you can abandon the family? Jason asked. Though all of us were standing right there, his parents continued to yell at Jonah. They didn't even act like we were alive. My knuckles cracked. Sophia snaked her hand out to hold mine. Squeaks blocked it so nobody could notice. We need you at home. There are things that need to get done, Jason snapped. You're coming with us. Jonah was apprehensive. But there's soccer tryouts today, and I kind of wanted to... Didn't you hear me? You're needed, Joyce demanded. Stop being so selfish and think of your family for once. Jonah hunched his shoulders. It looked weird, such a big person trying to hide. Oh, um, I guess it's okay, Jonah said. I didn't really want to make the team anyway. I frowned. Jonah really wanted to play sports this year. He'd been going on about it all semester every time he had a chance to. Jason moved forward as if to grab Jonah and pull him behind. 
Don't make a scene. Let's go. Squeaks let out a low sound, almost like a warning. Her tail was lashing. Jason noticed and took a step back. I gotta go, guys, Jonah said, and he waved to us. See you later. At least he acknowledged us. Jonah followed his family with a hung head. It took everything I had to stand there and not have a total freak out. Squeaks' hoofsteps were loud and direct as she clopped behind Jonah, her beak at the ready. Squeaks wouldn't let anything happen to him. It was still bullshit, though. None of us really knew what to say. Imogen stood there with an arm full of clothes, looking dazed like she'd been punched in the face. I've got to get this stuff done, Imogen said quietly, and she held up the pile of outfits she carried. See you guys later. Imogen headed off, sassy at her heels. Sophia dropped my hand and said, They're Jonah's parents? Yeah, aren't they such great people? I said sarcastically. But, but Jonah's so nice, Sophia said, not understanding. I know, he deserves better than them. I shook my head. Don't bring it up to him later, okay? It'll just upset him. Okay, Sophia said quietly. She'd been holding Essis, who was still staring at the door Jonah had walked out of. Well, I guess there goes our plans for the day. Not entirely, I said. I've been meaning to tell you, my mom invited you over for dinner tonight. Dinner? She raised an eyebrow. Like at your house? A coigny in the middle of Tawakwa tribe grounds? I know it's weird, but just go with it, I said. I pulled on the edge of her skirt and said, follow me. I have a surprise for you. A surprise, she said. Essis's ears perked up in interest. I could totally read her tone. Stop being so horny, I said, and she laughed. It's a different kind of surprise. I took her near the Tawakwa dorms, where there were a bunch of large pillars we could hide behind. I went back to my room and came back with a wrapped gift. I wanted to give you something, I said, handing it to her as I sat beside her on a stone bench. She took it, and Essis sniffed the wrapping paper. Are you going to stop buying me presents? She asked, giving a coy look up. Never. Open it. Essis did the work for her. The creepy bastard grabbed the paper and ripped before Sophia could even try to open it. It was a good thing, too. She was one of those annoying people that carefully took off the wrapping paper by the tape, piece by piece, just so she could reuse the paper. A camera! Sophia lit up as Essis tossed the wrappings to the floor. Go ahead, take it out of the box, I encouraged. I liked giving her presents. Her eyes sparkled as she opened the camera and examined it, putting on the matching extended lens. Holy guacamole, Liam, Sophia gushed. This camera is crazy expensive. You had to have spent like a grand on it. You're welcome. And please don't ever say holy guacamole again, I said. It's too much. I can't accept this, she said, handing it back. Take it, I pushed it toward her again. It hardly put a dent in my savings. I had a lot of money in there, and the tournament winnings only made it more cushy. Plus, the camera wasn't enchanted or sabotaged like the flowers had been. It had just been a plain old camera. It was an actual gift, from me to her. Just be sure to keep it hidden, I said. If the elders find it, they'll go nuts. I'll be careful, Sophia put it into the matching case that I got for her. I can't believe this. It's not even my birthday. The smile wouldn't leave her face. Essis took the camera out of the case and started playing with it, acting like he was some big shot photographer. It doesn't need to be your birthday or a holiday to get you something, I said. Then, as an afterthought, added, Hey, what day is your birthday? The prophecy said something about it, but I forgot, because I tried to push that damn thing out of my mind as often as I could. June 21st, she said. What? No way, so is mine, I said, surprised. Really? That's so much fun. We have matching birthdays. Her smile got wider before it fell. Didn't Nishoma die on your birthday? I sighed. Yeah, kind of ruined my birthday for the rest of my life. I gave a slight smile. Now we can just celebrate yours instead. I like that better. No, 
we should celebrate it together this year, she offered, before adding, if that would make it better. I nodded. It totally would. Summer was coming. It would be so much easier for us to be able to sneak around. We'd be able to hang out as much as we wanted. You want to try it out, I said, gesturing to the camera. I charged it before I gave it to you, and I know the perfect spot. Sure. She took the camera away from Essis and put it back in the case. Let's go. We snuck out of the school. I took Sophia to a really thin trail that wound through the trees and had a lot of foliage we had to cross over. It was really reclusive, which meant no one would find us. It's so cool you know all these hidden trails, she said. I've spent my whole life exploring this place. I know where everything is, I told her. The trail ended at a beach. There were a variety of large trees growing oranges by the shore, and they were full of rainbow-colored parrots that squawked in the trees. When they flew, they emitted light beams from their wings, which reflected off the water. Large sea turtles clustered around the seashore, their shells made of diamonds. Wow, this is incredible, Sophia said. She immediately started snapping pictures of the birds and all the unique wildlife. I sat and watched her play with the camera while I rested. The walk had taken a lot out of me. Essis got on one of the turtles and tried riding it like he was in a rodeo. It didn't move very fast. Better than the waterfall? I asked when she sat down next to me in the sand. There had to be like a hundred pictures on there by now. I hoped she hadn't snuck any of me. She shook her head. Nothing's as special as the waterfall. That's our place. Essis had given up on the turtles and was in the trees, eating as many oranges as he could. When the birds tried to take the oranges from him, he threw them at the parrots. Sophia snickered and called for Essis. He came down from the trees, practically waddling. One more orange and he would have rolled down to us. Sophia checked her watch. It's getting late. We should go. Right. I stood up and held out a hand to help her up. We stood at the edge of the water. Sophia held Essis and said, How are we supposed to get down there anyhow? I'm Coigny. I'll drown. Working on it, I said. I dug in my pocket and pulled out a handful of brown capsules. I always carry some of these. These are pills filled with powdered coral reeds. They'll slow down your heart rate so you can hold your breath for longer, I said. Tawakwa take it to improve their lung capacity. Since you're Coigny, I think you should take a double dose. It should last up to 30 minutes. I stood by the water and held my hand out over it. By the way, you should probably not tell anyone about those. They're supposed to be a Tawakwa tribe secret. Sophia downed the pills and gave the rest to Essis. I took one of my own before I motioned at the water, using my element to call out to the creatures below. Sophia came close, and out from the water came two creatures. They looked like horses, but they had both fur and scales, and where their back legs were supposed to be were long fish tails. In place of ears were fin-like extremities. They were basically equine mermaids. One was a pale blue, while the other was a deep green, both of their colors matching the sea. They came onto shore and nickered at us, ears perking pleasantly. They're beautiful, Sophia said, reaching out to stroke one. They're hippocampi, I told her. They work for my dad. They'll take us to my house. The blue one is Cascade, and the green one is Topi. Climb on. I got onto Topi, and Sophia climbed aboard Cascade. Essis hopped onto Cascade in front of her, and Sophia grabbed a hold of Cascade's long, silky mane, which looked like seaweed. Hold on, I told her. Cascade immediately dove downward, and my mount followed. The hippocampi swam forward in powerful strides, and I had to flatten myself against my ride so I wouldn't be blown off. The creatures swam forward in the water, around schools of fish and sharks, until lights started dotting the ocean ahead of us. After about ten or so minutes of swimming, Essis pointed. All around us, buildings were rising out of the coral and seaweed, the Tawakwa village was full of tall glass towers with interconnecting tubes that allowed people to walk from one building to the other without swimming. Tawakwa rode their water familiars all around. It was crowded this time of day. 
he almost ran into a guy riding a large manta ray and a woman with a giant sea serpent. The towers were decorated with designs of shells, waves, and water creatures. Some buildings were constructed out of sunken ships or made in designs that looked like jellyfish. Under the ocean, the entire city looked like a vibrant underwater kingdom. I watched Sophia carefully as we swam through town. If she showed any signs of struggling to breathe, I'd grab her and rocket her up to the surface. But she looked fine. Her eyes were wide with delight at all the beautiful sights the Tawakwa City had to offer. She loved it. It made a warm feeling grow in my chest. For as coigny as she was, Sophia had a lot of Tawakwa traits. The hippocampi started tilting upward, and we hung on. When we got back on shore, I dried Sophia off before I removed the water from myself. We were on the beach again, but this was a secluded beach far out to sea. We stood in front of a mansion made of yellow walls, glass, and stone on a private island that was hundreds of feet across in all directions. Tall golden towers spiraled up to the sky, and there were two pools on either side. Trees lined the brick pathway to the front door. Is this where the Tawakwa tribe holds meetings? Sophia asked, looking around. What? No, it's where I live, I said, caught off guard. That's your house? Sophia squeaked. Yeah, what of it? I asked. You live in a freaking palace. No, I don't. It's just a house, I said, irritated. Sophia made a skeptical noise. Yeah, okay, a house fit for a prince. You didn't tell me you were practically water tribe royalty, she mumbled. Don't say that. I wrinkled my nose. It's not a big deal. Essis had his mouth wide open. He craned his neck back to look upward at my house. I opened the front door. Sophia was still mumbling about how her house back in Utah would fit inside mine three times over. Inside, the house was painted in light blue, yellow, and white tones. The floors were dark hardwood, and the house was decorated with things like oars, life preservers, throw pillows, and large plants. There were other things too, like tribal drums. Mom loved interior decorating. A lot of rooms opened up to the beach, and there was a lot of light from all the windows. You have a fucking chandelier, Sophia hissed. So do a lot of people, I snapped back. I raised my voice and said, Mom, I'm home. Out from the kitchen stepped Haloke Maito. Mom wore a long blue sundress and was covered with flour. She was blasting Hawkeye music in the kitchen as loud as she could, and it looked like she'd been dancing to it. She had a long black braid that went all the way down her back and didn't have any shoes on. Mom was eight months pregnant and about ready to tip over. That didn't stop her from hurtling toward me at lightning speed. Liam, sweetheart. She kissed my cheek and patted my hair, getting flour in it. How are you doing, honey? Fine, Mom, I said. I turned and said, this is Sophia, by the way. Sophia! Mom screamed her name like they'd known each other forever and they hadn't seen one another in years. She threw her arms around my girlfriend and hugged her as tightly as her pregnancy would allow. I'm so glad to finally meet you. Liam talks so much about you. I turned a little pink. Sophia seemed a little surprised by Mom's forwardness, but that didn't stop her from saying, Oh, does he? Yes, he very much enjoys talking about you. Mom's eyes sparkled when she saw Essis. And who is this little one? She tickled Essis under his chin, and he sagged his ears in delight. She pulled out a cookie from her dress and handed it to him. He immediately scarfed it down. That's Essis, Sophia said, and he's going to be your best friend now. Mom clapped her hands. Sophia, would you mind helping me in the kitchen? I need to get these biscuits made for dinner. I would very much enjoy it if you helped. Without waiting for her to respond, Mom took Sophia's hand and frolicked to the kitchen. Sophia's face was bewildered, but the look I shot back at her told her to just go with it. I heard fighting somewhere down the hall. Katie and Christian were both eight, and they were arguing again. It's mine! No, it's mine! Ugh! It sounded like they were gonna draw blood. 
I headed down the hall to pull them apart and saw that Christian had something in his hands. They were playing with Dad's ceremonial arrows again, which they were not supposed to touch. These two had an affinity for everything that was violent. Hey, stop that. You're going to poke your eye out, I said crossly. I wrenched the arrow out of his hands. Don't you know not to take things that don't belong to you? Christian grinned. Ooh, Liam's back, and he brought his girlfriend. Shut up, I said. Just mind that you don't have one. Oh, I got all the ladies lining up for me, don't worry, Christian said, brushing off his shirt. He was like a little Ezra in the making. What a nightmare. Katie hit him on the back of the head. You do not. All the girls at school hate you. Well, all the boys at school hate you, Christian said back. So there, she shrugged. Good. Life's better without men anyway. Christian's mouth dropped open. It was fun watching his smart ass get put in his place. Then Katie turned her sass on me. Hey, Liam, where is your girlfriend? I didn't say she was my girlfriend, Katie. You know she's from Coigny, I said slowly. Katie grinned deviously. You didn't deny it. She's probably hiding from your ugly mug, Katie. You scared her away, Christian taunted. Katie punched him in the face and took off. Christian tore after her, and they started chasing each other around the house. I let them do it. As long as they weren't killing each other, I was good. I returned the arrow back to where it was supposed to go and made sure the door was locked. When I came back, it looked like Mom had completely forgotten about making dinner. She pulled out a scrapbook and was going through it with Sophia, pointing at pictures. This one is so cute. Liam was such a sensitive baby. He always wanted to be held, Mom gushed. He was the sweetest little thing. I remember he came home crying from school once because another girl in his class started crying and he couldn't make her happy. It was just too much for him. He was quiet, you know, but always kind. Mom, quit showing Sophia my baby pictures, I grumbled. Sophia giggled. Oh, hmm? Mom looked up. I suppose I should be finishing up dinner. Go ahead and give Sophia a tour of the house, dear. And get your sister. It's almost ready. Gladly, I mumbled under my breath. I turned out of the kitchen and Sophia followed me. Essis stayed behind. Mom was tickling him on the counter. You talk about me, huh? Sophia whispered as we started for the staircase. Only to Mom, I said. Can you drop it? Her smile was huge. Okay. The house tour didn't take long. Sophia acted all impressed with it, but this is where I'd grown up, so I was kind of over it. I avoided going into my bedroom because it was still kind of messy in there, and I knew if we went in there, the temptation would be way too great to mess around again, even with my mom and siblings here. Sophia had stopped before a long headdress that was displayed in a glass case on the wall, it had hundreds of feathers on it and was decorated with all sorts of blue, white, and black beads. Wow, Sophia said, impressed. Whose is this? It's my dad's. Headdresses are for important people in the tribe. You have to earn them. Every feather designates something you did to glorify your house name or help members of your house, I said. When you have enough, you can make one of your own to wear at tribal ceremonies, it's beautiful, Sophia took a step back from it. Do you have one? I shook my head. I'm too young. I was collecting feathers for mine, but mine were taken away when my voice trailed off. When you lost Nashoma, Sophia finished for me. I nodded. She didn't press. We turned into a different room, one that had a lot of glass vials with multiple bubbling concoctions and open windows, a 17-year-old girl with wavy black hair and long sleeves sat on top of an ice dragon, mixing various potions at her desk. Arikari rumbled a hello when she saw us. Madeline, it's dinner time, I told her. She spun around. Her face brightened up when she saw me. Liam! She jumped toward me to give her a hug, and I held her. Out of everyone at home, I missed Maddie the most. Maddie pressed closer to me. Don't worry, Liam, it's not what you think, Maddie said into my shirt, quietly so Sophia couldn't hear. It's going to be okay. 
A bit of hope rose in me. I bent down so I could whisper to her, How do you know? She shook her head. Perot's right, but he's wrong too. You'll see. My mind whirled. This is why I didn't believe in prophecies and that kind of shit. They were unpredictable and all over the place, and Maddie was wrong sometimes. How could Perot be right and wrong about me dying at the same time? It didn't make sense. She let go of me and turned toward Sophia. You must be Sophia. Hi, I'm Madeline. Maddie gave Sophia a hug, too. Sophia returned the gesture politely and said, It's nice to meet you. Maddie gave Sophia's hand a squeeze. You're going to pass your Hawkeye careers project, by the way. Your teacher's going to give you an A, so don't worry about it. Sophia's mouth gaped open. How did you... Just trust me, Maddie winked. And by the way, I don't care if you know my secret. I already know you can be trusted. Maddie headed off. Era followed, and I felt a rush of cold air as she passed by. Sophia was rubbing her arms to warm up. Your family is very... huggy, she said. Yeah, we are, I laughed. Feel like you're part of the family yet? Yeah, Sophia rubbed her arms. Liam, what's up with Madeline? She's kinda... Weird? Yeah, she bonded and got her magic really early when she was still a toddler, I said. Wow. Sophia stopped in her tracks, eyes widening. Is that even possible? For someone like her? Yes. M Maddie... Sees things? I said, not sure how to put it. She's called a Natterai. She can see the future? Kind of. And the past. She's the same type of person who made the prophecy a long time ago. Does she know what will happen in your future if you ask? Sophia asked curiously. It's not like she can request what she wants to see. It just happens, I say. She can't control it. Half her visions don't make sense to her most of the time. How did she bond? Sophia asked as we made our way back down to the kitchen. Mom works with water and ice dragons, or at least she used to before she had me and Ezra, I told Sophia. She kept working part-time until she had Maddie. Erikari was a sick dragon baby she brought home one day that bonded with Maddie. Mom kept her here under the ruse that she was too sick to be on her own, then said she got too attached to separate from the family. I'm supposing Madeline's powers have to remain a secret, Sophia stated. I nodded. Can you imagine what the tribes would do if they knew? They would try to use her for her gift, I told Sophia. When she's old enough and goes to Arenda, we'll stage a bonding so that no one suspects anything and she'll be able to compete in the tournament. Sophia had a thoughtful look on her face. It seems like your family has a lot of secrets, Liam. I couldn't really respond to that. An obnoxious voice with a lot of yelling told me that Ezra was here. His volume went up by a hundred whenever he walked in this house. This place is always loud, I mumbled under my breath. In the dining room, it was absolute chaos. The twins were throwing things at each other, and Ezra was talking loudly to Madeline about something I didn't care about. Diami, who looked like he hadn't gotten used to the noise yet, was sitting on a statue of a dolphin in the corner with his feathers ruffled. Where's Dad? I asked, noticing his seat was empty. Your father isn't here yet. He's running a little late, Mom said as she placed food on the table. Thank the ancestors for that. Hopefully he wouldn't show up at all. Mom's cooking was amazing, and out of everything it usually didn't make me feel sick. I decided to take a few spoonfuls. Her food was worth the risk that I'd toss it up later. Where is your familiar, ma'am? Is she hiding? Sophia asked Mom. My familiar is a Kelpie, dear. She lives in the sea and in our pool in the basement, Mom said, piling more food onto Sophia's plate. Here, honey, have some more. Don't want you going hungry. Sophia already looked stuffed, but Essis started shoving what she'd been given into his mouth. I didn't know how Essis kept on packing it away when he had eaten his fill of oranges earlier. What exactly was he preparing for, hibernation? Mom glanced at me. Liam, honey, you're looking a bit tired. Why don't you go lie down after supper? Mom always noticed when I was feeling ill. I couldn't hide it from her, and it sucked. 
I'm fine, Mom. Really. Hmm. She pursed her lips together. Well, if you don't feel okay, I don't want you going back up to school tonight. Sophia, you're welcome to stay as well. You can sleep in Liam's room with him. I don't mind. Sophia nearly spit up the water she'd been drinking. Ezra wiggled his eyebrows at me while Madeline and the twins giggled. Well, Mom had made it clear she didn't give a shit if we were together. But Dad had to come home sooner or later, and he was going to flip his lid if he saw me cuddled up to the same girl I was supposed to kill for him. Not gonna happen. I'd have Sophia drag me back to school first. We'll be fine, Mom, I said. My face was burning. I hoped it didn't show. Then the door slammed open. Everyone in the room turned to see my dad standing in the doorway, Tatum behind him. The atmosphere totally changed when Dad showed up. It got silent and awkward. Really awkward. Dad's eyes locked on Sophia for what felt like a full minute before he looked to me. I could literally read the questions that were going on in his head. He wanted to know what she was doing here and why. I guessed Mom hadn't told him Sophia was coming. Liwanu, come sit down. We have a guest, Mom said. Dad behaved when Mom was around. He sat down across from us. Hello, Sophia started politely. I'm Sophia. You must be the chief of Toaqua. I'm pleased to meet you. Dad just looked at her. I wanted him to say something, but he didn't. Esses thumped his tail against the table and ate another biscuit, chattering at Dad. Good thing Mom and Ezra were extroverts. They kept chatting so it wasn't quiet in here. Even the twins noticed the tension and were eating silently. The only one who wouldn't leave Dad alone was Esses. He'd crawled to the other side of the table and kept poking Dad in the arm like a science experiment. Dad didn't know what to make of it and tried to ignore him, but Esses kept prodding harder. Sophia was totally embarrassed and kept trying to call him back over, but he wouldn't listen. Mom was always the talkative one and Dad was usually silent, but this was over the top. He didn't say a single thing throughout dinner, just kept eyeing me and Sophia like he was trying to figure out what was going on. Hey, Liam, are we going snowboarding this year? Ezra said. Season's almost up. What? Oh, no, I don't think so, I started. I think we waited too long. Liam was always my wild child, Mom said fondly to Sophia. He was uncontrollable. Yes, I think the past year has settled him down. Dad spoke for the first time, looking at me. A coldness settled in me. He made it sound like that was a good thing. This past year had been the worst of my fucking life. I'd lost my familiar. I'd been made to participate in the stupid tournament, and I'd gotten sick. I hated this year. The only thing that had made it good was Sophia. I wanted to tip over the table. If Dad thought that the past year had made me controllable, he was dead wrong. The minute he was done eating, Dad got up and said, Liam, we need to talk in private. I didn't say anything, just stood up and followed. Tatum stayed behind. We headed to his office, and he shut the door behind us. Liam, what's happening here? Is this some sort of plot? Dad asked immediately the moment we were alone. Good to see you too, Dad. I leaned against his desk. And before you ask, Mom invited Sophia here, and I know better than to tell her no. Dad groaned and rubbed his face. I should have known your mother had something to do with this. Does Mom know about what you asked me to do? What? No. Dad looked shocked, I would ask. I'm not surprised. Mom definitely wouldn't approve of her oldest son becoming a killer. She'd be disgusted with Dad for even asking me. Do you know what you're doing, bringing her here? Dad hissed. She's in more danger here than anywhere else. If Malison were to know she were in our waters, I sighed and looked skyward. I know what I'm doing, all right. Have you discovered anything else? Dad pressed. No. Will you please stop asking? I said. I'm working on it. You're running out of time. You don't need to remind me, I said. It was more of a yell than anything. I ran a hand through my hair quickly. I was getting so stressed out. 
It was making the room waver. I had to put a hand on the desk to steady myself, and Dad noticed. I think you need to sit down, he stated. I think you need to stop pressuring me, I shouted back. Do you even care about how I feel? It was a two-part question that I wasn't sure he completely got. In a low voice, Dad said, If you aren't able to do the job, I can find someone that can. It's not about that, I snapped. I can do it. I just don't want to take an innocent life. There was a knock on the door. Liam? Sophia poked her head in. I was about to freak out, but she must not have heard what I said. Because she just stated, Your mom wanted me to tell you that if we're going back to school, we should be leaving soon. It's getting really dark. Thanks, Soph. I'll be there in a minute, I told her softly. She quietly shut the door. When I turned back around, Dad's expression had totally changed. It was like he was in shock. He'd seen the way I'd looked at her, how gently I'd spoken to her, how I'd used a pet name. Most people would miss it, but most people weren't my dad. He knew me pretty well, and I'd made it totally obvious by accident. Dad rubbed his face like this was his own personal hell. No, 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 Liam, I was afraid this was going to happen. You don't know anything, and you can't prove it either, I said viciously. Dad was shocked about how defensive I got. Liam, you want to lock me away, fine, but let her go. My life's already ruined. She hasn't done anything, I said. I'm not going to turn in my own son, Dad bellowed. But by the ancestors, Liam, you're playing with fire. You have a duty to your tribe. I have a duty to myself. What makes me happy, I shouted back. I've been miserable since Nashoma died. I deserve something that makes my life worth living. And if she's the one the prophecy speaks of, if she starts another war, another genocide, and she destroys your tribe, what then? Are you willing to give up your house, your family, for your own selfish feelings? Dad asked harshly. I haven't figured that out yet, I said lowly. And you're assuming Sophia is the one the prophecy speaks about. Dad laughed, but it had no humor in it. Liam, open your eyes, he said. I know there's evidence on both sides, but do you really think that this is going to work out? I shook my head. It doesn't matter. I told you I was going to prove Sophia's innocence, and I will. You ask me to get close to her? Well, Dad, I'm as close as I'm ever going to get. Dad gave a growl of frustration. I just wished you and Mia had worked things out. That was never going to work, I said. Mia and I were completely incompatible, and everyone but me saw it from the get-go. You know it. Mom even said so. Mia was the only person Mom could never quite warm up to. Your mother and I were arranged, Dad started. You got lucky. Mom's amazing. Mia, not so much. Dad looked heavenward, like he was pleading with the ancestors themselves. Why can't you just pick someone from Toakwa? Because I don't want any of them. I want Sophia. Sorry. It was the first time I'd really said that out loud, and it felt empowering. Why do you always have to be so rebellious? You have been since the moment you were born. You should be with someone from your own tribe. Well then, you should have chosen better for me. I crossed my arms. You couldn't have picked a worse fit if you tried. I almost feel like you did it on purpose. That's not fair, Liam. I owed Mia's father a great favor, Dad said firmly. So you give him a favor back. You don't pawn off your eldest son, I shot back. I have great love for my children, but a chief puts his tribe first, Dad shouted back. I wanted to tell him right then. I wanted to tell him I was dying, that it wasn't fair, and that I hated he was using me to try and make the elders happy. But it wasn't going to do any good. Dad was never going to see the light of day. I couldn't make him see it. And now that he knew about us, the only thing I could do was work even harder to prove that Sophia deserved to live. I was done with this conversation. I backed away. Don't worry, Dad. I'll get your damn evidence. Then I want you to stay the hell away from us. The office door banged on the way out. I immediately started looking for Sophia. I was glad Mom mentioned that we should be on our way. I wasn't really feeling that bad, but I'd use my illness as an excuse any day to get the fuck out of here. 
Sophia was standing in front of a picture in the hall, Essis on her shoulder and her head tilted to the side. I helped your mom do dishes, she said as I came beside her. Your family's really fun. I didn't answer. I stared at the picture Sophia was looking at. It was a picture of me and Nishoma. He was in my lap and licking my face while I laughed. It had been taken last year around this time, but it felt like ages ago. I wasn't even the same person in that photo anymore. That boy's eyes were different. The light hadn't gone out of them yet. Is this Nishoma? she asked. Yeah, I said. He's pretty big, she said. She tilted her head the other way. I didn't know he was black. He's so beautiful. He was. I turned away from the photo. It hurt to look at it. Can we go? Yeah. We said quick goodbyes to mom and my siblings. Ezra was going to stay the night as he'd already started cleaning the beer out of the fridge. When we left the house and walked toward the water, Sophia spoke up. I heard you guys shouting, she said. Was it about me? No, I lied. Me and my dad just have a complicated relationship. Oh, she chewed on her lip. I have a feeling your dad doesn't like me very much. Forget about my dad. Mom loves you, I said, trying to redirect the conversation. She seemed to. Sophia tapped her chin. She kept calling me Shanti. It was strange. Oh, fuck no. She did not. What does it mean? Sophia asked. My face turned red. Never mind. Don't ask. Damn it, Mom. She was probably already picking out flowers for our wedding, knowing her. What had Maddie told her? No, even worse. What had Maddie seen? Okay, Sophia said, drawing out the word. Thanks for bringing me to meet your family. I feel like I could really fit in here. You're welcome, Polly. And she totally could. It didn't matter that she was Coigny. She did fit in here. She belonged, and I wanted her to keep belonging. Dad knew now that I would do anything, fabricate anything to prove Sophia was innocent, which meant from this point forward, I needed to come up with undeniable proof that she wasn't the prophesied one and rub it in the council's smug faces. I was done playing around. It was time to get desperate. Chapter 14 Tell me, Sophia, what's been on your mind lately? Doya almost sounded like she cared. She led me down a narrow trail through the forest, far away from the school for one of our many private training sessions. The sun had fallen low in the sky and the air was chilly. I used my fire to warm Essis, who was curled up in my arms. I don't know, I lied. The fact was, there was a lot on my mind lately. It had been over a week since I'd visited Liam's house, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. Along with my parents' visit, the approaching Ancestors' Day, my failing powers, my upcoming finals, the list went on. But I wasn't about to tell her any of that. Doya remained emotionless. The fact is, Sophia, your powers have failed to impress me lately. Naomi glanced back at me with a frown. I didn't even know cats could frown. You don't have to remind me, I grumbled, pushing aside an evergreen branch as the trail narrowed. I originally thought that perhaps you exerted yourself too much in our first training session, and that makeup sessions would help, but clearly I was wrong. Doya led me out of the trees and into a secluded clearing. It was only about an acre in size, with long, dry grass covering the ground and various logs and stumps strewn here and there. Doya breezed over to one of the dry logs and sat on it gracefully, which surprised me, because she seemed like the kind of person who would do anything to avoid getting dirt on her dress. Naomi stood alert, her eyes glaring out into the trees like she was standing guard. Doya gestured to the empty spot beside her, inviting me to sit. I approached cautiously but sat beside her anyway. It was a little uncomfortable, to say the least, considering I was pretty sure this was the closest I'd ever come to her in my life. Doya crossed her legs and turned to me. We're running out of time, Sophia. You have so much more to learn, to master, before Ancestor's Day. 
If the elders think this is some sort of ploy... It's not a ploy, I snapped, before softening my tone. I wouldn't do this on purpose. I know what's at stake. I know you wouldn't, Doya said softly. I'd never heard her speak so gently to me before. It was a little unnerving, like she was toying with me or something. I'm saying that the elders might see it that way. If you don't want them to fulfill their threats, we must find a way to break through whatever's been holding you back so you can complete your task. It suddenly clicked. She wasn't acting like this because she cared about my well-being. She only cared about me fulfilling the prophecy. I never thought I'd live to see the day she resorted to kindness to manipulate me. Yet she was still staring at me like she expected a response. I had to give her something. My friend and I were fighting for a while, I admitted. But we've made up now. Doya raised a curious eyebrow. You think you can perform advanced coigny magic again? I thought about it for a moment, then nodded. I don't see why not. The truth was, my powers had gradually started improving after Imogen and I made up, but I still had a long way to go before I was back to where I'd been during that first training session. Nothing else has been on your mind, then? she asked. Nothing I'm going to tell you. No, I lied. Doya pressed her lips together. Good. Then we can see what kind of progress you've made these past few weeks. She stood and spun toward me, her dress billowing around her. On your feet, Sophia. I did as I was told, and set Essis on the log to watch. He turned his ears down like he was disappointed to be set down. To contact the ancestors, you will have to learn how to conjure lightning, Doya said. Lightning? I gaped at her. Are you joking? I never joke, Sophia, she replied flatly. She could say that again. The ceremony is different for each house depending on their element. For a coigny, it requires lightning. But it is very advanced and complex. Only the best coigny are capable. So only the elders? I asked. No, there are maybe a hundred coigny who can do it, but compared to the thousands of us living in Compago, the percentage is quite small. And you want me, a first year, to do this? I couldn't believe she was suggesting such a thing. You are the prophesied one. Doya cocked an eyebrow, as if begging me to challenge the assertion. I think you are capable of anything you put your mind to. Oh, wow. A compliment from Doya. That never happened. You just need to get over yourself first and actually put your mind to it. There it was. Finally, she was starting to sound like herself again. I shifted my weight between my feet. So I just have to believe in myself? Doya smirked. It's a bit more complicated than that. What you need is focus. Now that you and your friend aren't fighting anymore, you can do that, can't you? Whoops, I shot myself in the foot with that one. By the look she gave me, I could tell she knew I wasn't being completely honest with her. It was like she was just waiting for me to finally crack and admit what was bothering me. But that was just it. There was no one thing. Shall we get started? Doya didn't wait for an answer. She walked to the center of the clearing with Naomi at her heels. I instructed Essis to stay put on the log and followed behind her. I didn't want him getting hurt during training. Conjuring lightning is different than conjuring fire, Doya said. We create lightning not through flames, but through heat. It works by superheating a column of air so much that it becomes ionized plasma, promoting electrical conductivity and resulting in a static discharge. The light is mostly a result of the heat. Um, okay. So far I was following along. Just be careful you don't overheat the air, or you could ignite the atmosphere. My eyes widened. That doesn't make me feel better. Don't worry, 
Doria said with a wave of her hand. No one has ever done that before. It fails more often than it works anyway. You have to have enough of an electrical imbalance in the atmosphere. If you try too hard, you'll deplete the imbalance and it will no longer work. There are ways to replenish the electrical imbalance using thermal updrafts, or thermals, but that takes time. It's far more advanced and we won't get into that today. I'll not bore you with the scientific details. I choose to focus on the magical aspect. Now I was totally lost. Good thing I wasn't being tested on any of this. Remember what I told you about becoming the shape you envision? I nodded. Well, forget about it, she said in a clipped tone. For now, anyway. Doya closed her eyes and lifted her hands up to the sky. We don't become lightning. We focus our heat. But you have to do it without producing flame. They are not one in the same, and you must separate them in your mind. Okay. I closed my eyes as she had done, and tried to imagine my heat and my flames as separate entities. Can you see the heat inside of you? She asked. It sounded like some sort of riddle. Um, no. I peeked my eyes open briefly to see her staring down her nose at me. She huffed and closed her eyes again, turning her chin to the sky. The reason this task is so difficult is because you cannot focus your magic externally until you first master focus of your internal self. Toya was one to talk. That lady had the emotional maturity of a plant. She couldn't control her anger if her life depended on it. I didn't get how she'd become so powerful, and an elder no less. And once you master that... A blinding light flashed across the clearing, and then a deafening crack echoed around us. I cursed and ducked my head, covering my ears. Doya smirked proudly. Once you master that, you can do almost anything. Essis sprinted across the clearing and jumped into my arms, his eyes the size of saucers. I squeezed him tightly and whispered in his ear, It'll be all right, buddy. Now you try, Doya demanded. My mouth hung open. Lightning? She raised her eyebrows, waiting for me. My palms grew clammy. Did she seriously expect me to pull a lightning bolt out of my ass or something? This was super advanced stuff I wasn't ready for. I'm going to do it again, and when I do, you have to focus, Doya said. Got it? Yeah, I agreed. But I wasn't exactly certain what I was supposed to focus on. Doya aimed her hands at the sky again, and almost instantly a second lightning bolt cut across it. I didn't flinch this time as thunder rumbled above our heads. Feel that? Doya asked. I focused on the air around me and noticed a slight shift in pressure. Electricity sizzled through the air. If I were Yapluma, my air senses would be going haywire right now. Is that what she wanted me to feel? I think I get it. Think? Doya challenged. Or no? I thought about it for a moment, then dropped my shoulders. Neither. I don't feel anything. Doya frowned, then lifted her chin and said, Burn me, Sophia. Excuse me? I gaped at her. You need to learn how to focus your heat. Without using your flames, I want you to burn me. Right here. She held up her palm and pointed to the center of it. I... I can't, I stammered. Doya pursed her lips. You mean you don't desire to hurt me? Oh, I did. Big time. All you have to do is focus, she pressed. Heat the air between us and burn me. I breathed a large sigh and set Essis at my feet, then faced Doya with my palms out. Picturing my magic inside of me, I drew heat to the surface and focused it in my palms. My hands warmed, and I tried to push that warmth out into the air around me. Doya stood still, looking unimpressed. So I pushed harder, 
concentrating until my whole body grew hot and sweat broke out across my brow. Suddenly, flame erupted from my palms, shooting directly toward Doya. She jumped out of the way, and Naomi growled at me. Essis clapped at my feet like he thought I'd actually accomplished something. Sorry to break it to you, buddy. My stomach sank, and Doya glared at me. You're not focusing, Sophia, she snapped. I don't know what I'm doing yet, I shot back. You're asking me to move mountains before I've picked up a stone. Doya sighed. This isn't Navita magic. Oh, wow, sarcasm. I never thought I'd hear such a thing from Doya's mouth. Can we maybe back up a step? I asked in a calmer tone. Maybe start with separating heat from flame. Doya took a deep breath before finally saying, Fine, but I want to see you actually make some progress tonight. We're not leaving here until you do. Yes, ma'am. Doya guided me through visualization techniques to help me better understand my magic, and then she discussed ways to help me focus it. Picture your magic like a string, she said. It's not merely a ball of yarn you haphazardly throw into the air. It's a single strand you can guide wherever you please. Do you understand? I nodded. Good. Now use that against me. She held her palm up again. Burn me. I closed my eyes and tried to picture my magic like a string as she'd instructed. I envisioned it rising through my body and snaking out of my arm, through my palm, and across the air between us. Focus, 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 I repeated to myself. A split second later, a blast of orange light crossed the back of my eyelids, and a wave of heat swept over my skin. Doya shrieked, and I opened my eyes to see a fireball had shot out of my hands and landed in the grass beyond her. Flames licked into the sky, eating away at the dry grass. Doya quickly threw out her hands and calmed the flames with her magic. Then she whirled toward me, fuming. You aren't focusing, Sophia. Do you have any idea how important this task is? I took a step back, almost stumbling over Essa's tail. He curled his lips back over his teeth and growled at her. I bent to scoop him up in my hands and held on to him protectively. I understand. No, Doya snarled, taking a step closer to me. Naomi followed, glaring at me. The fate of the Coigny rests in your hands. If you can't contact the ancestors to learn how to fulfill the prophecy, our whole house could perish. I know, I shouted back, though I didn't really care about that. I'd save Vanessa and Bren, but the rest of the Coigny could go to hell. All I really cared about were making sure my friends survived this whole thing. Then you need to focus, Doya snarled, her hands fisted at her sides. You keep saying that. It's not like I'm not trying. I took another step back to distance myself from her. She looked two seconds away from bursting into flames. Try harder. You need to stop letting other people distract you. No one's distracting me, I argued. I could list a dozen people who are keeping you from realizing your full potential, Sophia. Doya took a step closer and started counting off on her fingers. Your Navida and Yapluma friends, the Mito boy, your sister, your parents. I gasped. How did she know about that? Doya stood so close to me now that she loomed over me, her nostrils flaring. I held my breath and shrank away, hiding Essis in the crook of my elbow. Doya glared down at me so hard I thought her face might crack like stone. I have eyes and ears everywhere, Sophia. I'm not keeping your secrets as a charity gesture. So figure out how to find your focus, or so help the ancestors I will not hesitate to use them against you. I swallowed down the lump in my throat, willing myself to say something. But I didn't have anything. Doya had backed me into a corner and the only way out was to perform the most advanced Coigny magic the Hawkeye had ever witnessed. It was hopeless. 
Doya scoffed and finally backed down, but it did little to comfort me. She looked at me with such disdain that I swore I could feel it coming off her in waves. Then I heard something, a snap in the bushes. Something had stepped on a branch. My eyes glanced to the left, and I noticed a shadow move, though I couldn't make out what it was. Doya hadn't heard. She was still fuming. It must have been some animal. I stood up straighter, but my voice came out small. I... I can try again. Doya held up a hand to stop me. Don't bother. I can't handle continuing to watch your failure. Doya whirled around and stomped away from me, leaving Essis and me alone in the clearing to contemplate everything she'd said. Failure. The word echoed in my mind. Is that what I was? A failure? Had I failed to protect my friends and family? I slumped over to the dry log and fell down on it, feeling totally disconnected with my body as her words bore their way through me. Essis spread his arms out and tried to hug my belly, but he couldn't even reach around my front side. With Doya gone, I pulled the totem out from beneath my shirt and stared down at it. If what Liam said about this totem was true, that it was supposed to enhance my powers, then I should have been capable of what Doya was asking. Shouldn't I? I was the prophesied one. I was supposed to be amazing. And yet, I wasn't. Maybe the problem wasn't with the totem or the prophecy. Maybe, like Doya said, the problem was me. Tree branches reached out onto the narrow path, scraping along my skin as I hurried back to the castle, once I found the strength to rise to my feet. I was so angry at Doya that I could set this entire forest on fire. Seriously, who did she think she was, threatening everyone I loved, everything I held dear? And to have the gall to tell me I was the problem when she couldn't teach worth a crap. I don't get why she hates me so much, I muttered to Essis. I broke out of the narrow trail and started on a wider one up toward the castle. Essis sat perched on my shoulder and began chittering in my ear and tugging on my hair. Ow, Essis! I swatted at his tiny hands. Stop, that hurts! I continued up the trail until I broke out of the trees and reached a rocky ledge that overlooked the beach. Essis screeched in my ear, bringing my footsteps to a halt. What is it? I snapped. Essis blinked a few times, and then pointed out toward the beach. In the dimming light from the sunset, I saw several figures moving around on the rocky shore. Upbeat music played from an old boombox someone had brought out, and I could see Jonah and Squeaks shaking their butts to the music. Then Jonah stopped and pointed over to Ezra and Diami, who stole the show and showed off with some breakdance moves. A dance-off. My friends were having a dance-off. I was so not in the mood right now. But then I spotted Liam sitting on the rocks watching, and I couldn't resist making my way down to them. By the time I reached the beach, Imogen and Sassy were showing off their moves. Imogen wore a beaded skirt that made noise when she shook her hips, and she shimmied her shoulders, using her boobs to her advantage. Cade was totally staring down her shirt, and she didn't even notice. Hey, Liam, I said softly as I approached. His face lit up when he saw me. Hey, where have you been? I sighed and sat beside him on the rock. Essis jumped down from my shoulder and settled on my lap. Don't ask. Doya, he guessed. What gave it away? I grumbled. Oh, I don't know, he teased. You just have a glow about you. I wiped at my forehead. It's called sweat. Liam chuckled. The sound of his laughter helped ease my mind a little. So what are they up to? I asked, gesturing to the other four dancing in the sand with their familiars. Ez thinks he's going to win the tournament in December, and he claimed he'd have the best moves the elemental ball has ever seen. So, of course, Jonah had to challenge him. Sounds like fun, I said. Yeah, and the fun continues. Squeaks and Sassy are planning a sleepover, Liam said. Oh, okay. I said with a forced laugh. 
And Cade won't be jealous of Jonah? Liam rolled his eyes. It's not like that, Soph. And besides, Jonah's not going to be with them. I guess he has to go to his parents' house later. I should have been dancing and laughing with my friends. But after Doya chewed me out, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. How do they stay positive all the time? I asked Liam, feeling totally defeated. I mean, don't they see what's happening all around them? Liam shrugged. They do. I think it's just their way of holding on when times get rough. I nodded. I wished I could let go the way Jonah and Imogen did. Liam shifted on the rock to face me. Hey, Soph, you okay? I purposely didn't answer. You want to get out of here? Yes, he answered far too quickly. I cracked a smile. Not like that, Liam. Not that it hadn't been good the last time we'd fooled around. In fact, it was amazing. I just wasn't in the mood right now. I wasn't in the mood for much of anything. I felt too defeated. Come on. Liam glanced around the beach and decided it was safe to take my hand. He laced his fingers through mine and started leading me toward the trees. Essis, I called, pulling his attention away from the dancing. He started and hopped over to me, following at my feet. Do you want to talk about it? Liam asked once we were in the privacy of the trees. I shrugged. It's just... Doya. You know how she is. She blames me for not being good enough, and... Liam held up a hand. On second thought, I'm not sure it's best to tell me. My shoulders dropped. Was I annoying him by complaining about her? Liam stopped in the middle of the trail and turned to me with a fallen face. The thing is, Sophia, I have something I need to tell you. I bit my lower lip. Whatever it was didn't sound good. My eyes darted to Essis, who scurried up a tree and then sat on a low branch to watch us. Um, okay, what is it? Liam raked his fingers through his hair, pushing the long strands away from his face. He glanced around, then gestured to a large rock not far from the trail. You should probably sit down for this. Oh, man. He was going to tell me something horrible, like that erectile dysfunction ran in his family or something. We'd never have sex. I followed him off the trail and sat on the rock beside him. The thing is, Sophia. The rock shifted beneath us, and I jumped to my feet to keep from tumbling over. Liam shot up beside me and held an arm over my chest like he was protecting me. We both relaxed when we saw the creature stand. It looked like a rock, with a hard gray shell and moss growing on the top, but its joints moved easily. It had four legs and a wide nose like a cow. Pine needles hung out of its mouth like it had been grazing. It shot us a disgruntled look and then trotted off into the forest. My heart rate slowed and I turned back to Liam. That was interesting. He nodded, but he didn't look at all interested. He probably grew up with those things all over the place. Sophia. Liam reached out and took my hands in his. I didn't need to use my magic to warm my skin because Liam's touch did that for me. It was like he had a power all himself. Liam dropped his gaze to my hands and began rubbing the backs of them. I suddenly became very concerned. What is it, Liam? You can tell me anything. When he lifted his gaze, his eyes were brimmed in tears. I know. I just don't want to hurt you. Hurt me? My tone was laced in pain already. Was Liam breaking up with me? Tears rose to my eyes, and it felt like a heavy weight had settled on my chest. Just the thought of losing him made it impossible to breathe. I just... I love you so much, Bowie. His voice cracked. Oh, shit. He was breaking up with me. I didn't think I could handle it. I love you, too, I whispered. Liam's lips swooped down to meet mine and his hand came up to support the base of my neck. I threw my arms around him and dragged him in closer until my breasts were pressed against his chest. If Liam was breaking up with me, this could be the last kiss I ever got from him. 
I wanted it to last forever. All too soon, Liam drew away from me. He rested his forehead on mine and breathed deeply. I love you, but... Liam, don't, I pleaded. But I'm dying. The words were like a punch to the gut. My mind went blank. I was totally confused. He wasn't breaking up with me, but I was losing him nonetheless. But what did he mean by that? We're all dying, Liam, I said. I mean, someday we'll all die. I know. Liam's expression was hard. His eyebrows knit together. It was like he was trying to hide his true emotions behind the only mask he knew how to wear. But I'm dying faster than most. The knot in my chest tightened. I know you're sick, but you don't know- Perot told me, Liam interjected. He said my organs are shutting down. I could have months, maybe a year. Oh my god! I threw my arms around him again and squeezed tightly. He gasped, so I loosened my hold on him. Tears began to flow down my cheeks and soaked into his t-shirt. I could hardly find the strength to breathe. It broke my heart so badly. It felt like the weight of a mountain was pressing down on my chest. He wasn't breaking up with me, but this was worse. So much worse. I'm so sorry. Liam ran his hands over my back. You're the only person I've told so far. This is so unfair, I cried into his chest. The words couldn't begin to describe how I felt. It was far worse than unfair. It was cruel. Essis jumped down from the trees and landed on my shoulder. I glanced up for a moment to see him stretching his arms around Liam's neck. He'd miss him too. I just knew it. Liam sniffled then buried his face in my hair. I don't want to live without you, Liam, I whispered. Life would be pointless without him. He was like the air I breathed and the water I drank. He belonged in my life, and I just couldn't imagine a world where he no longer existed. I know, but I've already had more time here than I should have. When Nashoma died, I should have... I should have... Don't say it, Liam, I warned. Liam was still around for a reason. He had to be. Otherwise, the ancestors wouldn't have let him live this long. Maybe it was my narcissism talking, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they'd kept him around for me. And if they were just going to take him from me right away, what was the point in that? No, I wouldn't let that happen. I reached up and stroked Essa's tail. Essa stared down at me with watery eyes. I lifted my lips at the corners, and he nodded back in understanding. Then he pressed a small palm to Liam's forehead. Liam didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, but I knew that somewhere inside of him, Essa's powers were helping him heal. To hell with Perot. To hell with the elders. To hell with anyone who suspected anything from a miraculous recovery. Liam was here for a purpose— and I'd be damned if he died before he got to fulfill it. I'd be damned if he died at all. So I wasn't going to let him. Chapter 15 I woke up the next morning feeling good, really good, better than I had been for a long time, and it was totally weird. I got ready, expecting to start feeling shitty again any moment, but I didn't. I was tired, but other than that, I was fine. I even felt hungry. I was hungry all the time, actually, but this morning my stomach wasn't rolling. I went down to the dining hall and ate breakfast and actually kept it down this time. I could actually eat stuff again. So weird. It was a Sunday, so the dining hall was quiet. I was about ready to head out to find Sophia because I was trying to spend as much time with her as I could these days when I ran into Bane in the hallway. Liam, just the man I wanted to see he said, and he put his arm around my shoulder. Come, we have things to discuss. Great. This was the last thing I needed. I glumly headed with him, mentally ticking down the minutes in my head. I only had so much time left, and I didn't want to spend a second more than I had to with Bane. 
Thank the ancestors he didn't take me to his office this time. We went to a secluded classroom instead, and Bane locked the door behind us. Coigny has spies lurking around the castle. We can't be too careful. Bane began the meeting in Hawkeye, and I quickly switched over. Spies? I asked. Coigny has grown suspicious that Toakwa has taken it upon themselves to eliminate Sophia. We're being watched, Bane stated. We know that they haven't yet figured out you've been assigned to the task, but they're getting close. You need to be cautious, Liam. If they get any idea you're the one that's supposed to end her life, they'll stage an accident to take you out first. This was getting intense. So what am I supposed to do? Nothing at the moment. Any action would arouse suspicion, Bane began. You're safe for now. From what it appears on the outside, you two are just good friends. So Dad hadn't told Bane about me and Sophia. Honestly, that had been one of my biggest fears. Our own spies have uncovered that the Coigny elders have asked Sophia to complete some sort of task, as you've mentioned before, but we've ceased to discover what it is. However, we know that it is approaching soon, most likely before the semester is up. Has she mentioned anything to you about what it could be? I shook my head. She hasn't said. Damn it! Bane rarely swore, so he must have been aggravated. Another dead end. I knew Sophia had been assigned to something big. I'd figured as much after Chiefess Annette had summoned her the first day of the new semester, but she hadn't mentioned a thing about it. It kind of hurt that she was keeping it secret from me, though I believe she had to have her reasons for it. I wished she could open up and tell me. I wasn't one to be pointing fingers. I'd been keeping secrets from her, too. Bane crossed his arms. Have you learned anything from these sessions with Madame Doya? I shook my head. There's been only one that I've seen so far, and no... The only thing I've witnessed is that Sophia can't do what Doya's asking her to. I'd stopped watching Doya's session with Sophia yesterday before it was over. I felt guilty spying on her, and it became obvious that she wasn't going to be able to conjure lightning very quickly. So I'd abandoned my post and walked back to the beach early. The way Doya had yelled at her made me pissed, and to make it worse, Sophia had nearly seen me. I'd stepped on a branch by accident and gotten her attention. I'd come very close to being caught. But even though Sophia hadn't managed to conjure lightning, she'd shown potential, which meant the rock thistle had worn off. Taking her powers again wouldn't work, as I had no way to do that, which meant I needed to come up with another plan, one that would turn her own house against her. And it needed to start with the elders. Bane scratched his beard. Hmm, if Sophia continues to show little potential, the Coigny elders will get angry. They don't want to lose their opportunity. How is that our problem? I asked. My job is to figure out if Sophia is the prophesied one or not, and the evidence I've seen all semester is that she's not. Bane sighed. We have one last option. I've reviewed the footage from the tournament several times over the past semester, one in particular has caught my attention. You were dying when you went into that cave, Liam, and you walked out as if nothing had ever happened. Sophia went after you, and you both were gone for a considerable amount of time. Bane leaned forward. Is there something you're not telling me? Shit. Shit, shit, shit. Think of something quick. I don't remember anything, I lied. All I can recall is passing out in the cave and waking up, and Sophia was there. Then I was fine, and we just left the cave. That's it. That's too simple, Bane said in frustration. There must be an explanation for all of this. He tapped his face with his finger, then brought it away in a sudden stroke of clarification. The powers of Anichi would be the only thing that could heal you in that state, Sophia is Coigny, which means that she had to come in contact with some sort of Anachi power to restore your health. The fucking spirit totem. That's what healed me. It had to be. It was close enough to work its magic on me since it had been in the cave. Sophia just didn't know. But how was I supposed to keep that from Bane? So, you're saying Sophia is carrying something from Anachi? I feigned. 
She must be. You need to find out whatever she has, Liam, and bring it to us, Bane said. Then we'll be able to close this case for good. And Sophia's name will be cleared and I'll get Nishoma back, right? I asked. Bane hesitated before he said, It seems that way. If we can verify her powers are a result of her obtaining a powerful magical item and not from her own strength, she would cease to become a threat. This was my ticket out of this mess. All right, I'll see what I can do. Don't take too long, Liam, Bane warned me as I headed for the door. Sophia's time is almost up. Didn't I know it? But at least I had hope now. The spirit totem was the key. I didn't know how I was going to pry that thing off of her. It was always on her. She never took it off. But I had a solid plan now. I'd get the spirit totem off of her and show it to Bane, tell him Sophia's powers came from there. Then I'd learn about whatever task the Coigny elders had put her up to, and I would come clean. I'd tell Sophia the truth and convince her to fail her mission so that Coigny lost interest in her as the prophesied one, and Toaqua left her alone. The Coigny elders would be so furious with Sophia for dishonoring her house, they'd want nothing more to do with her. And Toaqua would turn their attention someplace else. Nishoma would be back by my side. Sophia would be mad at first, but eventually she'd forgive me when she learned I did everything I could to save her life. It was ironproof. I went to wait outside the Coigny dorms, but when I was there I found Essis, not Sophia, he had a note tied around his neck and waved to me, running over. Hey, little buddy. I picked him up and untied the note from around his neck. It was from Sophia. She wanted me to meet her on the cliffs near the beach. That's weird, I said. I put Essis on my shoulder and said, I'm not one to refuse a lady. Let's go. Sophia was sitting on a rock on the cliffside, taking pictures of the ocean with the camera I'd gotten her. I noticed that she was wearing the totem around her neck, tucked beneath her shirt. She took it off sometimes when we fooled around. Maybe... Fuck, I felt like a dirtbag even thinking about it. How could I get her naked just so we could mess around, then snatch it from her before she noticed? It was totally wrong. You're looking a lot better, Sophia commented as I came near. She snapped a picture of me with Essis, and I frowned. She knew I didn't like taking pictures. I'm feeling a lot better, actually, I said, and handed Essis off to her. Sophia beamed and petted Essis fondly. I'm so happy to hear that. You have no idea. Maybe you're getting better. I didn't say anything. Since I told her I had an expiration date, we'd resolve not to talk about it. I didn't want to give her false hope in case this was a fluke, which I really hoped it wasn't. Then it clicked. I hadn't been spending a lot of time with Sophia lately because I'd been feeling awful. But in the past week, I'd really been pushing myself to see her more just because I knew I had months left with her, not years. If the spirit totem was what had healed me in the cave, being in its presence should be enough to keep me alive now, right? Things were getting even more complicated. I couldn't hand over the totem to Bane if that's what was preventing my death. It didn't matter. I could decide later. Either way, I needed that totem. I hope that you'd be well enough for some cliff diving, she told me. She put her camera in her bag and gave me a mischievous grin. I was surprised. Are you sure you're up for it? I asked. It's not for the faint of heart. I'm really scared, no lie, but I also want to live it up, you know, she said. She put her hands on her hips and said, no time like the present, as long as you do it with me. I shrugged. All right. Sophia slipped off her socks and shoes, and I followed her lead. Then she took off the totem that was around her neck and hung it on a tree branch nearby. Don't want this getting lost. I had an open window, but it could wait until later. I guided her to the cliff's edge. Don't be too scared, I told her. If anything happens, I'll use the water to catch you. Sophia swallowed and nodded. Right. This cliff wasn't very big, only 20 or so feet tall. I'd jumped here before multiple times, so I knew it was deep enough and safe, but Sophia was pale white. Always jump feet first and remember to hold your breath, I said. Try to relax. You can do this. I know you can. 
Sophia was taking deep breaths. I grabbed her hand and said, we'll do it together, okay? She nodded again. It was like she couldn't speak. On the count of three, if you're going to hesitate, please let me go before I jump. Ready? One, two, three. We ran at the edge of the cliff full speed. I thought she might back out at the last minute, but she didn't. She just held on to my hand tighter as we jumped off the edge of the cliff and went sailing downward. A rush of adrenaline went through me as the sensation of being weightless came over me. This was what being in love with Sophia felt like, jumping and falling. We let go before we hit the water and sank in deep. I surfaced before she did and panicked a little when I couldn't see her, but she came up laughing. It was March, so the water was still super cold, but Sophia didn't seem to mind. That was awesome, she said. Again. We jumped off the cliff together a few more times. By the end of the afternoon, Sophia was jumping all on her own. I was sitting on a rock and watching her. She seemed to be enjoying it even more than I was. When she'd begun the climb back up, I eyed the totem. It was still on the same branch she'd left it before. It would take her a few minutes to get up here. This was my chance. I went to grab the totem, but I heard the scratching of little nails on the rock and hissing. It was Essis. He stood in front of the totem with his hair on end, warning me not to come closer. He totally knew I was trying to take the totem. I need it, all right? You don't understand. I tried reaching for it again, but Essis lunged forward and bit me. I gasped. Ouch, he'd never done that before. He didn't draw blood, so it wasn't a real bite, just a warning. I shook out my hand and said, fine, have it your way. He gave me a surly look. I guess I should have been thankful that he and Sophia couldn't communicate telepathically yet, because he totally rat me out. Sophia had reached the top. She shook out her wet hair and said, what a rush, I'm totally up for anything now. Not anything. Start slow. I laughed. I was totally going to turn her into a daredevil by the end of the year. If I had that long. Sophia slipped on her shoes again and looped the totem back around her neck. We should head back. I'm starving. Agreed, I started. We'd skipped lunch. I'd used my magic to dry us off and I took her hand so we could walk together, at least part of the way. Essa stayed securely on her shoulder. His big eyes told me to back off as I eyed the totem around her neck. Taking the totem had just gotten ten times harder. There was no way Essis would let me get anywhere near it. We headed back to school and saw someone leaning up against the wall outside the greenhouses. It was Jonah, but he didn't look like himself. Not like Jonah. You wouldn't understand unless you saw it. He looked like a different person, a sadder one. It wasn't until he lifted his head and saw us coming that I knew why. Jonah had a huge black eye and a bruise that ran across the right side of his face. It was swollen and red. It looked like someone had taken their air magic and just whipped it at him. Ancestors, Jonah. Sophia's tone was shocked as we approached. What happened to you? Jonah's face was straight. Squeaks kicked me in the face last night when we were sleeping. No biggie. Oh, Sophia said, but her eyes were troubled. Jonah didn't bother looking my way. He knew he couldn't fool me. There were no hoof marks. We're just about to get dinner, I offered. You want to come? I'm not really that hungry, Jonah said. Okay, now I knew there was something wrong. Jonah ate like a hippogriff and never stopped. Sophia interceded. Well, we're supposed to be meeting up with Imogen later in front of the Nevita dorms. She wanted to tell us something. See you at six? Sure, Jonah said offhandedly, and he went into the castle without another word. Sophia and I glanced at each other. We didn't say much as we headed inside to grab dinner. We sat alone in a booth in the corner of the room, but nobody paid us much attention. People had gotten used to always seeing us together. Sophia narrowed her eyes as she picked at her salad. Essis wasn't eating, which was bizarre. He was watching me instead. Didn't Squeaks spend the night with Sassy at Imogen's last night? 
And didn't Jonah go home to see his parents? Sophia asked. I fiddled with an empty plate, which I'd consumed in minutes. My appetite really was back. Yep, she frowned. Why doesn't Jonah fight back? You ever try hitting your mom or dad, even if they're hitting you first? I asked her. It's not as easy as you think. Sophia sighed. I guess it would be hard even if they were coming at you. I couldn't imagine my parents hurting me. Me neither. I always had great parents. Dad could be a bit of a hard ass, but he never raised a hand to me. Mom neither. I think she'd cut her own hands off first. Jonah wasn't so lucky. Who do you think hit him? His dad, his mom, maybe both. Probably both, I confirmed. How awful. Sophia looked like she wanted to cry. I sighed. Stuff started flooding out of me. I remember Jonah's parents never used to let him out of the house. He'd have to sneak out to see me. He was like their little slave, I said. He tried so hard to make them proud when we were growing up, but no matter what he did, it was never good enough. What horrible parents, Sophia shuddered. I can't even imagine. I don't consider those types of people parents, I said. He really had trouble his first semester at Orenda. He couldn't handle not being told what to do all the time. He wanted to drop out and go live back home. Why? Sophia was stunned. Why would you want to go back to that? He didn't know any better. When you grow up in a prison your entire life, freedom scares the hell out of you, I told her. I told him to stick it out a year, and if he still wanted to go home, he could. I smiled at the old memories. After that first semester, he just blossomed. He became confident. He was so happy. I was the first person he came out to. He was freaking out. He thought I would hate him because he was gay. He should know you better than that. Sophia tilted her head and stroked Esses. That's what I told him. I smiled a little wider. You should have seen him. He used to be so shy about dating guys. Now he practically paints rainbows everywhere he goes. Sophia laughed. Now everybody knows. Yeah, I grinned. He made the announcement to all of Kinpago after he bonded with Squeaks last summer. I think she was the one who convinced him to be who he really was. He rented out this stage in the middle of town, dressed in drag and lip-synced to Lady Gaga. It was really something. Oh my gosh. Sophia put her hand over her mouth, dying of laughter. I wish I could have seen that. It was the best, I said. He did it right after I lost Nashoma. To be honest, Jonah kind of pulled me out of it after he died. I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for him. I played with my fork. I just, I wish I could repay him by helping him now. Why don't you? Sophia asked. Can't you stand up to his parents? I can't do anything. I shook my head. Last time I tried to defend him, his parents threw me out, and he took their side. It didn't work out too well. That's so horrible. I hope he wakes up soon. He needs to kick them out of his life, Sophia said. I shrugged. Jonah's got to do what's best for himself, whatever that is. And he's the one that's got to figure that out. I guess, Sophia put her head in her hand and sighed. I just wish there was something we could do. Kawigny weren't the types to forget and let things go. They protected the people they cared about viciously, which meant they liked to meddle in things that weren't their business. Sophia had to stay out of this. Messing with the Chanis would only get her hurt, as it did me. Sophia checked her watch. Come on, we're running late to meet Imogen. We left the dining hall and headed to the Navita dorms. To my surprise, Jonah was there, but he still didn't look too bright. Liam, we heard Imogen's voice behind us and turned. She was literally running toward us, waving a black book in her hands. Sassy and Squeaks were at her heels. Liam, I figured something out. I... She stopped. Her mouth dropped open when she observed Jonah's face. He looked back at her without a smile. Oh, Jonah. Imogen put her arms around his neck and hugged him. Jonah stooped down and embraced Imogen, lifting her off the ground. It looked like a giant holding a doll. I'm okay, Jonah whispered. Imogen gave a weak whimper into his shoulder. 
We might be best friends, but Jonah and Imogen shared a special bond. It was obvious he'd told Imogen more about his parents than he'd ever told me, and I felt a little awkward intruding in on their moment. When Jonah put Imogen back down, Squeak stepped forward. Her tail lashed and her beak clacked together in concern. She nibbled at his hair. Her big black eyes seemed so full and upset. I'm fine, Squeaky, Jonah rubbed her neck. He sounded like me, and it was totally unconvincing. Squeak snuzzled her head into Jonah. He leaned his forehead against hers, closing his eyes. I'd noticed Jonah had been looking a lot better since he bonded with Squeaks. There was a reason he'd come in with a black eye today over any other day. If his dad tried to smack him with Squeaks around, he'd end up without an arm. Hey, Jonah, I said, and he looked up. I was thinking, I kind of want to get an apartment this summer, just for a few months before we go back into school. I'd like you to move in with me. What do you think? I had no intention of moving out of my parents' mansion before I graduated, but I had the money and I couldn't handle another summer of Jonah living in that hell. I'd do anything just to get him out of that house. Yeah, Jonah immediately brightened. That would be so cool. We could all move together, Imogen suggested brightly. The four of us, we could get a three bedroom. Sophia and I glanced at each other. I knew what she was thinking. We'd only been dating for a few months. Some people would say we were moving a little fast. It didn't seem like that to me. I wanted to live with Sophia. Waking up next to her every day in the same bed would be incredible. And it might be possible after I cleared her name. People from different houses living together might look weird, but since there were four of us, it wouldn't draw too much suspicion. As long as we didn't let anyone inside, it might actually be possible. That sounds really amazing, I finished, and Sophia beamed. We should look into that. It would be so perfect, Sophia said. But what is it you wanted to tell us, Imogen? Oh, yeah. Imogen held up the black book she'd been carrying. It was old and leather-bound. I found something in my family's library that might help you, Liam. But I think we should show Perot, too. Lead the way, I offered. We headed down to the alchemy lab. Professor Perot was brewing something in one of his vials, and he looked flustered. Baxter was on a perch, cooing to him sharply, as if calling out instructions. The peacock looked cross, too. Professor? Imogen poked her head in. Is this a good time? Children, Perot said. He wiped his forehead with a cloth and said, Come in, come in. We filed into the classroom, and he poured out the beaker he was working at into the sink. The noises Baxter was making, I was sure his familiar was swearing at him. Another one ruined, he said in discouragement before turning toward us. What can I help you with? Thank the ancestors, Perot didn't ask about Jonah's eye. Imogen stepped forward. I wanted to show you this. She opened the book on a desk and pointed to a painting that had been copied into the book's pages. There I saw a picture of a tall, older man with gray hair, his hand on the shoulder of a young woman who was sitting down in a chair. The woman had her black hair in two braids, and a white wolf sat by her side. Her skin was tan, like mine, and she had dark eyes. I present to you Arthur and Anna Cedric, friends to the Hawkeye and builders of Arenda Academy, Imogen said proudly. Wait a minute, I muttered, staring at the painting. I pointed to Anna. That's my ancestor. Imogen smiled. Precisely. She's the daughter of Arthur Cedric, and she died young of a mysterious illness. I bet she passed away from whatever Liam has. That's gotta be it. Things were coming together. Liam, what are you talking about? How can you be sure? Jonah asked. She's my spirit guide. I know her. I've met Anna several times when I've summoned her, I said. I just didn't know who she was. It seems like your illness is genetic, Liam. Cedric must have married a Hawkeye woman and had Anna. Then Anna must have had a child and passed whatever ailed her down to you, Perot said. Does the book say anything more? It says that Arthur married a Toaqua after he built Orenda Academy, Imogen said proudly. 
He had a daughter, and she produced a boy that became the next Toakwa chief. I can't believe this, I said in awe. I'm descended from Arthur and Anna Cedric. Aye, Jonah clapped me on the back. Good to know you've got a bit of Scottish in ye, my laddie. Good to see he was back to normal. No wonder she's your spirit guide, Liam, Sophia offered. She knew you were going to be sick, and she knew what it felt like, so she signed up to guide you. This was incredible. Did you find anything else out, Imogen? Not much, she ruffled through the pages of the book. It describes Anna's illness, and it sounds a lot like what you've got, Liam. But it doesn't seem like very many Hawkeye had it. Only a few mixed in with the dozens of descendants Anna had. The disease is exclusively found in the Toakwa bloodline, nowhere else. I was getting excited. Next Ancestors Day, I could try summoning Anna, maybe even talk to her. And I could get some answers on how to handle my illness. It was coming up, not even two months away. How long did Anna survive? Sophia questioned. Perot and I shared a glance. He knew what was coming. The legends say Anna passed away before her 30th birthday, Perot said. But that was in the days of Anichi, when they had people to heal her. Liam, he isn't so lucky. I expected some sort of breakdown, but it didn't happen. Sophia just picked up Assis and cuddled him. I understand. She was being exceedingly calm about it. So were Imogen and Jonah. It was weird. I think you should keep this book, Professor. Imogen handed it out to him. There might be something in there that could help find a cure for Liam. Perot took it. Thank you, my dear. This will be crucial to my research. When we left Perot's office, I immediately grabbed Imogen and wrapped her in a giant hug. She squeaked as I spun her around. Imogen, thank you. I can't believe you did this for me. Of course I did. Imogen gasped and coughed as I set her down. We're friends, aren't we? I told you I would. I just can't believe you had the time to go through all those books at your house, Jonah said. Babe, I've been there and they're so wordy. Imogen blushed. Well, I kind of had a lot of free time when Sophia and I were fighting. It's nice to see that something good came out of you two bitches going at it, Jonah said cheerfully, and he wrapped an arm around each of the girls. Sophia giggled. <laughs> it did, but we're never going to do it again. Never. Imogen reached out to squeeze Sophia's hand. I missed you too much to fight like that. I was in a better mood than I had been in ages. I finally had some hope. This Ancestor's Day, I'd speak to Anna Cedric, and I'd finally get some answers. Chapter 16 Sophia Henley, you're up next. My knees shook as I rose from my desk and started toward the front of the class. I'd listened to people present their Hawkeye Careers projects on Monday, but it couldn't prepare me for when it finally came my turn on Wednesday. Professor Cameron thought I was about to present my topic on fire creature care. She had no idea I'd changed my mind. All eyes turned on me and Essis as I walked to the front of the classroom. I could connect each face with the presentation they'd given. Doctor, lawyer, congressman, professor, dragon specialist, alchemist, Hawkeye historian. They were all very good career choices. The only presentation anyone had laughed at was when Miranda said she wanted to be a familiar hairdresser. And the guys who laughed were stuck-up Coigny second years, whose familiars looked in serious need of a grooming. Miranda would hairdress the crap out of their creatures. I reached the front of the room and placed my flash drive in the computer at Professor Cameron's desk then pulled up my slideshow on the projector. Essis hopped down from my shoulder and sat in front of the computer to change my slides for me. Professor Cameron and her koala familiar gave a simultaneous nod, letting me know I could begin. I wiped my sweaty hands on my jeans. Just relax, I told myself. I glanced to my note cards, then cleared my throat and began. Hawkeye sociologist Rupert Cosper states, It is of our duty as Hawkeye to pursue the tasks in which benefit the entirety of the tribe. You'll notice that Cosper used the word tasks rather than careers, 
and I believe he did so deliberately. In chapter 6 of our textbook, we read about Cosper's wife, Holly. I shot Essis a glance, and he changed the slide to show a picture of Holly Cosper from our textbook. It was an old photo from the 70s, and showed her holding a young child on her hip, surrounded by four other children. The family stood in front of their treehouse in the Navita neighborhood. It was one of the first modern treehouses on the Hawkeye Reservation. I continued. Cosper continues, Many would have said that Holly did not work, but they would be grossly wrong in assuming so. My wife worked a 24-hour shift seven days a week, 365 days per year. As a professor, I didn't even work half that. Cosper recognized the importance of his wife's role among the family. He did not discredit her just because she wasn't bringing an income home. I noticed Professor Cameron's forehead crease as she wrote something down in her grading sheet. I shifted uncomfortably at the front of the room. Cosper's six children each went on to contribute greatly to the tribe. Their eldest son, Eli Cosper, was the head engineer who worked on the Hose Ho, ensuring that the design would be compatible with elements in flight. His daughter, Alana Cosper, pioneered various familiar medical care tactics, particularly in dragons, which led to a 98% survival rate from dragon flu, up from 60% prior to her work. His other children took jobs in government, teaching, and medicine, all making significant contributions in their respective fields. I glanced around the room to see most people looked bored with my presentation. One guy in the back was even sleeping. In his memoir, Eli Cosper says, If it weren't for my mother's love and constant encouragement, the Hose Ho would not exist. I took a deep breath and signaled for Essis to change the slide. It showed an old picture of me in high school that I had Amelia send me. In it, I knelt down with my friends Emily and Leah between a group of 15 first graders. Each of the kids held up a picture book we'd been given for Christmas as part of our community service club project. I believe that my greatest contribution to the Hawkeye will not be through any career I might undertake, but through the life lessons I can pass down to my children. My next three slides gave an overview of what my duties as a mother would include. I didn't once mention cooking or cleaning. Instead, I focused on the emotional nurturing I would provide my children, citing various psychologists and scientific studies on the human brain. I talked about how staying home with my children would allow me the time and attention to raise them in an environment best suited to their personal growth. As Holly Cosper said, our tribe is the present, but our children are our future, I concluded. Thank you. I had to swallow down my nerves when the presentation was finally over. Thank you, Sophia, Professor Cameron said. That was a very unique, well-researched angle. I smiled, but my smile quickly faded when a girl in the front row raised her hand. Her name was Jill, and she'd given a presentation on working as an elementi on the Hose Ho so she could travel the world. Professor Cameron didn't even call on her before she started speaking. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Doesn't your presentation suggest that working mothers are somehow inferior to stay-at-home moms? I blinked several times, taken off guard by the question. No, I wasn't suggesting that at all. Wouldn't a traveling mother have less time and attention to give to raise their children in an environment best suited to their personal growth? Jill shot at me, crossing her arms over her chest. Absolutely not, I said. My palms were starting to grow clammy again. I hadn't at all anticipated that type of response. I was starting to wish I'd put some sort of disclaimer in the presentation. Working mothers can benefit from all the psychological studies I cited. But if they're not home with their kids, they would, like, screw them up, right? Jill challenged. Her tone was nasty. No, I stated firmly. All I'm saying is that staying home with my kids would be the right choice for my family. One guy in the back leaned over to his friend and whispered rather loudly, Lazy. The other replied, Trophy wife. How can you know what will be best for your family if you're not even married yet? Jill asked. You're just planning on marrying the first rich guy you can find? How do you know you won't need a job to support your family? 
I... I caped at her. Of course I thought working mothers were just as capable. My mom worked, and Amelia and I turned out fine. It just wasn't what I wanted for myself. That's enough, Professor Cameron said calmly. She stood from her desk and met me at the front of the room. It's not your job to judge and question other students' presentations, Jill. I breathed a sigh of relief. She's judging mine, Jill accused. I was not, I insisted. Professor Cameron held up a hand. That's enough, Jill. I don't think Sophia meant any offense by suggesting this was the right path for her. She provided a very compelling argument, supported by credible sources. That's more than I can say for you. A chorus of gasps traveled around the room. Next to Jill, a Toaqua guy froze the water in his water bottle and held it out to her. Want some ice to cool that burn? Shut up, Jill snapped at him. Professor Cameron turned to me while the rest of the class broke out into conversation. She handed me the rubric she'd been using to mark my scores. I would have liked to see more comparison on the role between working mothers and stay-at-home mothers, but overall your presentation was very good. Congratulations, Sophia. I looked down at the paper to see my grade written in big numbers across the top. 98%! Holy crap! Esses hopped onto my shoulder and peeked at the grade then clapped in my ear. Shh, I told him. I didn't need everyone knowing what I'd scored. I returned to my seat, still trying to process the fact that I got an A on my presentation. Maddie had been right. It was like a huge weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Esses grabbed my rubric from my hands and put it on his head like a veil. He paraded across the table like he was walking down the aisle. I laughed at him and stroked his tail thinking what it would be like to get married. In my mind, Liam stood at the end of the aisle, with Jonah and Squeaks at his side, and Imogen and Sassy on the opposite end of the altar. We were outside in warm summer air, beneath a canopy of trees that swayed softly in the wind. The sun shined down like diamonds across the aisle. Essis walked in front of me with a basket of rose petals, sprinkling them in front of me as Canon in D played on an unseen organ. Everyone I loved was there, including Amelia and my parents. Liam and I would be married, and soon after we'd have kids of our own. I wondered if they'd look like me or like him. It seemed so perfect. Then a terrifying realization struck. Liam was Toaqua, and I was Coigny. It was forbidden for us to be together, but we couldn't sneak around forever. Unless we could truly get the Hawkeye to change their traditions, change the law, I'd have to choose between Liam and my dream of raising children. Chapter 17 Have you retrieved it yet? I tried to duck out of advanced Toaqua Magic 3 as quickly as I could, but Bane grabbed my arm and stopped me before I could leave the classroom. His eyes searched me as if he was trying to see what I would say next would be a lie or not. Obviously not, I said, irritated. If I had, I would have brought it to you immediately. Have you gotten close, he asked in frustration, or are you even trying? I'm not trying to procrastinate here, I shot back. I'm sorry, but I'm not convinced, Bane's tone was flat. If Sophia does have something powerful in her possession, we're in trouble. It shouldn't be that hard to steal an item from an 18-year-old girl and an oversized rabbit. It's a kerbal. I'd never used the word before, but fuck it. I wanted to piss Bane off. You think you can do a better job? Get on with it, because I'm at the end of my rope. You know I can't do that. If I were to be caught stealing something from a student, Coigny would know what we're up to. Bane's expression was tense. The Toaqua elders are done with waiting, Liam, and so is your father. I hadn't spoken to Dad since our argument, but I honestly didn't give a shit if he was getting impatient. He knew where I stood. This is my mission, I said. You assigned me to get the job done, and I will. Liam, Bane frowned. You know I don't feel good about any of this. I care about Sophia as well but I also know you won't follow through with this mission unless you're put under pressure. It's how you've been all your life. I get that this has to be done, but it's gotta be on my terms, I said. 
They're threatening the Lhasa, Bane said, and his words were desperate. You don't understand. Something in me got bitter and broke. No, you don't understand. You don't realize how much I fucking miss him. I ripped my arm away from him and left. I don't think I'd ever sworn at a professor before, but damn it, Bane was really starting to get on my nerves. And it was more than usual, so that was really bad. Every time he saw me, he asked if I had gotten my hands on the totem. I had to keep telling him no and acting like I didn't know what I was searching for. He acted more and more disappointed, and as much as I hated to admit it, it kind of hurt. It was nearing the end of the semester, the time of my deadline. I thought in January I'd have Nashoma back by now, and he still wasn't here. I was starting to freak out that the elders would retract their offer and refuse to bring Nashoma back at all. It had crossed my mind lately to try and do it myself, but how the hell did you raise someone from the dead? I wanted to ask for help. Imogen was such a killer researcher, she could probably dig something up, but that would totally blow my cover. I'd had a lot on my mind with Ancestors Day coming up and figuring out what I was going to say to Anna, along with getting my hands on the totem. It didn't make it any easier that Professor Perot had told me I was going to die a few weeks ago. Then I'd somehow started making a miraculous recovery. All my recent tests had come back really good, and it had practically sent Perot into a seizure. I didn't know what the fuck my body was doing. I wasn't hungry, too pissed off, so I went into basket weaving early to work on my project. But not even that helped my mood. Usually it calmed me down, but lately I kept on making mistakes. I had to tear out a lot of my work and start over several times. Professor Amber hovered over me and crooned that I needed to let the spirit in, whatever the fuck that meant. After class, I had a fuck ton of homework to do, but I didn't feel like doing it, so I headed to the commons instead. I heard a huge roar come from one of the classrooms, and a couple of people screamed. One of the large doors opened, and a Tyrannosaurus Rex, green with yellow feathers, came walking out of the classroom, carrying one of the professors. A Stegosaurus and a Velociraptor followed. A bunch of students came out from behind them, including Sophia and Imogen. Sophia was beaming with excitement. She saw me and left Imogen's side, hurrying over. Have fun in ancient familiars, I asked. Yes, who knew that dinosaurs weren't really extinct, she gushed. I got to pet a T-Rex. Essis was in her arms. He made little movements with his arms and growled, like he was pretending to be a dinosaur. Her enthusiasm was contagious. My eyes caught the loop around her neck that dipped into her T-shirt, hiding the totem. It was hard to concentrate on stealing the totem when all my attention went immediately to Sophia whenever she was in the room. You okay? Sophia eyed me. You don't talk much, but you're being quiet, even for you. I shrugged. Just Bane. He's annoying. Ah, okay, she said. I complained about Bane enough on a regular basis that Sophia was used to it. So, where are you headed? The commons? I was just going to chill for a while, I told her. Can I come chill with you? Her tone implied something more, but I wasn't in the mood. There really was something wrong with me today. I reached out and scratched Essis's chin. His eyes rolled back happily. Always. When we got there, Imogen had thankfully grabbed our usual spot around the big TV and the fire. She'd started studying, Sassy bent over one of the books like she was reading too. I saw that Miranda was close by. She was combing the hair of a white cat that had a blue tint in its fur, which shimmered like a wave every time it moved. Her elementi, a short, brown-haired woman with hazel eyes, watched in glee. I recognized her as Belinda. She was from my house. Miranda, you do such a good job with Esther's hair. I love it, Belinda said. Esther purred and leapt away from Miranda, jumping onto Belinda's lap. Esther's got a rather long coat, Miranda said. She'll feel so much better if you continue to keep it groomed. Belinda walked off, cuddling her cat and looking rather pleased. 
She made little raindrops form in the air and crystallize, giving Esther a diamond collar. Esther purred in happiness. Sophia and I sat down on the couch next to Imogen. Essis hopped up on the table where Esther had been and patted his head. Miranda laughed. You want me to do your hair too, buddy? Okay. Miranda picked her brush back up and started combing Essis's hair. The movement almost caused the little guy to fall over. Sophia said, Miranda, I wanted to tell you that your project for Hawkeye Careers was really cool. I didn't even know you could be a familiar hairdresser. Miranda shrugged. I don't know. I thought it was pretty good, but I only got a C. People have been picking on me for it since. Really? Sophia's eyes narrowed. Yeah, she sighed. I'm Coigny. People expect me to have some fancy, important job. I think doing hair is a waste of time. She frowned. I decided to speak up. They just want to show off. Power and reputation is everything in this society, I said. I'd rather have a job where I was happy than some trumped-up position where I'm respected but miserable. Right, Miranda said. She took a small can of hairspray out of her pocket. Cover your eyes, Esses. Esses did, and Miranda sprayed. She grabbed a mirror from the table to show him. There, what do you think? Esses squealed in happiness. Miranda had given him a mohawk. He flexed his muscles and grinned like he thought he was so tough. Well, you've made Esses happy, Sophia giggled. Yeah, Miranda sighed. She seemed a little down. But that's not very important, is it? Of course it is. We need all kinds of people in this world to make it work, I said. I guess so, Miranda gathered her things. See you guys later. Sophia and I looked at each other as she went. We were both thinking the same thing. One of the things that sucked about our world was so much of it was based off of birth, money, and status. People like Miranda, who followed their hearts and passions, were made to feel worthless because of it. Imogen looked up from her book. She had a coy look on her face as she reached into her bag and handed something to Sophia. I was in the store yesterday. I saw this and thought of you. Sophia started laughing. I looked down. Imogen had given her a canned tin of pineapple. You like? Imogen waggled her eyebrows. Oh yes, pineapple's my favorite, Sophia said. Both of them burst out laughing. I clearly didn't get the joke. I was alerted to Jonah's presence by the sound of clomping hooves, smashing objects, and drawn out over-exaggerated sighs. He collapsed onto the couch, but it wasn't in his own spot. It was on top of us. Jonah literally laid on top of our laps, spread across the three of us, and threw a hand over his eyes dramatically, giving another sigh. Imogen and Sophia made groaning noises as Jonah's weight squished them. Squeaks copied him, lying on the rug with four feet in the air. Essis jumped down and started punching her in the shoulder. She didn't notice. Aren't you supposed to be in class? I asked him, irritated. How can I possibly go to class when Raynar doesn't notice me? Jonah whined. I've done everything over the past semester to get him to ask me out, and he just doesn't. Hey, I've got an idea. How about you forget about him and find someone else? I asked sarcastically. I pushed Jonah off, and he went rolling on top of Squeaks. How can I do that? Jonah wailed from Squeaks' middle. How can I possibly go on? Imogen fumbled in her bag and pulled out two mini bottles of tequila. She handed one to Jonah while unscrewing another for herself. Here, Jonah, have this. Hey, where the fuck you get that, I asked, interested. I only brought enough for two for an emergency, she said, and Jonah obviously needs it. Jonah moaned again before he downed the shot. I rolled my eyes. He was being so ridiculous. Imogen raised the mini bottle in a toast and said, I'm through with men. I'm dating women from now on. Amen to that, sister, Jonah finished. He threw the empty bottle to the other side of the room, and I heard someone shout as it hit them on the side of the head. Why do you need it? I asked Imogen. For courage, obviously, Sophia grinned. She's going to ask out Cade. I need more time, Imogen squeaked. 
Jonah popped up onto his feet like he'd received an electric shock. Well, let's get to it. He reached for Imogen and pulled her up from the couch. What? No, I'm not ready, Imogen yelled. Jonah didn't pay attention. He carried Imogen through the commons and out the door. Sassy gathered Imogen's things into her bag and chased after them, carrying the tote in her mouth. Squeaks hopped playfully after the group. Sophia giggled. Too bad Cade's in class right now. Like that matters to Jonah, I said. He'll probably force Imogen to go in there and interrupt with a flash mob proposal. Yeah, right. She'll run away screaming, Sophia stood. I'm kind of hungry. Let's go eat. I shook my head. Don't feel like it. Liam, you have to eat, Sophia said sternly, and she grabbed my hand to pull me off the couch. Come on. Sophia was on me to take care of myself better than I did. She remembered my pills and potions a lot easier, and liked nagging me about how much sleep I got and how often I actually left my dorm. It didn't bother me. I knew she did it because she cared. She noticed as I picked at my food. I ended up feeding most of it to S's, who was more than eager to gobble small strips of steak out of my hand. Are you feeling okay? She asked in concern. I shook my head again. I feel fine physically. I just miss Nashoma today. Like ten times more than usual. Oh, I'm sorry. She frowned. It's okay. I checked the clock in the dining hall and stood up. I wasn't keeping track of the time. I was going to be late. Where are you going? She asked. It's Monday. I have Hawkeye Legends, I said. I thought that wasn't until later, Sophia asked. It's an early class today. Special reasons. You can come, I said. I actually was going to ask if you wanted to. Tonight's going to be really badass. Sure. Sophia got up and swung her bag around her shoulder. Essis hopped onto her other free one for a ride. I wanted to see if it would be something I'm interested in taking next semester anyhow. Professor Lopez was waiting at the beginning of the path up the ancestral mountain, along with a group of other students. Hey, Professor, I started. Do you mind if Sophia sits in today? She's thinking about taking this class next year. Of course, Professor Lopez smiled at her. I always welcome curious students, especially freshmen. This class isn't a requirement, but I think it contains very important information that every Hawkeye should know. Sophia seemed intrigued, and Essis tilted his head. Professor Lopez waved his hand and said, Everyone follow me, up to the top. We started walking up the path. Sophia kept her eye on me, but I made it up the mountain with relative ease. I didn't even have to stop to breathe or take a break. It was such a stark contrast to how I'd been at the start of the year. When we reached the summit of the mountain where the large totem with the five house symbols was fixed, people started gathering in a circle around a fire that Lopez was building. Sophia lightly brushed her hand against mine before she drew away. This place was special to us. It's where I'd first shown Sophia the ancestors and taught her about our history. Now she was going to learn even more about it. I was so excited. I loved sharing our culture with her. I sat next to Kira, a black-haired Navita girl. She and I got along pretty well. Her familiar, a barn owl named Bubo, hooted from her shoulder. Kira always had a book in her hand, which I liked. We'd exchanged recommendations often in class. Hey, Liam, do you have that psychic mystery book I lent you? Kira asked. Yeah, I reached in my bag and handed it to her. Thanks for that, by the way. It was really good. Kira smiled. I think I'm going to give it to Imogen next. We're total besties. I think she'd love it. Can I read it? Sophia asked curiously. Sure. Just pass it along to Im once you're done. Kira beamed as she handed it to Sophia. I'm sure I'll get it back eventually. I didn't know you were so into books, Liam. Imogen mentioned it once, but only in passing. Sophia said as she put the blue book into her bag. I read a lot, actually. I wasn't one of those people obsessed with selfies and social media, Jonah, or that could stay inside and play video games all day, Ezra. I wasn't a fan of technology. I preferred books. Professor Lopez stood in front of the fire. 
By this time, the sun was starting to set, and little stars were dotting the sky. As many of you know, Ancestors' Day is quickly approaching, Lopez began. It is the one day of the year that we are allowed to speak with our ancestral guides and celebrate the anniversary of when our powers were gifted to us by them and by the Great Spirit. What's the Great Spirit? Sophia asked under her breath. Listen and find out, I whispered back. Professor Lopez waved his hands. Shapes began forming from the flames, and they emerged out of the fires to become animals. A coyote stepped out of the bonfire, followed by a deer, an eagle, a bear, a bison, and a salmon. Other animals eventually joined them, wolves, raccoons, beavers. They moved around the mountainside, though when they brushed by you, they didn't burn your skin. Lopez used his fire magic to manipulate them as he narrated. When the world began, all that existed was the great spirit and the spirits that surrounded him, Lopez said. But he was not satisfied. Great Spirit wanted to create life. So the Great Spirit took four parts of himself, water, earth, air, and fire, and used them to make the world. He separated into four gods and goddesses, one for each element. Fire became the sun, water became the moon, air became space, and earth became our planet. They all worked together to sustain life. More figures emerged from the fire, people this time. The details that Lopez put into them almost made them look real. Humans created from flames. They were dressed in traditional hawkeye clothing and twirled in circles around the animals. The animals began to dance in tune with them, and Lopez increased the speed of his hands to continue the display in a more elaborate fashion. The first people, the hawkeye, rose up out of the ground fully grown, and they were protected and watched over by the four parts of the Great Spirit. But it wasn't long before things started to change. The figures picked up the dance, moving faster. There was discord, because the sun was in love with the moon. They could not exist together as friends, as earth and space could, for they were too different. Sun kept chasing moon through the sky, but he could never keep up with her, for she could not tolerate his heat. She was cool and calm, but he was headstrong and temperamental. They could love from a distance, but could not exist at the same time. And it was known throughout the world that fire and water were opposites, never to be united. Sophia and I glanced at each other. The shadows from the fire figures reflected off our faces. Lopez's words about fire and water never being able to coexist, let alone be together, were heavy and ominous. Even the gods were against us. How could you fight that? Sun was angry that he could not love Moon, Lopez said. Out of his anger, he created more gods and goddesses, like Coyote Spirit, to trick young people into chasing unrequited love and to show off his power. Not to be bested, Moon, Space, and Earth all created gods and goddesses of their own, such as Deer Spirit, the goddess of gentleness, and Salmon Spirit, the god of abundance and others. These gods and goddesses, all from the same great spirit, continue to guide and influence the Hawkeye today, as the ancestors do. Lopez brought back the fire figures into the blazing inferno that sat in the middle of the group, and we were all gathered around a normal fire again. A few people clapped as the story ended. You'll all be expected to write a paper about one of your chosen gods or goddesses for this semester's final, Lopez said. Extra points if you choose a spirit from your house. Class dismissed. People chatted as we rose to our feet. My mind scrambled through the different spirits I could do for my project. I thought about whale spirit because I knew the most about her and it'd be the easiest to do. Though on second thought, I might do coyote spirit, even though he was a coigny god. He tricked me into falling for a woman I could never truly have. Sophia stroked Essis's ears. I know this is our culture, but is all of that really true? That's something you should decide for yourself, isn't it? I slipped my backpack on. Though I hoped you liked the class. I did. It was really cool. She looked impressed. Can an elementized power really be influenced by astral bodies? Yes. Tawakwa can gain strength from the moon as Coigny draw power from the sun. But that's advanced magic. It's not something everyone can do, I said. 
We started the walk down the mountain. Lopez said the first Hawkeye came from the ground, but didn't the first Native Americans come here by crossing over the Bering Strait? Sophia asked. No, that's stupid, I said crossly. We've always been here. How? Great Spirit put us here, obviously. Sophia still looked confused. But she wasn't going to get our history in one night, so I let it go. Hawkeye religion wasn't something you could digest easily unless you'd been hearing about it for a lifetime. When we came back to the commons, we found Imogen slumped over a table, her head in her arms. She was making these tiny little meeping sounds. Sassy was using her paw to pat her on the back. Jonah was standing nearby, leaning on squeaks and looking disappointed. What happened? Sophia asked. Did she ask Kate out? No, she took one look at him, screamed and ran away, Jonah said, shaking his head. He's probably terrified of her now. Imogen let out a loud groan. Poor Im. Hey, turn the TV up, someone close by said. The sound of a news alert ringing out caught my attention. The three of us turned toward the biggest TV in the room. Imogen lifted her head to see what was going on. The local news was playing and people were blasting the volume. A broadcaster with a grim expression came on screen. Sophia's mouth fell open, and I felt like I'd been punched in the gut as we read the headline. The broadcaster spoke in a voice that was professional, but that didn't try to hide a revolted tone. This news may be disturbing to some of our viewers, and therefore we ask that discretion be advised, the broadcaster began. This morning, Kelly Katori of Nevita and Cameron Walken of Yapluma were discovered having sexual relations in the Green Tree apartment buildings within Nevita tribe borders. Upon interrogation by the Elementi task force, they confessed to being involved in an inter-house relationship. Two people, a man and a woman, were forcibly dragged out of a Nevita apartment building by the task force. They were bloody and their clothes were ripped. They'd been handcuffed, and the woman was being dragged by her hair. It looked like they were still trying to get to each other as they were shoved into metal boxes, carriages that were pulled by intimidating and mean-looking familiars. The announcer continued as Kelly looked desperately at the cameras, begging someone, anyone, to help. Joaquin and Katori lived separately, and though no Hawkeye marriage registration surfaced upon searching the residence, a California marriage license was found in one of the drawers at Katori's apartment, proving the couple's guilt. The camera panned to Cameron's face. It was so swollen from the beating that his eyes were shut. Had they really been that cruel? The announcer paused, and his voice took on a note of surprise. We've just gotten word that Katori was raising an interbred child, a product of her relationship with Walken. People groaned in disgust all around us. Sophia and I continued to watch as Kelly and Cameron's panicked faces were shown on screen. That's so fucking gross, a girl mumbled near me. How could you give birth to an interbred kid? I don't really care if you want to be in an inner house relationship, but don't bring kids into it. You're just setting them up to be picked on and ridiculed, her friend beside her said. More news, just in, the broadcaster continued, and the room quieted again. Since a child has been discovered, Katori and Walken have been convicted of having an inter-house relationship without a trial. Walken will spend life in prison. Katori, however, upon discovery that she indeed went through willingly with the pregnancy and birth of an inter-house child, has been sentenced to death. Sophia's face went stark white. On the screen, an image of two familiars fighting against a group of magical task force creatures came into view. One was an alicorn, the other was a white lioness. The familiars were tackled and held down by other creatures, chained and stuffed into cages. The elemental task force shot their elements through the bars at them, and both creatures screamed in pain. The child has been turned over to the care of the Nevita elders, the announcer continued. It has yet to be decided what will be done with him. On screen, a little boy in the arms of a task force member stared terrified at the multiple cameras that were shoved in his face. The boy was crying and asking for his mother. 
The reporters kept asking him questions about his parents, questions a toddler wouldn't be able to understand. He didn't answer any of them, just kept screaming louder. Sophia turned her head away. She couldn't watch, but she needed to see this, and so did I. The announcer cleared his throat. The elders would like to remind everyone that interhouse relationships are strictly forbidden, and that anyone romantically involved with someone not of their own house will be prosecuted in a similar way. There was the shuffling of papers. We've brought in a task force law enforcement expert, Octavius Paddington, for his take on this highly controversial issue. The screen stopped showing the awful images, and instead showed two men dressed in suits at a desk. Paddington was fat and had a handlebar mustache, as well as an expression that told me he felt justice had been served. Mr. Paddington, what do you have to say about the relationship between Katori and Walken? The newscaster asked. Well, let me start by saying it's just not natural, the so-called fucking expert said. Something like this goes against the laws of nature. These types of people are perverted. It's the result of a mental illness left untreated. So you're saying that this type of thing can be cured? The newscaster asked curiously. Conversion therapy has worked in some cases, though sadly too many of these depraved souls are too far gone to treat. Paddington shifted in his chair. At that moment, I heard someone else on camera give an outraged exclamation. The screen panned to a young woman with blonde hair and green eyes hidden behind huge eyeglasses. She was young, but her eyes were determined as she spoke. The law needs to be changed. Too many of our people suffer under these oppressive laws. The broadcaster shifted uncomfortably. Let me also introduce Jamin Risk. She is the leader and founder of the Interhouse Alliance, a group that advocates to make interhouse relationships legal. Risk continued before Paddington could speak. These laws are archaic and wrong. Elementi and interhouse relationships deserve the same rights as we do and should be allowed to marry and reproduce within our society. Come now, be reasonable. These types of relationships have the ability to ruin our culture and way of life, Paddington roared. May I suggest that you've participated in one of these vile unions yourself? Risk's eyes narrowed as if she was insulted. I have not. My husband is Nevita, as am I. Then why is it your problem? Why do you fight for people to fornicate our bloodlines and make them weak? Do you want to see us all die out like Anichi? Paddington hissed. Paddington and Risk started arguing, and I couldn't take it anymore. I walked away, and Sophia followed. I went into an empty classroom, and Sophia came in behind me. When Essis had jumped inside, I locked the door and slid against it. I ran a hand through my hair. Shit, this was really fucked up. I looked up at Sophia. Essis had leapt into her arms and was hugging her. She just stared at me. Do you believe me now? I asked weakly. Sophia swallowed. She seemed more scared than I'd ever seen her, even during the elemental cup. She then swept a lock of hair behind her ear and said, I don't care. You don't care? I made a sarcastic noise. Well, I do. What, you want to break up over this? No, but Sophia, fuck. We were quiet for a moment. Sophia squeezed Essis so hard in her arms I thought his big eyes were going to pop out. What'll happen to that little boy, she whispered. I shrugged and sighed. I don't know. He's interhouse. No one will adopt him. There's too much stigma attached to his name. Unless his grandparents take him, the elders will probably surrender him to the U.S. foster care system. Who knows from there? So he'll never know he's an elementi? Or that he needs a familiar? No, probably not. Not unless his powers came out and they had to bring him back in. I cleared my throat and stood up. And that's not something I want to put on a kid. That's not going to happen to us, Sophia said clearly, though I detected a tone of hesitation in her voice. Open your eyes, Sophia. Do you want that to happen to our kids? Or do you want to have to pick someday between having an abortion or risking that no one will ever find out their interhouse? I snapped at her. I know I don't want to make that decision. Sophia backed away from me, shaking her head. We're not having kids. 
I don't care how careful we are, Sophia. Accidents happen. I took a breath. And I don't know about you, but no matter how we feel about sex, if you haven't noticed, it's getting really hard not to have it. She gnawed on her lip. It doesn't matter. That's years away. Yes, it does, Sophia. We need to start thinking about this stuff now. She'd asked me to proofread her project for her Hawkeye careers class before she turned it in. The passion in it had been obvious, and it had made me feel guilty. Sophia really wanted kids, no matter what she'd told me about not having them in order to be with me. If we were going to be permanent, I didn't think I could resist having a baby with her, at least one, and not for very long. Sophia wanted to be a mom more than anything, and if I was honest with myself, I wanted to be a dad too. I couldn't imagine being a parent and making a baby with anyone but her. But could we put a kid through that? Being two halves of different houses, hiding themselves forever? That wouldn't be fair. I could tell Sophia was nervous. So was I. But it was even worse than I'd thought. They'd convicted Kelly and Cameron without a trial mostly because they'd had a child. That couldn't happen with us. If we got pregnant and were found out, I'd go to prison, but Sophia? She'd be killed. I felt sick. I must have looked green because Sophia put Essis down on a desk, then strolled up to me and took my hands. What we're doing is worth the risk. This is worth it. You hear me? I nodded, but it felt like she was far away. It took all I had to bring myself back down to earth again and not let myself get carried away with all the terrifying possibilities of what could happen. We need to lie low for a while, I told her quietly. With this on the news, everyone is going to be talking about interhouse relationships. They'll be gossiping. We can't risk being found out. Her expression was disappointed, but she nodded. Okay, I understand. I don't want to do this, but Sophia... We need to be careful. She nodded. I hugged her close to me and kissed the top of her head. The thought of something happening to her, it was something I couldn't handle. You're squeezing me so tight I can't breathe, she muffled against my t-shirt. I loosened up, but only a little. I don't want anything to happen to you. I'm not going anywhere. She brushed my hair back from my face and kissed me. Then she held my head in her hands and stared me down. Not ever. My mouth went dry and my throat got tight. I mentally checked off what I knew about Coigny. They were jealous types. Sophia? Check. They were crazy exes. Didn't want to find out. They were sex addicts and constantly horny. Sophia? Definitely check. Thank you very much. And they were passionate and didn't like letting go of their partners. Not for anything. Not even death. Check. Sophia would totally risk our lives so we could be together. Even still, I didn't think she comprehended what we could lose, and if she did, she didn't give a damn. That put her in terrible danger. The biggest threat to us wasn't the elders. It was Sophia herself. Just thinking about it made me hold her even closer, like I could protect her if something were to happen. She flung her arms around my neck and hung on to me. Lowly, she whispered, We could run away. The possibility was pretty tempting, that was for sure. But my stomach sunk at the reminder all the people we'd be leaving behind. We could never see our families or our friends ever again. We couldn't come back to Kinpago or Orenda. She buried her face in my shoulder. I couldn't leave Imogen or Amelia. Jonah either. Me too. Thinking about never seeing my parents or my brothers or sisters ever again was a depressing experience. But these were our lives we were talking about here. Was being together worth it? I thought it was, or at least I wanted it to be. But it seemed the closer I got to Sophia, the more I was taking away from her, and myself on top of it. We'll be okay, Sophia stepped out of my embrace and wiped a few stray tears away from her eyes. I know we will be. She picked up Essis and buried her face in his fur. I watched her and said lowly, We'll be fine, Pawi. But I didn't know that we would be, and that scared the hell out of me. Chapter 18 The following week and a half was the worst I'd ever had at Orenda Academy. 
after the news about Katori and Walken broke, Liam had been avoiding me. We hadn't hung out or even talked since. He wouldn't even meet my eyes in the hallway. He acted like I wasn't even alive. I understood we had to be careful. I really did. But I didn't want to be this careful. I passed by Liam on Tuesday evening on my way to meet with Madame Doya. He had his hands shoved into the pockets of his jeans and his head ducked low. He didn't even look up to notice me, but I could see the color drained from his face. I didn't miss the slow, unsteady steps he took, like he was trying not to pass out. I hurried over to him. It wasn't until I was right in front of him that he lifted his gaze. He looked surprised to see me. Liam, are you okay? I asked. I already knew the answer. I'm fine, he lied. You don't look fine. Liam glanced around the hall. I thought we agreed to be careful. We are. I just wanted to check in with you. And Essis wanted to say hi. I shoved Essis into Liam's arms before he could protest. Liam took him and softly petted him behind the ears. Essis purred and placed his paw on Liam's arm. I appreciate the gesture, Sophia, but... Liam glanced around again. There were a few students passing through the hall, but no one took notice to us. Can we hang out sometime? I asked. Just the two of us. It can be somewhere quiet and secluded. Please? Liam kept his gaze on Essis. I don't know, Pawi. I'm really busy with finals this week. Maybe next week, after the semester is over. He sounded hesitant, like he was trying to put it off as soon as possible. My heart broke a little at the rejection. We could study together for unicornology. Would tomorrow night work? Liam bit his lower lip, though I noticed color was returning to his cheeks now that he was holding Essis. Sorry, but Jonah and I have plans. Rain check? A weight settled on my chest. Our unicornology final was the day after tomorrow, so there wouldn't be another chance to study for it. Sure, I lied. I'll see you in class on Thursday. Liam forced a smile. See you, Soph. He handed Essis back and waved as he continued down the hall. Essis waved his little paw back while I watched Liam go. At least he'll feel better for a bit, I whispered to Essis. Not only did I never get to spend time with my boyfriend anymore, Essis couldn't heal him either if he wasn't around. It looked like Liam's health was getting worse again without Essis's magic. Essis dropped his ears as soon as Liam was out of sight. I turned and we started out of the castle and toward the woods. It was a long walk to the clearing, and my mind raced the whole time. Arenda Academy had started to become lonely. Not only was Liam keeping his distance, but Imogen was hard at work finalizing her project for her Hawkeye fashion design class, and Vanessa was either studying or hanging out with Bren. Jonah was too busy chasing after Reynard to be much fun. I'd spent most of my free time studying the maps Doya had given me and practicing my lightning, but so far I wasn't making any headway. At this point, I wasn't sure I would be able to do it. You have to. I told myself, for your friends and family. When I reached the clearing, Doya stood in the center of it with Naomi at her side. Dark clouds blocked out the stars above our heads. She crossed her arms and tapped the toes of her shoes in the grass. You're late, Sophia. I ducked my head. I couldn't have been more than two minutes late. Sorry. Doya walked over to meet me beside the dry log near the trail entrance. Before we get started, we have a few things to discuss. She gestured for me to take a seat. I sat and placed Essis in my lap. Doya smoothed out her skirt and took a seat beside me. I'm concerned, Sophia. My eyebrows shot up. Madame Doya? Concerned? I wasn't aware she was capable of such an emotion. I'm concerned you aren't taking this task seriously, she clarified. Of course, because no way in hell she'd ever care about me. Believe me, I said, I understand exactly what's at stake. Do you, Sophia? 
Stoya cocked an eyebrow at me. Because I've talked with your other professors. It seems you're putting quite a bit of effort into your classes, but you have yet to make any progress with your lightning. I don't think any of my classes are more important than this, if that's what you're suggesting. They're easier, though. Doya crossed her arms. Your Hawkeye Careers Project didn't sound easy. How did she even hear about that? Was she spying on me again? And why did she seem so angry about it? Are you suggesting I should have failed all my classes so I could do better with my Coigny magic? I accused. No, Doya replied in a clipped tone. I'm just saying that perhaps you should try putting as much thought and effort into this as you did researching how to be a good mother. I gaped at her. She seriously didn't think I was trying hard enough? I sighed and stood. Let's just get this over with. Doya huffed. This is never going to work with that kind of attitude. I need you at the top of your game tonight. Focus and effort. Got it? I nodded. Got it. I took a deep breath and tried to focus on the task at hand like she said. Esses hopped down from my arms to watch, and Doya led me to the center of the clearing. Naomi watched from her side. Doya crossed her arms and eyed me. Let's see what you've got. I lifted palm to the sky and felt my heat rise within me. Each passing second seemed like minutes. Though I closed my eyes to concentrate, I could still sense Doya's scrutinizing gaze on me. And that only made my skin heat hotter. Her eyes felt like lasers. I gathered all that heat inside my chest, then sent it out through the palm of my hand. A bright orange light shot upward, and a wave of heat spread across my face. My eyes shot open as Doya took a step backward. She frowned at me. Sorry, I mumbled. Doya straightened and pressed her finger to her chin like she was thinking hard. I shifted uncomfortably in the silence. We need to try something else, she said, mostly to herself. Are you sure you're focusing as hard as you can? Was it easy for you to conjure lightning your first time? I shot back. Doya pursed her lips, but she didn't answer the question. Ancestors' Day is less than a week away. We don't have the luxury of waiting any longer. If you cannot conjure lightning by then, well, I don't have to tell you what the elders will do. My shoulders fell. I understand. Believe me, I've run the scenario through my mind countless times, and the looming threat still isn't enough to push my magic to where it needs to be. Forget about the threat for a moment. Doya suggested. Easy for you to say, I muttered. She wasn't the one who was on the verge of losing everyone she loved. I glanced to Essis on the log, who watched me with bright eyes. Doya took a deep breath and softened her tone. Fire is made of a whirlwind of emotions, but lightning? It takes precision and control. For some Coigny, that control comes from honing their anger, frustrations, and rage. But I don't think that's going to work for you. It was always weird when Doya went into teacher mode instead of acting like a drill sergeant. Don't use your anger to focus your heat, she instructed. I carefully considered her words. Was that what I'd been doing? Turn around and face your familiar, Doya said. I did as I was told. Essis fluffed his tail and waved to me. I shot him a smile. The sound of Doya's feet retreating in the grass reached my ears. Forget that I'm here. Right now, it's just you and your familiar and your lightning. Let your senses guide you. I nodded. I wasn't entirely sure I understood where she was going with this, but I figured I might as well give it a shot considering nothing else had worked yet. Inhaling a deep breath, I forced the muscles in my shoulders to relax. The sound of Doya's footsteps stopped. All I could hear was the soft breeze rustling through the trees around us, 
and the long blades of grass brushing against one another beneath me. The air was cool but humid, and it smelled like oceans and evergreens. Kind of like Liam. Essis raised his nose and sniffed the air, like he too noticed the familiar scent. He stood on his hind legs and glanced around, like he thought he might find Liam standing close by. His big blue eyes searched the clearing, then lifted to meet my gaze. There was an emotion in his eyes I couldn't quite read. It held hints of sadness, like he was sad Liam wasn't around, but also of hope. It wasn't until that moment that I realized how much Essis truly cared for Liam. It was like he knew Liam belonged in our lives, that there was no alternative for me. My heart melted thinking of the two of them. And then it hit me. That heat that was melting my heart, that was what I needed to make my lightning work. It was passion that came only from the people I loved. I cocked a finger at Essis. He hopped off his log and bounded through the grass over to me. His ears curled back as the wind rushed across his face. He leapt, and I caught him in my arms. I hugged him tightly and buried my nose in his fur. Heat rose to my face, burning my cheeks. I held it back, waiting for the right moment. Essis reached his paws out and wrapped them around my face in a hug. When he hugged me, it was like my mind flipped a switch. My thoughts suddenly weren't racing anymore. I was focused. I ran back through my mind every hug I could think of. When Liam and I cuddled in the cave during the tournament. When our team huddled together after we won. When Amelia came to visit. When I saw my parents in the forest and ran into their arms. As I thought of everyone I adored and all the love they'd shown me, the heat inside my body grew fiercer than I'd ever felt before. Essis drew away for just a moment, then pressed his mouth to my cheek. It was the first time my familiar had ever kissed me, and it made all the love and happiness in my chest explode. Thrusting my palm up toward the sky, I let all the heat out of my skin. Crack! A blinding white light flashed across the clearing, and thunder rumbled in the sky. A wave of disbelief and amazement washed over me so fast that I stumbled backwards and fell onto my butt in the grass. As soon as the lightning came, it was gone. I stared up at the sky, unblinking. Clouds rushed by above me. But I continued to stare, like I thought I might get another chance to witness the lightning. Essis straightened and climbed onto my shoulder. He broke the silence with a squeaky cheer. I did it, I said to him breathlessly. It still hardly seemed real, even after saying it out loud. Congratulations, Doya stepped forward. She had a look on her face that, dare I say it, actually hinted at pride. Doya was proud of me. She reached out her hand and helped me to my feet. I can't believe it, I said, still trying to process. You'd better start believing it, Sophia, Doya replied, because you're going to have to do it again. Okay, I stated confidently. Now that I'd done it once, I felt like I could do it a hundred times. Show me. Doya stepped back, and I raised my hand toward the sky again. Twice more, I made lightning crackle across the sky before Doya was satisfied. Now that I'd broken the code, it was easy. Doya cracked the smallest hint of a smile. Good job. Now that you've accomplished this, you're ready to hear more about your task. She led me back to the log and spoke in a serious tone. On the night of Ancestors' Day, you will enter the Anachi Temple. As we've discussed in previous sessions, you must find the summoning room, which is where the Anachi used to summon the ancestors. You will perform an ancient ceremony that will allow you to speak with Shawana Harjo. I chewed my lower lip, unintentionally letting my uncertainty show. The hardest part of your training is over, Doya said. I will now teach you the ceremony. Then you will finally be ready.
I was still riding the high of my training session with Doya when I returned to the castle. I felt so proud that I entered the commons with a huge smile on my face. I loved the commons. It was like a picture straight out of a million-dollar home. The whole thing was bathed in wooden textures, with a high ceiling, soft lighting, and various stone fireplaces. Different colored area rugs lined the floor, separating the large room into various seating areas, and a chandelier hung low over the pool table. Between the TVs hung many paintings of magical creatures. My favorite was one of a female centaur with a unicorn horn and pegasus wings holding a sword. The commons were crowded at this hour, with various people crowded around the pool table and ping-pong tables, and another crowd by the TVs. I found Imogen at one of the tables in the corner, frantically organizing piles and piles of pictures. Her project took up the whole surface. Sassy stood on a chair with her front paws on the table. Her eyes darted around the pictures, following Imogen's quick-moving hands. I sat next to her and put Essis on the chair beside me. Imogen looked up and blew the hair out of her eyes. Oh, good. You're here. Can you help me? What are you doing? I glanced around at the craft supplies in front of her. There were piles of magazines, endless bits of torn-up paper, scissors, glue, and glitter. Imogen flipped through one of the magazines, then tossed it aside before picking up the next. I'm making a collage for my fashion design class to go with my presentation. I have to get this done tonight. Im, why do you leave it until the last minute? I wasn't going to do one, but I figured it would really help spice up my presentation. She finally stopped long enough to look up. Her eyes pleaded with me. Yeah, absolutely, I said. I'll help you out. What do you need? Imogen breathed a sigh of relief, then handed me a sick fashion magazine. Can you cut out any pictures of scarves or boots you find? Sure. I picked up a pair of scissors and flipped open to the first page. Essis stood on his tiptoes to help me look through the magazine. Thanks, Imogen said. You are a lifesaver. Hey, Essis, you want to help me out over here? Essis hopped onto the table and took the glue stick Imogen held out to him. She instructed him to place the glue on various pictures, which she stuck to the huge poster laid out on the other side of the table. You're going to ace this class, I told her. Imogen gave a shy smile, but it quickly faded when the sound of cheers filled the air from across the room. Her eyes locked on something behind me. I turned to see the crowd near the ping-pong tables had parted, just enough that I could see Cade. He held his fists in the air like he'd just claimed a victory. Arabelle stood at his side happily. Cade was rumored to be a champion at ping-pong. Who's up next? he asked, eyeing the crowd for his next challenger. I turned back to Imogen with a raised eyebrow. I know, she muttered. A deal's a deal, just not now. She ducked her head, turning bright pink. Now's a great time, I said. In front of all those people? She asked in disbelief. Well, is he going to say no in front of everyone? I challenged. The truth was, I wouldn't do it either, but I kind of wanted to be there to see it. He could, she hissed. You have to at least give me a time frame, I told her. If not now, then when? Imogen bit the inside of her lip and pressed a picture to her poster. She stole another glance at Cade, but quickly looked away. I don't know. Soon. Before the end of the semester, I insisted. She sighed. I know. I want to. I just... I don't know. I set my magazine down. Imogen, he's not going to say no. She paused for a moment before picking up another photo for Essis to glue. She didn't say anything. I glanced back to Cade. He was totally killing it against his new opponent, with cool moves like holding the paddle behind his back. His rival was a Navita guy named Sam I'd seen around before. He had an alicorn familiar named Zarya, who was black but whose fur glittered dark blue in the light. Sam missed the ball, but Zarya bounced it back to Cade with her nose. Several people laughed. That doesn't count, Cade said as he caught the ball. His eyes darted in our direction, like he was hoping to catch Imogen's eye. When he saw she wasn't paying attention, he turned back to his game. 
Imogen kept throwing nervous glances his way while he played, but she didn't seem like she wanted to talk about him. I think that's enough scarves and boots, she said. Do you think you could find me a big picture of a bow? I can try, I offered, grabbing a new magazine from the pile. Imogen looked toward Kate again, and her whole body froze up. I turned to look at what she saw, but she swatted at me and hissed, Don't look! He's coming over here! Imogen tried to stay calm as she placed another picture on her collage. I ignored her instructions and glanced to Cade anyway. He had finished his game and was leading Arabelle over to us. Now's your chance, I whispered to her. Imogen threw me a nervous glance, then lifted her gaze to Cade. Hey, how's it going? Great, he replied, sliding into a chair at the table. Arabelle sniffed sassy and their noses touched. What are you up to? Homework, Imogen said, in a voice that didn't sound like her own. Wow. Cade looked down at her project, which was half finished by now. Looks great. She blushed. Thanks. Do you need any help? Cade offered. No, I... Imogen started, but I cleared my throat and cut her off. I raised an eyebrow and glanced between them, urging Imogen to take her shot. I... I guess you can help, Imogen finally caved. But it's kind of boring. <sighs> Don't say that, Cade replied. Hanging out with you could never get boring. Imogen turned a brighter shade of red than the carpet beneath us. I nudged her under the table and she grimaced. Really? She asked him shyly. Yeah, Cade winked at her. You know I love spending time with you. Imogen's mouth hung open, and her eyes darted between mine and Cade's. I kicked her again under the table, this time harder. She looked like she was too stunned to feel it. Maybe, Imogen hesitated. That a girl, keep going. Imogen tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. Maybe we could hang out sometime over dinner, just the two of us. Yes, finally. I couldn't help but beam for her. Cade looked like he was holding his breath. Like, like a date? Imogen began rifling through her magazine pages again so she didn't have to look at him. I mean, it doesn't have to be a date. Why not? Cade asked. Imogen stopped dead in her tracks. She opened her mouth, but nothing came out. A smile slowly crept across Cade's lips. I think a date sounds lovely. Imogen was practically sweating through her shirt right now. Meanwhile, my insides were all jittery and excited for her. Um, okay, Imogen said, sounding relieved. It's a date then. Sassy's ears perked up. She hopped on the table and nudged her nose into Imogen's hand. Imogen looked down at her. When she did, something in her eyes changed. It was like she and Sassy were having some sort of silent conversation. You know what, Cade? Imogen straightened, looking more confident. I don't want just one date. We've already gone out once before. I want to be your girlfriend. Will you go out with me? My jaw dropped. Essis leaned forward to wrap his arms around Imogen's wrist like he was hugging her. She was so enamored watching Cade that she didn't even notice. Cade looked so shocked by the offer that he could barely find his words. You want to be my girlfriend? Imogen hesitated a moment, like she couldn't believe she'd just admitted it. She bit her lower lip. You heard me. A silent beat passed over our table before Cade finally answered. Yeah, Imogen, I'd really like that. Imogen beamed. This was absolutely perfect. Oh my gosh, Imogen and Cade were officially a thing. I was so happy for them. Hey. The sound of Jonah's voice snapped us all out of it. I looked up to see him approaching us. Squeaks followed behind him and stepped on a canine familiar's tail. The dog yelped, and Squeaks bowed her head to him like she was sorry. Jonah didn't look happy. Hey, Jonah, Imogen said, sounding like herself again. What's up? Not much. 
Jonah shoved his hands in his pockets and cocked his head, gesturing to the door. Can I talk to you for a minute, Sophia? Panic suddenly entered my chest. What was this about? Was Liam okay? Yeah. I rose from my chair and scooped Essis up off the table. Catch you guys later, I said to Imogen and Cade. They barely heard me. The two of them were already in their own little world. Jonah led me, Squeaks, and Essis outside. What's wrong? I demanded once we were in the hall. Jonah took a deep breath and blew it out slowly. Look, Sophia, I just talked to Liam, and he's not doing well. I pulled Essis closer to me. I know. We haven't had much time together lately, and- This has gone on long enough, he interrupted. Liam deserves to know what's going on. But Jonah, I- Jonah wagged a finger in my direction. Don't butt Jonah me. Liam has no idea what's happening to him. It's scary enough as it is being sick. Now his health is all over the place, and he has no idea why. One second he's great, and the next he's down in the dumps again. And I can sure as hell tell you those potions Perot gave him aren't doing their job. I know you've been sending Esses to heal him. He just hasn't made the connection yet. Jonah. I opened my mouth to argue, but I didn't know what to say. At this point, I didn't really have an excuse anymore. I know I'm not being fair to him. Jonah scoffed, and Squeaks narrowed her eyes at me from beside him. Essis looked confused by their hostility. That's an understatement. My Liam baby deserves better than this. I hung my head and whispered, I know. Jonah crossed his arms. If you don't tell him soon... I will. That was all he said before he stomped away and entered the commons again. I just stood in the hall, shaking in complete shock. Jonah had never treated me like that before. Whatever he and Liam had talked about must have been serious. I suddenly felt very concerned for Liam. We'd just healed him earlier. Had it not been enough? Just as I decided to head to his dorm room to check on him, Screw the rules about a Quigney in the Toaqua dorms. I saw him coming my way. He looked better than earlier, but still worse than normal. Liam, I called, rushing up to him. I put an arm out to pull him into a hug, but he pushed me away. A little piece of my heart broke in response. More than I cared to admit. I swallowed down the lump rising to my throat. Careful, Pawi, Liam whispered. He glanced toward the door to the commons, where voices were spilling out into the hall. I can't even touch you anymore? I shrunk in on myself and pulled Essis close to my chest. It felt like it had been so long since I'd touched Liam. You know it's not about that. It's... Liam cut himself off and sighed. Have you seen Jonah around? I thought you two were just hanging out. We were, but he forgot his homework. Liam waved a notebook in his hand. Uh, yeah, he's in there. I gestured to the door, but a wave of fear overcame me when Liam took a step toward it. Would Jonah tell him about Essis when he went in there? How much time did I have before Jonah broke the news to him? Wait, Liam. Liam turned to look at me. He had an expectant look on his face behind tired eyes. I knew I should have told him by now. Jonah was right. I couldn't keep waiting. And the longer I waited, the worse it would be. I knew all that. But when I opened my mouth, the words just wouldn't come out. Liam already looked so worn. This didn't feel like the right time. What? He asked with a sigh. The tired look he gave me was heartbreaking. It was a reminder of how unfair I'd been to him. And that hurt, because I wanted to be the one to heal him. I wanted to be the one to fix everything. And even though Essis and I could help, we weren't doing enough. Telling him the truth, admitting that I'd been dishonest with him all this time, that would only break him further. I didn't want to be the one who hurt him. I just miss you so much. My voice cracked. 
All the emotions I'd been burying down this week caught up to me in one big wave. Jonah's threat piled atop my worry for Liam, and I didn't feel like I could share any of it with him. Though Liam was standing right there, I suddenly felt very alone. My eyes burned at the threat of tears. Liam took a step back. I knew he was feeling like crap, but the distance still stung. I just wanted to snuggle up with him and make everything better. But it didn't feel like he wanted that at all. I want to be with you again, I whispered. Liam's jaw tensed. Sophia, I'm just trying to protect you. By avoiding me? I hissed. That's not doing either of us any good. Sophia, this is bigger than you realize. You think that I want to stay away from you? Liam stepped so close I thought he might touch me, but he didn't. It was a perfect metaphor for our relationship as of late. So close, yet so far away. Yes, but we can work through it all, I said. There are things I want to tell you, Liam, but I can't confide in you if I never see you. Liam paused a moment. What kind of things? I dropped my gaze to Essis in my arms. Now was definitely the wrong time to tell him. I needed a clear head to do it, and right now it felt as if my whole body was being squeezed by a vice grip. I shot a glance toward the commons door. Things that would be easier to talk about alone, in private. Liam scowled. You know what happens every time we're alone. I'm not really feeling up to that. My mouth fell open in shock. You think that's all I think of you? I exploded. I don't care about fooling around. I'd just like the chance to at least talk to you. Liam hushed me. I didn't care. The first part of the semester, you acted like you didn't want to be together. Then you told me you wanted to make this permanent. Now you're acting like you don't want to date me at all. So what's the deal? Make up your mind. You think I haven't risked enough to be in this relationship? He said. If I didn't want to be with you, I wouldn't have asked you out in the first place. Then what are we doing, Liam? We just have to give it more time, Liam insisted. Stop being so pushy. I blinked several times, taken off guard by his words. I'm... I'm not... You are, Sophia. Liam gritted his teeth. Just stop pushing me. I couldn't take it anymore. My temper erupted. You'd never get out of bed if it wasn't for me. Someone has to pick you up every two seconds. Maybe you need pushing. Liam winced, and Essis gasped at me. I couldn't believe the words flew out of my mouth. I didn't mean that, did I? Liam stared at me. I just couldn't handle the pain in his features. I'd hurt him. I'd hurt him hard, and no amount of healing magic was going to fix it. Only time. I... I could barely get the words out. I'm sorry. I turned around and walked away from him, humiliated. I couldn't even face him right now. I was so disgusted with myself. How could I have said that to him? I didn't resent him, did I? I didn't know what was up with my feelings right now. But even though we'd had a fight and said things we didn't mean, I wasn't losing Liam for anything, especially not through any fault of my own. From now on, I had to let him come to me at his own pace, no matter how much it hurt to keep my distance. Chapter 19 Liam, I'm not going to let you sit in there all weekend. Fuck off, Ezra. There was hammering on the door. My brother was trying to force his way into my dorm. I stayed under my blanket and refused to move. It was quiet and dark under here, and I liked it. I'm coming in there. There was the sound of the lock freezing before it burst. The doorknob fell off before Ezra pushed it open. Diami walked in after him. The Thunderbird's head was nearly up to his shoulder. He'd grown a lot in the past few weeks. 
He was going to be giant when he was fully grown. I threw my blanket off and clambered out of bed. Damn it, Ezra, now I have to get a new lock. Open it next time. Ezra was clearly dealing with no shit today. Now, are you going to come out, or do I have to drag you? I already told you, I want to be left alone, I glared at him. I've left you alone for three days. It's time to come back to the land of the living, he said. Come have a beer and chill out with the rest of us. You've barely been in the pool all semester. Don't feel like it, Ezra rolled his eyes. Come on, dude, can you please make up with Sophia for all our sakes? I doubt she wants to see me, I mumbled. I'd told Ezra that Sophia and I had fought, but I didn't tell him what it was about or what was said. He probably thought it was minor couple stuff, when really it was so much more. Look, I know things are kind of tense right now, he started. You mean how two people from interhouse relationships pretty much got killed and imprisoned for life? Yeah, kinda, I spat back sarcastically. Bro, I will bring Jonah in here, he pointed at me. He will carry you out with one arm, I sighed. He totally would. I don't even know what to say to her, I started pathetically. Ezra took me by the shoulders and pushed me out of the dorm. Just say you're sorry or whatever. I fight with my girlfriends all the time and we always make up. It's not a big deal. Yeah, but I bet they don't basically call you weak and a burden, I thought. I hadn't seen Sophia since our fight. I'd even asked our unicornology professor to let me take the exam early so I wouldn't have to show up and face her. It was petty and over the top, I know, but I couldn't look her in the eye right now. I thought Sophia was different from the rest of the tribe. I thought she didn't believe I was just dead weight, that I was just like everyone else. Had I been wrong? Whatever she said, she probably didn't mean, Ezra said, reading my face. Just talk to her about it. You're likely blowing things out of proportion. I had a tendency to do that, but Ezra didn't understand. I mean, I didn't tell him, but still. What Sophia had said really hurt. It was the worst thing she'd ever said to me. And the worst part about it was that I couldn't do anything to change it. I couldn't magically make myself better. It would never happen. But Ezra was kind of right, too. We were running out of time. The semester was ending soon, and once it did, we'd have to figure out how to sneak around to see each other over the summer. Unless, of course, she no longer wanted to date me. I had no idea. Fine, you're right. I brushed back my hair and straightened up. I guess it's time to put an end to this. There you go, Ezra slapped me on the back. Diami cawed behind him. I expect to see the both of you show up tonight at Ancestor's Day. That's right, that was tonight. All of Kinpago was getting ready for the celebration. I'd almost forgotten about summoning Anna and speaking with her. Maybe she could clue me in about all the crazy stuff my health was doing lately. I really didn't want our argument on my mind when I was supposed to be celebrating with the rest of the tribe, so I decided to seek Sophia out and talk to her. It was her first Ancestor's Day. It should be special for her, too. I had no idea where to find her, but it was late in the afternoon, so I didn't think she'd be in the Coigny dorms. I looked in the commons, the dining room, and the entrance hall without any luck. The longer it took to find her, the more my mind kept going. I couldn't get our argument out of my head. Hadn't for days now. Part of the reason her words stung so much were they were kinda true. I couldn't do anything about my health, sure, but I had to agree with her when she said I had to be pushed. Bane pushed me. My dad pushed me. Ezra had even pushed me to get out of bed. I didn't do anything on my own. It wasn't because I was lazy. I just was really scared to fail, so I never wanted to try. It was better to do nothing than to let everyone down. But damn, I didn't want anyone feeling like they were being dragged down by me. Did Sophia feel that way? It was scary to consider. Holy shit, did she think I couldn't perform in bed because I was sick? I wasn't sure, but I really hope not. 
I didn't feel well a lot of the time, but I still had enough endurance to last when we were fooling around. That I'd be able to do until I was on my deathbed. I was determined. I didn't know. All I figured was the woman I loved felt less of me, and it was the worst feeling in the world. I spotted Jonah and Imogen outside, playing a game. They and their familiars tossed a ball back and forth, not allowing it to touch the ground. They were laughing. Sophia wasn't with them. Jonah caught my eyes as I passed by, and I waved. He gave me a weak smile that looked guilty. Jonah had been acting like the argument was his fault, though I had no idea why. I remembered how our conversation had gone the other day. I vented to him about how frustrated I was about my health being up and down. Normally, I'd talk to Sophia about it, but she was so on edge lately and worried about me enough. I didn't get why, but the conversation had turned to Sophia. Liam, Jonah had started. Don't you think Sophia's been a little forward lately? Especially with you? I didn't think so, or at least I didn't want to admit it. She's not Mia. We don't have a bad relationship, I'd said. But I'm not saying you do. You guys are great together, and I know she's a far cry from the wicked bitch of the East you used to date, but she walks all over you sometimes. You've got to stand up for yourself, Jonah had said. Sophia's my good friend, and I love her, but she's not the perfect angel you want her to be. I knew Sophia wasn't perfect. And yeah, I'd let her get away with a lot of stuff this semester and not spoken up because I didn't want to piss her off. But though she wasn't perfect, she was still perfect for me. But Jonah's words had resonated with me and they'd come out in our argument. Sophia never pushed me when it came to sexual stuff or much of anything else, but she did want her way, and she wanted it in ways that were dangerous. The biggest problem in our relationship was that she wanted us to go public, to fight tradition, to take a risk, and I didn't. She kept asking for more than what I could give her. It seemed like this giant hurdle we couldn't get over. It had been an issue from the beginning. Finally, I spotted her. She was outside near the greenhouses. Essis was sitting on one of the fountains, and Sophia was pacing back and forth, wringing her hands. She looked nervous and worried. I didn't understand why. Finals were pretty much over. Had I been such a shitty boyfriend that I didn't notice there was something bothering her? I'd spied on her last session with Doya, but I'd had to leave halfway through because I got sick and hadn't been close enough to hear what they were talking about. I watched her conjure lightning once before I had to leave. I probably missed some crucial information during the second half of that meeting, but right now I didn't care about that. I didn't even give a shit about the totem right now. I just wanted to fix this fight. Then, I resolved, I'd tell her everything. About the assassination contract, the sessions with Bane, what Dad had asked me to do, and how I wanted Nishoma back, but the only way to do it was to lose her. I'd come clean right now, before the Ancestors' Day ceremonies begun. Then we'd work it out together. We'd find a solution. That's what I should have done from the beginning, but I'd been too cowardly. That ended today. I was so scared to talk to her. There was this giant pit in my stomach that was eating me alive with the thought of facing her. But not talking to her hurt way more, and I wanted this fight to be over with. I walked over with my hands in my pockets. Hey, so, can we talk? She jumped as if I'd scared her. She hadn't even noticed me walk over. Her eyes scanned me quickly before she glanced at Essis. He shrugged at her. Um, uh, I don't know, Liam. I'm kind of busy today. She seemed freaked out for some reason. Her eyes were huge and they darted from side to side like she was trying to get away. Essis looked up at her, concerned. I practically had alarm bells when it came to Sophia being upset. Something was wrong. I was starting to wonder if she had yelled at me because she was stressed out and not because she was actually mad at me. What's wrong? I asked. You suddenly care now? Her eyes narrowed. Her whole body was practically shaking with nerves. Ancestors, what was wrong with her? I had a feeling this was way beyond me. 
Of course I care. I always do, I said. You can always tell me. Well, I can't this time. She went to pick up her bag, but I grabbed her arm and stopped her. Soph, let's work this out. Please. You didn't want to work it out a few days ago. Why now? She looked hurt. There was more bothering her than just our argument, but it was obvious it still weighed on her mind. I was being an ass then. I didn't feel well. I know it's no excuse, I told her. Vertigo hit me and I staggered. The world went sideways. Liam, you okay? Sophia asked. She came closer and rushed forward to touch me, but hung back at the last second. I just need to sit down, I said. I stumbled and ended up on the fountain. Sophia sat beside me and Essis crawled on my lap. He put his little paws on my chest and looked up at me. A soft warmth grew where his tiny paws were. I'd never felt such a sensation before. It was weird. Sophia looked like she wanted to touch me, but she hesitated like she was scared. I turned away. I hate when you see me like this. I don't mind. That's not what you said the other day. She frowned. I don't know why I said that. I've never thought it before. It just popped out. Yeah, well, it hurt a lot. I crossed my arms and tucked them tightly to my sides. The vertigo was subsiding and things were righting themselves again. I was feeling better. Essis curled up into my shirt and sighed happily. I'm sorry I hurt you. I know that was a horrible thing to say and I can never take it back. She bit her lip. But you hurt me too. I went to hug you and you pushed me away. It's like you didn't want me. Her eyes were watery. I didn't push you away because I wanted to. We were right outside the commons. If someone had seen, that would have been it, I told her. I looked around. I don't think this is the best place to talk about this, out in the open. Shouldn't we go somewhere more private? She huffed and crossed her arms. Worried I'll just jump you the moment we're alone? I didn't mean to say that either. I was in a bad mood, sorry, I said. I don't think all you want is sex. Sure seemed like it. Soph, come on. I got up and tugged on her arm. She followed, but only because I was yanking on her. Essis clung to my shirt and looked between us like he was tired of all the drama. I led her through the woods. We went through plenty of open areas where it was secluded, but I didn't stop at any of them. Where are we going? she asked. Our special place, I said. I kept walking until we reached the waterfall clearing. This time of year in May, it was already hot and the flowers in the clearing had grown even larger. Huge butterflies flew around in rainbow colors, blending into camouflage whenever we came near. The pool had risen from the melted snow up in the mountains, and the waterfall was even louder as it roared down into it. Sophia stepped toward the tree she'd burned our initials into and ran her fingers over it. I'll always remember that night, she said. I really liked you back then, I confessed. I didn't know, Sophia said quietly. I thought you hated me. I couldn't believe it. I thought it had been obvious. I sat by the pool underneath a shaded tree and Sophia took a seat beside me. Essis jumped off my shoulder and ran up a nearby tree trunk into the cover of branches. We were silent a moment. It's like neither one of us knew what to say. Just apologize, Ezra said in my head. I'm sorry, I started. I didn't mean what I said. I was a jerk. I should be sorrier. What I said was completely awful, Sophia said. She stared at the waterfall and didn't look at me. I'm not going to lie that it didn't hurt my feelings, I said. But what's worse is believing you actually think that way. It's not about your health, Liam, she shook her head. I didn't want to admit it, but when we talked about how we needed to be careful and stay away from each other for a while, it really hurt me. It was like you were pushing me away. It wasn't about that at all, I said, astounded. Deep down, I know that, and I knew you were just trying to protect me. Her voice wobbled. But I can't help what I feel, and I feel like you're leaving. It's like you're avoiding me again, like you did last semester. 
It upset me then, but it's ten times worse now. I need that time with you. I don't care what we're doing. I just need you. That was really hard to acknowledge. I'd avoided her last semester more or less for the same reasons I was staying away from her now. I didn't think it had bothered her that much, when in reality it had bothered her a lot. You'll always have me, I said. I went to take her hand, but she flinched and pulled away like she was scared to touch me. Okay, now I knew how it felt, and it really did suck. You don't get it. I don't understand sometimes why you won't let me touch you, why you seem so distant. I just need space sometimes. It's how I am. It doesn't mean I don't want to be with you, I said. But you're always talking about how this is dangerous, how it can't work, she went on. I had to fight for us to be together, and sometimes it feels like I have to fight for us to stay together. I don't know if you want to be with me as much as I want to be with you. She sniffed and wiped her nose. Of course I want to be with you. I'd risk anything for you. I reached over and brushed away a few of her tears. Please stop crying. I hate it when you cry. She shook her head. I know you love me, but sometimes I worry that you're not ready to be in this relationship. Sophia, please look at me. She lifted her head and I said, there isn't anywhere I'd rather be right now. Promise. I know she didn't think that I'd given up enough in this relationship, but she didn't know what I had sacrificed. My relationship with my dad, risking the water elder's wrath, even possibly the chance of losing Nishoma forever, to be here. I cared just as much as she did. I just didn't know how to tell her, or how I could. I sat back to give her some space. What brought all this on? You were in a bad mood before we even got in a fight the other day. She paused before she went on. Jonah, talk to me. He said something about some stuff, she said. He's been kind of on me all semester. He said if I hurt his Liam baby. Does he really call me that when I'm not around? I asked scathingly. Yes, Sophia let out a choked giggle. I'm gonna kill him, I said. Anyway, continue. She took a deep breath. He said that if I hurt you, I'd have to deal with him. And I know that would really suck because then I'd lose you and I'd lose a friend. And I know Imogen is close with Jonah too, so I don't know if she'd take his side or if it would start a fight between them and in the end I'd probably end up all alone. She looked down. Like I was in the beginning when I got here. Ancestors, Jonah? I rubbed my face. Look, don't worry about him. He's just being overprotective and kind of a jerk. I'll talk to him. Please don't, she said. He's just looking out for you. I know, but he needs to keep his nose out of other people's relationships. I'm doing okay, I said. You're not, Liam. You're barely surviving, she put her head in her hands. People really need to stop worrying about me, I said. I'll get by. It's because they love you, Sophia wiped her face and stopped crying. You don't know how much I love you. I love you more than anyone else in the world. Sometimes I don't know what to do about all that love. I knew how that was because I felt the same way about her. Come here. I reached out my arms and wrapped her in them. I laid down in the grass and she curled up against my chest. I ran my fingers through her hair. She closed her eyes and calmed down when she was against me. Nothing in this world could make me stop loving you, I said quietly. Don't ever think that I've abandoned you, because I never will. She made a soft sound. I didn't know what to say to make it better, so the only way to express my feelings was to show her how I felt. I put my hand on the back of her head and tilted it up so I could kiss her. When we made out, it was usually hot and feverish, but this time I went slow. I took my time to really draw the kiss out and make it passionate. It was quiet and soft. I tried to be as gentle with her as I could and lavished desire on her lips. I attempted to make the kiss as soothing and sweet as possible. It was like our first kiss had been. I put every bit of feeling I had for her into that kiss. I love you, I said quietly. I love you too, 
she said back, a little choked up. It struck me how much she'd been dying for some attention from me, and I hadn't put in the effort to give her any, because I'd been too scared. I felt horrible. To try and make up for it, I crushed her to my body and brought her even closer so that our legs intertwined and she felt protected. I kissed her again, deeper this time, and she gave a little moan. Despite what I'd said earlier during our argument, I was pretty turned on and had been for days. Sophia pulled away. We should stop, she whispered. She went to turn the other direction and roll out of my arms, but I didn't let her. What if I don't want to, I asked. Sophia hesitated. But you, Sophia, I put a finger on her lips. We had an argument. It's okay. We're both sorry. Let's move on. I could feel her body relax. Okay. She kissed me this time. She rolled on top of me as we made out in the grass, and I tried and failed to tell my dick to be quiet. Sophia giggled and rolled off, and I ended up swinging myself on top of her. She laughed and brushed my hair back with her hands. I balanced myself on my forearms and said, Now what's been bothering you today that's got you so freaked out? Her carefree expression fell away. Oh, that. It's just something I have to do tonight for Doya. But it's not until later. I have some time. Something for Doya? That was suspicious. But I didn't ask any questions, though I was dying to. Sophia sat up and playfully pushed me off of her. I fell to the side and she glanced at the pool. A smile lit up her face. How about we go for a swim, she asked, and she got up and walked over to the edge of the pool. She slipped off her sneakers and looked at me. We don't have swimsuits, I said, perplexed. We don't need them. Sophia grinned mischievously and pulled off her shirt. She moved toward me first. I noticed she'd left the totem around her neck. She started kissing me. I don't have anything on. What are you going to do about it, water boy? Every part of me was dying to run my hands and mouth over every inch of her. Instead, I picked her up and threw her into the pool. She yelped as she flew through the air, and I laughed before I dived in after her. Both of us were submerged under the deep, cool water. I looked around. The pool was deeper than I thought. Though we could stand in places, some parts of it were submerged in darkness, and I couldn't see the stony bottom. It had to be at least thirty feet deep around the waterfall's end. Sophia popped up for air and took a deep breath. Asshole! She splashed me in the face. Don't play that game with me, I warned. You'll lose. She gave a sneaky grin and splashed me again. A shadow fell overhead, and Sophia barely had time to look up and scream before a mini tidal wave came and crashed down on her, pushing her underwater for a second time. When she came back up, she was completely soaked. That's totally unfair, she said, wiping her eyes of all the excess water. Don't come onto my turf and talk shit, I said, grinning. She spat excess water out of her mouth. Guess so. Sophia looked to the left, then said, Racy to the waterfall. She dived, and I went after her. I could have caught up with her easily, magic or no magic, but I stayed behind. I liked looking at certain assets back there. Sophia took a breath, then dived underneath the waterfall. I followed her. When she came back up on the other side, all we could hear was the roar of the waterfall in our ears, and all we could see was a small cave beneath that had been carved out to the left, a wall of crashing water behind us. It wasn't very big, just a small enclave that was forged out of rock. Wow, Sophia breathed, and her voice echoed in the cave. This is beautiful. She clung to the ledge of the cave to stay afloat. The water was deeper in here than it was in the pool. She lifted up to kiss me eagerly before she dove back down, back under the waterfall. When we came back up, Essis was waiting by the edge of the pool. He had a piece of long bark in his paws that he pointed to eagerly. Sophia laughed. You want to go surfing, buddy? Essis nodded. He put the bark on the water and climbed on top of it. 
Sophia looked at me, and I manipulated the pool so that it made little waves. Essis stood up on his hind legs and rode them easily. Sophia clapped, and I grinned. He was totally hanging ten. Be careful, Liam. He can't swim, Sophia said anxiously. He'll be fine. I've got him. When Essis was safely on the other side of the pool, where the water was shallow enough for him to walk out if he fell in, I made the water collect around me so that it rocketed me upward several feet. I did a backflip in midair and dived down into the deepest part of the pool. I thought I saw something down there, but I didn't pay enough attention to swim down and see what it was. Show off, Sophia said when I came back up. Essis gave me the hand sign to hang loose. I'm always swimming. There are pools in the Toaqua dorms. I shook the water out of my ears. The Coigny dorms have saunas. They're amazing, Sophia said, drawing out the word. Essis continued to zip around on his surfboard. Impulsively, I reached out and pulled Sophia close to me. Hmm, what's this? She asked playfully as her fingers explored my chest and abs. I just can't avoid touching you for another moment longer, I said. I put my arms around her and brought my mouth to hers. She moaned and started kissing me back. This kiss was intense and sensual. Liam, Sophia panted. I was grateful for the pause. Yeah, I was astounded at how breathless my voice was. I don't want to go through with this until I tell you something. It's important. Can it wait? I asked. Not really. She looked at me, and the moment was broken. I don't feel right doing this unless I tell you. Wow, okay. Whatever she had to say was obviously a big deal. And I had things to confess, too. This was it. I had to tell her. I, um, I actually have something to tell you, too, I started. I lifted her off me so she was no longer wrapped around my hips. We were still in each other's arms, though we were standing on the pool floor now. Sophia obviously decided to go first. Liam? A deep male voice cut her off. All right, are we going skinny dipping? It was Jonah and Imogen. Both of them appeared to be smiling and in great moods. Sassy and Squeaks were behind them. Sophia gave a shrill scream and dipped most of her body underwater so you could only see her head. I quickly used my magic to move the bubbles from the waterfall over her so she'd be covered. I was irritated as fuck. Really, guys? I asked. How'd you even find us here? We were looking for slapper tanks and just ended up wandering in. They like water, Imogen said brightly. We heard the sound of a waterfall and followed it. Cannonball! Jonah, the ass he was, had already stripped off all of his clothes. Yes, boxers too, he didn't give a fuck, and jumped in. Water went everywhere. Sophia shrieked and swam to the other side of the pool. Squeaks did a swan dive after him, as much of a swan dive as a hippogriff can do anyway. When she splashed down into the water, it caused a giant wave that made Essis go spiraling on his makeshift surfboard. Sassy stood at the edge of the water and pawed at the koi fish, trying to catch them. Essis paddled his surfboard to the shore and joined her, watching the fish swim round in circles. Jonah came up for air and swept his long hair back. Ah, nothing like a nice swim on a hot day, huh, boys and girls? I rolled my eyes. Thankfully, even though Jonah was tall, the water was high enough that it at least covered his waist. Sophia was trying to shield her gaze with her hand. Jonah, that's more of you than I ever wanted to see. We're all friends here. The human body is perfectly natural, he said back. Imogen came out of the bushes wearing a leaf bikini that she'd obviously made herself with her magic. She hopped in, then swam over to see Sophia. Imogen didn't seem bothered by Jonah's bare ass, but come to think of it, we probably all should have been used to him by now. She pointedly ignored me, though, thank the ancestors. Imogen handed Sophia another leaf bikini, and she slipped it on quickly. So, how are we all doing? Jonah asked innocently. 
Squeaks was swimming around the pool in a circle now, giving Sassy and Essis a ride. You two looked rather cozy. Yeah, until you interrupted thanks, I said bluntly. Jonah shrugged. Hey, I'm not getting any, so I don't feel like anyone else should either. He glanced at Imogen. Isn't that right, miss? I found you under the staircase with Cade. Shut up, Jonah, Imogen said, and she turned red as Sassy's fur. Sophia peered closer. Imogen, is that a hickey on your neck? Sophia asked. No, Imogen squeaked. She tried to cover up a dark bruise near her shoulder with her hand. It is, uh, Sophia squealed. Imogen pushed her into the water and the girls screamed and started splashing each other. Squeaks got excited and joined in, using her wings to create giant splashes that soaked both girls. They laughed and Sophia had to grab her bikini top so that it didn't fall off. Sassy and Essis jumped for cover to the banks of the pool. Bet you're living your fantasy, Hollyum, Jonah asked coyly. I sent a large stream of water shooting at him and it knocked him over. We swam around for a while and goofed off until it started to get dark. We got dressed and forced Jonah to close his eyes before Sophia made a campfire in the middle of the clearing for us to dry off with. I lifted my head as I started to hear chants and the beats of drums with the sunset. The Ancestors' Day ceremonies were starting. I needed to move quickly if I wanted to speak with Anna. I stood up. We should get back, guys. Ancestors' Day has begun. If we want to take part in the ceremonies and get a chance to talk to our ancestors, we better hurry. Sophia stood up, too. I'll let you guys go ahead. I forgot to take care of something. I have to turn in a last-minute project. Now? I frowned. She didn't want to see me talk to Anna and possibly get some of the answers I'd been dying for these past few weeks. It's for Doya. I won't be long, Sophia said. I'll meet you guys there. Be back in a bit. Sophia jogged off into the woods, and Essis followed. Jonah raised an eyebrow and looked at me. He was leaning against Squeaks, who squawked. Did anyone else think that was a little sketchy? I thought for a moment. That was weird. Sophia had just taken off on us. She knew tonight was important to me. She wanted to be there. She wouldn't bow out unless... Then I realized she didn't have a choice. Whatever the fire elders had asked her to do, it was tonight. I knew it was. This involved my mission. The night I'd been waiting for, the night I prayed wouldn't come, was finally here. I had to kill Sophia tonight, or I would lose the chance to get Nashoma back forever. I had to pick one of them. No, I wouldn't make a decision. I couldn't. It was impossible. I still could have both of them, I just needed to find a way to make it happen. I glanced towards the sounds that were coming far off from Kinpago. Some of the ceremonies were already starting. I could miss my chance to talk to Anna. As I saw Sophia fade behind the tree line, I made a decision. Anna would have to wait. Where are you going? Jonah asked as I headed off in the same direction. I'm following her, I said. You coming? It might be easier to convince Sophia to stop whatever she was trying to do if Jonah and Imogen were there to back me up. You're spying on her? Why? Imogen's tone was instantly accusative. Sassy's bushy tail rose defensively. It's for her own good, I promise, I said. I just want to make sure she's safe. Is she in danger? Jonah asked. I hesitated. She could be, I said, unsure. I think it has something to do with the prophecy. Imogen still looked undecided, but then she glanced at Jonah and said, All right, let's go. We headed off into the woods. We followed Sophia's tracks, then stood a ways back once we caught up with her so she wouldn't spot us. When she got back to the main path, she and Essis didn't head back to the school or Kinpago. She took another path, one that was overgrown and rarely used. The group of us struggled to get along and not be heard from behind as we trailed her through a long, overgrown path. Eventually, the trees parted, and my breath caught as I saw where Sophia was headed. The Anichi Ruins. Chapter 20 
I glanced behind myself to make sure I wasn't being followed. For a second, I thought I saw a flash of movement in the trees. But a moment later, it was gone. You're fine, I told myself. It's not like the Kawigni elders were going to follow me, right? I mean, they said I had to do this alone. The forest thickened the farther I walked. Soon, large mounds the size of small houses came into view. Upon closer inspection, I realized they were old huts where the Anachi tribe used to live. They were covered in vines and moss. The forest had claimed what had since been forgotten. Almost there, my heart hammered. Eventually, the trees thinned, and I came face to face with a large stone structure. I had finally arrived. My palms grew clammy as I tilted my head back to take in the temple towering above me. Essis craned his neck and whistled. It took my breath away. Made entirely of stone, the temple was larger than any building I'd seen in all of Kinpago. It took up my entire vision. I couldn't see all the twists and turns to the building through the forest. It was shaped like a pyramid, and ended in a flat open room at the top, the summoning room, where I had to perform the ceremony. I could see the stone pillars outlining the room from here. The temple reminded me of the Mayan ruins I'd seen in pictures, but it had been all but eaten by the forest. It was as if one could walk straight up to the ancestors, though I knew I couldn't get to the summoning room from the outside. Finally, forcing air to return to my lungs, I took a shaky breath and stepped forward. Damp moss squished beneath my shoes, and broken bits of stone wobbled under me. Essis and I stopped beside a large gorge that surrounded the entire temple like a moat. It was at least fifty feet across, and was dug so deep into the earth that when I peered over the side, I couldn't see the bottom through the darkness. I took a deep breath and set Essis down at my feet. I slipped my bag off my shoulder and pulled out a flashlight, then clicked it on and shone it across the gorge. My light caught a large, open doorway set into the high stone wall. I swept my light across the gorge. Between myself and the door stood a raised drawbridge on the other side. There was a lever beside it that would allow me safe passage back out of the temple when I finished the ceremony. Dotted all around the gorge were various small platforms, not much bigger than a stovetop. They led toward the drawbridge like stepping stones, but the first two had crumbled away. The rest towered high above the bottom of the pit in uneven rows. There wasn't any way to get to them across this distance. My knees shook. I don't want to do this, I whispered to Essis. He turned his big blue eyes up at me and dropped his ears. I knew exactly what he'd say to me if he could. You don't have to. The Kuigni elder's threat returned to my mind. If you don't do this, your friends and your family will suffer. I have to, I told him, before taking another deep breath. I glanced around, looking for possible ways across the gorge. There was a thick log nearby, but it'd be far too heavy for me to move, and it wasn't long enough to reach across anyway. Maybe there was a way down into the gorge and back up again? I pointed my light over the edge and gazed downward. What I saw made my skin crawl. The walls of the gorge were made entirely of flat stone and plummeted straight down another fifty feet. At the bottom, a dark black sludge twisted and turned. At first I thought that maybe the temple had been built upon a tar pit, until I realized that the large black spots were moving across the walls and the floor independently of one another. Each huge spot was attached to eight legs. Spiders! I shuddered. These weren't just any normal spiders, either. They were bigger than my head, just like Madame Chavis' familiar. I'd remembered how much that thing had unsettled me when I'd met with the Coigny elders. I wasn't about to go crawling into a pit of thousands of its cousins. Finding a way down and back up again was out of the question. Those suckers would eat me alive. We have to find a way across, I told Essis. Doya said the temple would test my bravery. 
I guess she wasn't kidding. Essis looked up at me with frightened eyes. He puffed his chest out proudly and pointed to himself. No, I stated sternly, crouching to his level. I'm not letting you do this for me. I'll find a way. Essis dropped his shoulders. Just stay here. I'll drop the bridge so you can get across. Essis stomped his tiny little foot, but I was already on my feet again, surveying my options. Joya had told me about the first task. She'd said it would be very physical. But what she didn't know was that the first two platforms I needed to get across no longer existed. I glanced upward and tried to think back to my senior year of high school physics, to recall everything I knew about pendulums, force, gravity, all of it. Eyeing the trees and vines overtaking the landscape, I came up with a plan. It wasn't a good plan by any means, but it was my only option. There was no way directly across, but I saw a way to get to the platforms, where I could hop from one to the other until I reached the other side. Don't question it, I told myself. But I did, and I hesitated as my eyes locked on a vine twisted high above on a tall tree overhanging the gorge. My whole body came alive with nerves, and my hands shook at my sides. Essis stepped forward and placed a paw on my ankle. His ears turned down as he looked up at me, like he knew what I was about to do and didn't want me to risk it. If I don't get in there, the elders will hurt my friends, I reminded him. I have to take this risk. Essis looked frightened, like he wasn't sure I had it in me. Heck, I wasn't sure I had it in me, but I had to at least try. Go now and don't look back. I bent and gave Essis a kiss on the top of his head, then handed him my flashlight and took off running. Essis' frightened cry followed behind me, but it was drowned out by the sound of my footsteps in the dirt. I jumped upward and caught a branch high above my head, then swung my leg out. My heel caught on the branch, and I used leverage to pull myself up. Essis followed me with the light, making it easier to see the branches in front of me. I climbed higher and higher until my arms began to ache. When I glanced down below myself, Essis was just a mere dot. My head spun being up this high, and a shot of adrenaline made every muscle in my body quiver. I held on tightly to the closest branch and took several deep breaths, trying to force myself not to focus on the height. When I glanced down again, I saw that Essis was standing at the base of the tree, He'd dropped the flashlight and was starting to climb. Essis, don't, I warned him. I knew he was a good climber, but I wasn't going to let him do this for me. He was safer right where he was. Essis hesitated, then stepped away from the tree and grabbed the flashlight again. I'm almost there, I called down to him. Up this high, the branches were beginning to thin. I grabbed onto one above my head and began to walk toward the end of the branch I stood on where I could see the thick vine I needed hanging off a nearby branch. I needed to unhook it so I could swing to the platforms. I was almost there. The branch groaned under my feet, causing me to stop in my tracks. After a moment of silence, I reached out toward the vine, but my fingers couldn't grab it. I was only mere inches away. Gripping the branch above my head once more, I inched further outward. The branch beneath my feet began to bow. Then suddenly, crack! The branch snapped off beneath me, and my stomach hurtled up into my throat as my feet fell. My fingers tightened around the branch I'd been holding, clutching it for dear life. My legs flailed, trying to find a new foothold, but failing. I heard Essis scream, and I squeezed my eyes shut tightly to keep the fear at bay. It so didn't help. Ancestors, help me, I whispered. I heard Essis scurry up the tree, but I couldn't peel my eyes open to look at him. The sound of his claws on the bark came near my head as he crawled onto the branch I clung to. Essis, I told you to stay, I snapped. I have this handled. His warm little paw touched my finger, and I finally opened my eyes. He stared down at me, looking worried. I didn't know how much longer I could hold on. I was in shape from all the hiking I did, 
but that didn't exactly help me in the upper body strength department. I glanced around for another branch to rest my feet on, but they were all out of reach. The vine I needed to get to was close, slung across a branch only a few feet away from my head, but I feared that if I reached out for it, I might fall and plummet into the gorge. What was I thinking? I chastised myself. I didn't say it out loud because I didn't want Essis to know how scared I was. Essis reached down with his little paws and tried to grab my wrist, like he had the strength to save me. The truth was, I didn't think even I had the strength to do another pull-up right now, and I was losing adrenaline by the second. It was clear I only had one option, but I was still trying to work up the courage to take the leap. That's not helping, Essis. My voice shook. He stood up straight on the branch and placed his hands on his hips as if to ask, Well, what do you want me to do then? Meet me at the bottom, I said. And then I took my chance. Taking one hand off the branch, I reached out toward the vine. My fingers just barely brushed it, and I missed. My heart leapt in my chest, and I thought this was it, that I was falling. But a second later, I was still hanging on to the branch with one hand. Putting my other hand back in place, I hung there and took deep breaths, letting the last shot of adrenaline run its course. But my fingers were beginning to slip, and I was losing so much strength that if I held on much longer, I wouldn't have enough strength to hold the vine. One shot, I told myself. I only have one more shot. I couldn't waste it or it was down into the deep, spidery gorge for me. Essis, I whispered. He gave a mournful sigh back to me. If this doesn't work, I couldn't finish my sentence. Essis opened his mouth to make a noise, but I was already moving, swinging my body to build up momentum. Then I launched myself forward. My stomach bottomed out as I flew through the air. It was like speeding down the highest point of a roller coaster, only a hundred times worse because I wasn't strapped to anything and had no idea if I'd make it or not. My fingers curled around the thick vine, and I clung on as tight as I could. The vine pulled to a stop for just a second before my weight took the tree branch with us, snapping it off at the end. A high-pitched scream cut through the air, and it took me a second to realize it was my own. Wind rushed through my hair as I plummeted down and down and down, and then started to swing up again. A sense of pride and victory swept through me as I saw the platform come closer. I pointed my toes, readying them for the impact. My feet just barely touched the top of the platform. I realized a second too late that I'd grabbed about a foot too high on the vine. My chance to jump off the vine and land safely on the platform was there and gone before I knew it. I began swinging in the opposite direction. No, I cried as the platform fell away from me. High up in the treetops, Essis squealed loudly. The vine slowed as it reached its peak in the other direction. I could already tell that I'd lost my momentum to make it to the platform. Without an extra boost, I'd end up hanging there over the gorge. Luckily, the swing brought me back in the direction of the tree I'd climbed. As I swung my feet toward a lower branch, I extended my legs and braced myself for impact. My knees bent as my feet connected with the branch at the peak of the swing. Then, I kicked off with all my strength, sending me spinning back in the direction of the platforms. My pulse thundered in my ears as I lost control, I knew this was my last chance, so I didn't give myself the opportunity to hesitate. Keeping my eye on the incoming platform, I let my instinct guide me. Shit! I cried as I let go of the vine. My breath suspended in my lungs, and my body flew through the air. My feet slammed into the rocky surface, but my body kept moving. My legs flew out from under me and I reached my hands out, clawing through the air for a handhold. I came to a halt, with my feet dangling over the gorge, and my fingers curled around the rock above me. I had just enough adrenaline left 
that I managed to pull myself up. I sat on the towering platform, taking long, deep breaths, then looked up at Essis in the trees. He was scurrying down the trunk to get to me as fast as he could. I did it, Essis, I cried. He clapped and cheered as he bounded through the dirt toward the edge of the gorge. Finally, my heart began to slow. I couldn't believe I'd done it. For a moment there, I'd thought for sure I was a goner. And then, a creaking sound below me met my ears, and my heart went hammering against my ribcage again. I shot to my feet, just in time to feel the platform teetering beneath me. Without thinking about it too hard, I set my sights on the next platform several feet away and jumped. The sound of tumbling rock followed. I landed safely on the second platform, then glanced down into the deep gorge below. The platform I'd just been standing on had snapped from its base and landed at the bottom of the pit with an echoing crash. Suddenly, the dark shadows below began to move at an alarming rate. The falling rock had seriously pissed the spiders off. As if they were one being, the dark shadows began to grow upward, covering the walls of the gorge and the tall columns the platforms were suspended on. When Essis shined the flashlight downward, I caught a glimpse of the spider's jaws snapping in my direction. There was no time to waste. I threw myself over the gorge again, soaring through the air until I landed on the next platform. Only a few more to go. One, two... My feet landed on the last platform before the temple entrance, and I felt the rock move out from beneath me. Not a second too soon, I jumped forward before I could be taken down with it. The stone fell out from beneath my feet and tumbled toward the bottom of the pit. My heart leapt up into my throat, and Essa's scream echoed across the gorge as I realized I was short of my target. I threw my hands out in front of me, and my fingers just barely caught the edge of the gorge. Breathing heavily, I tried to pull myself up, but failed. Essis cried out from behind me, getting my attention. I followed the light he pointed below me to see that the giant spiders were headed straight toward me. Panic whipped through me as the first spider reached my shoe. I felt its long, hairy leg brush up against my ankle. It snapped its large, terrifying jaws at me like it was about to bite my foot clean off. Mother fa! I grunted as I pulled back my foot and slammed my shoe into its face. The spider went spiraling downward, taking several others with it. By now, there were hundreds more only a few feet away. Digging my toes into the side of the wall, I groaned as I pulled myself upward with every ounce of energy I had left in me. To my surprise, I pulled myself up high enough that I was able to hook my elbow on the ground and drag myself the rest of the way. As soon as I was on solid ground again, I leapt to my feet and whirled around, just in time to see dozens of spider legs poking up out of the gorge. Then came the eyes. The endless eyes! I scurried backward, but the spiders only followed, pursuing me like I was an endless buffet table and they hadn't eaten in decades. Thinking quickly, I pointed my palms toward the ground at them. Flames came shooting out at my command. The spiders backed away momentarily, but they snapped their jaws at me again as soon as the flames died out. What the hell? I exclaimed aloud. Why weren't they hurt? I shot flames out of my palms again, aiming at the closest group. This time it wasn't a warning. The flames coated their hairy backs, and I thought for sure I was having fire-roasted spider for dinner. But the fire dissipated, and the spiders moved forward again. Then the closest one opened his jaws and shot a flame of his own at me. I jumped out of the way, but I wasn't fast enough. The end of a hot blue flame caught the hem of my pants, sending the bottom of my jeans up in enchanted flames. An agonizing scream erupted out of my lungs. Fire spiders, I realized. I quickly killed the spider's flames with my powers, but a hot, burning ache spread across my leg. Normal fire wouldn't hurt me, 
But this wasn't normal fire, and these weren't normal spiders. I barely had time to process the throbbing ache in my lower leg as I turned back on the creatures. Even though my flames couldn't hurt the spiders, they still didn't seem to like them. This time, when I shot flames out of my hands, I kept them going, sustaining them like a flame torch. All around me, the spiders shied away, blinking as if I was hurting them. It's not the heat, I realized. It's the light. These were creatures of darkness. The light hurt their eyes. Finally, my breaths began to slow as I realized I'd gained the upper hand. Keeping my flames aimed at them, I began to walk forward toward the drawbridge lever. The spiders parted, letting me pass through. A sense of victory washed through me as I tugged on the lever. The drawbridge groaned as the centuries-old chains unwound. A puff of dirt rose into the air on the other side as it touched down. Come on, buddy, I called over to Essis. He grabbed my flashlight and dragged my bag behind him as he hurried across the bridge toward me. Essis shined the light into the eyes of approaching spiders, and they backed away to let him through. The rest of the group scurried down to the blackness of the pit. They had finally left us alone. I bent and held my arm out to Essis. He jumped into it as soon as he was close enough, and I squeezed him in a tight embrace, burying my nose into his soft white fur. I was still trying to recover from the adrenaline rush and couldn't quite catch my breath. See? I said to Essis as I set him down. I told you I had it covered. I swung my bag over my shoulder and turned to the temple entrance. Taking a final deep breath, I started toward it with cautious steps. Essis shined the flashlight inside the temple doorway, illuminating the damp stone walls. All I saw ahead was a long hallway that reminded me of a cave tunnel. There were holes cut out in the ceiling to provide light, but as evening settled over the ruins, they weren't much help. I entered the temple slowly, like I thought there might be another band of magical creatures waiting for my arrival, but I was only greeted by silence. Until I heard the sound of sticks breaking in the forest behind me, a few shouts and a couple of curse words. I whirled around, thinking this was another obstacle, like some sort of giant mythical creature meant to protect the temple. Then I spotted the silhouette of a hippogriff in the trees, and I knew. My teeth gritted. I couldn't believe them! I glanced to Essis, then back to the tree line. Looks like we have company. Chapter 21 I was totally smushed against my teammates for what felt like the thousandth time in my life. Jonah, move your fat ass, I said, and I elbowed him to the side. Imogen, Jonah, and I, including Squeaks and Sassy, were hiding behind a collection of ruins that we ducked behind just as Sophia had turned around. Problem was, the ruin was only big enough for one of us to hide behind, and space was even more hard to come by when one of the people you were trying to hide had a hippogriff for a familiar. You move your fat ass! I'm suffocating! Jonah whined. We were speaking in low voices, but I was pretty sure Sophia could still hear us. There isn't enough room for any of us behind this pillar, Imogen hissed. Sassy was squished against her chest, looking like roadkill. I went to say something else, but Sophia called out from the entrance of the temple. All right, guys, come on out. The three of us froze and looked at each other. What did we do? I can see Squeaks' butt. I know you're there, Sophia shouted. Ah, uh, we're not here, Jonah cried out in a high-pitched voice, trying to sound like a woman. I rolled my eyes. Game over. Squeaks stumbled. All of us went careening forward head first. We collapsed into a pile on the ground as Sophia stomped toward us. I can't believe you guys, Sophia yelled. Essis was hot on her tail. He gave a scathing look to Squeaks and Sassy, who seemed to shrug. Essa started chittering, and the noises he made sounded a lot like swear words as he shook his fist at his friends. Sassy stuck her tongue out at him, and Squeaks ruffled her feathers like she was offended. 
I tried to give Sophia a weak smile as I untangled myself from the others and got to my feet, but she totally wasn't having it because she was pissed. Us? What about you? Jonah said as he brushed himself off. Squeaks worked on fixing his hair with her beak, which had fallen out of place. You're clearly hiding something. Yeah, Sophia, Imogen said. She sounded hurt. What is all of this? Why are you trying to sneak into the Anachi Temple on Ancestors' Day? And why didn't you tell us, I added, though I had a pretty good idea. I don't have to tell you guys everything, Sophia shot back. There's some stuff I keep to myself. Um, best friends here, Jonah said, and he gestured between all of us. Whatever you're hiding is obviously a big deal. It's my business. Back off, Sophia shouted. Imogen's head went from side to side, not sure which side to take. I took the initiative. Sophia, whatever you're doing, can't it wait? I asked. It's Ancestors' Day. Come back and enjoy the celebration. You guys don't get it. If I don't do this tonight, all of you are going to die, she screamed. The breath left my lungs. Jonah grabbed at his neck like someone was choking him, but Imogen didn't hesitate. What do you mean, Sophia? The anger faded from Sophia's face. She dropped her head and sighed. It's about the prophecy. The Coigny elders contacted me at the beginning of the semester and told me on Ancestors' Day I had to go to the Anachi Temple and summon the Nadarai who made the prophecy. I have to speak to her and see what I'm supposed to do in order to fulfill it. If I don't, they're going to torture Essis and kill everyone I care about. That includes my parents, Amelia, and you guys. Imogen gasped. Jonah's eyes widened, and I said, there's more at stake than just our lives. Fulfilling the prophecy, Pawi, that's going to start a war. It'll rip the tribe in half. Liam, they were going to start with you, Sophia said, and her voice broke. Doya knows we're involved. If I fail, she'll come after you first. I couldn't live with myself if something happened to you because of me. My life isn't a precious thing to me, I said softly. Sophia, please don't do this. Sophia hesitated, and Imogen said, Why didn't you tell us about this sooner? I couldn't say anything. They swore me to secrecy. It was part of the deal, Sophia said. She turned toward the temple. I'm sorry, but I have to do this on my own. I reached out and grabbed her by the shoulder, turning her around. We're not going to let you do this alone. Never, Sophia, Imogen said. Yeah, also, if you mess it up, that means we're dead, Jonah added. I'd like some extra security. This is a bad idea in the first place, I argued. If the prophecy comes true, thousands will die. We don't know if that'll happen. There's no proof. The prophecy could mean anything, Sophia said. But if I don't do this, Liam, you will die. So will Imogen, so will Jonah. Then they'll kill my parents and Amelia before they start with Essis. That's a fact. I wanted to tell her the part of the prophecy that was about Toaqua facing its darkest hour, but I wasn't sure if it would even deter her. What are you supposed to do? Imogen asked. I have to get to the summoning room at the top of the temple and perform a ceremony. Once I have the information from the ancestor, I'm to report back. Then they'll leave me alone, Sophia said. They'd never leave her alone. I knew that much. I was supposed to stop this. That was the task my tribe had assigned to me. But I was curious. If we got to the top of the temple and Sophia performed the ceremony, we could finally get some answers. Maybe the prophecy wasn't as bad as we'd thought. At the same time, that might mean risking my chance to get Nashoma back. If I failed and Koigni became more powerful than Toakwa, the elders would never forgive me. I'd never see my wolf again. Yet this wasn't about me. This was about saving my entire race. I didn't know what to do, but I couldn't show my hand yet. I didn't have enough information, and a part of me was dying to learn exactly what the prophecy meant. How long will it take? I asked. 
If we hurried, I would still have time to speak with Anna. Sophia shrugged. There are traps inside set by Coigny, but Doya told me how to avoid everything. The walk to the top and the ceremony itself shouldn't take more than a few hours. That was plenty of time. It was a quick walk and a short ceremony. What could it hurt? Fine, but we're coming with you, I said. But, Sophia started. No buts, Jonah swung his arm around her shoulder. This is a job for the reject team. It's got us written all over it. I've always wanted to explore the Anaji Temple, Imogen said, peering up at it. I bet there's tons of amazing artifacts in there. Sophia gave a pleading look at me, and I raised my eyebrow. If you think I'm going to walk away now, you don't know me that well. Sophia sighed. She knew there was no convincing us. Okay, let's just get this over with. She looked upward. Maybe we don't have to go through the temple. The summoning room is at the top. Jonah, can you fly us up? I can try. Jonah lifted his hands and each of us rose a few inches off the ground, but we didn't get any farther. Squeaks tried flying above the temple and she reached the top, but once Sophia got onto her back for a ride, she couldn't get her hooves more than a couple feet off the ground. This isn't going to work. There's some sort of ward around it, preventing me or Squeaks from flying you there, Jonah said. I think you're supposed to go through the temple, to prove you're worthy or whatever. That's it then, I said. Come on, guys. We gotta walk. We headed inside the temple. The hallway in front of us was long and dark. Sophia tried to turn her flashlight on, but it didn't work. Dead. She threw it to the side, looking frustrated. Here. Jonah took down a few torches from the wall that looked ancient. He passed one out to each of us, and Sophia lit them. Even though the torches gave light, it was still hard to see down the hallway. As we headed forward, Jonah said, You were a total badass back there, by the way, Sophia. It was like watching Tomb Raider. Hell yeah, Imogen said. She kicked those spiders' butts. She nearly gave me a heart attack, I grumbled. We'd gotten lost in the woods and only caught up to Sophia when she'd been right in the middle of trying to Indiana Jones her way to the other side. By then, we were too far away to be of much help. Watching her jump from the tree and fall toward the platform, only to grab on at the last second had been worse than terrifying. Yeah, I suppose it would have been cool to watch if the person being chased by giant spiders and leaping from crumbling ruins hadn't been my girlfriend. Nothing was going to happen to me. I had it handled, Sophia said. Essis chittered from her shoulder and she shushed him. We hit a door. Sophia pushed it open, and the moment we stepped inside, we were hit by musty air. I held up my torch to look around and noted that we were in a very large, very empty space, although I couldn't judge how big because it was so dark. Sophia walked forward toward an isolated statue directly in front of us. It was gray, nearly twelve feet tall, and took the form of a spirit warrior holding an axe with various inscriptions and carvings around it. It was the same kind of unknown lettering that was on Sophia's totem. I recognized it as a stela, an ancient form of Anachi art. Sophia pushed down the axe on the warrior. As she did that, the room lit up. Torches that were all along the walls ignited on their own, illuminating the room. It was huge, 300 feet long and just as wide, and the ceiling reaching upward to where the summoning room was. The walls were made of limestone and were set with carvings of spirit warriors and familiars in the Anachi style. Mesoamerican architecture could be seen everywhere past the vines and ivy that overgrew the temple. Statues like the one Sophia had pressed were scattered around the room, some of which were lined with gold. The temple had been sacked by Coigny of all valuables after Anachi was overrun, but some features of the abundance and wealth Anachi had possessed still remained. Squeaks gave a low whistle while Essis clapped, impressed. This place is enchanted, Imogen said in wonder. Or cursed, Jonah added, less helpfully. Sophia took out a map from her bag and scanned it. I was less patient and started heading down the nearest hallway, but Sophia called out, 
Liam, we can't go down that way. I gritted my teeth and spun around. Why not? Remember what I said about traps? Sophia asked. There's a firewall down there. We head in that direction, you guys get burned to a crisp. Don't be in a hurry, man. This place is huge. We could get lost, Jonah said. I was in a hurry. I wanted to get this over with so I could talk to Anna, get Nashoma back, get some answers, get back to a normal life. Okay, I tried to force myself to have some patience. So which way do we go? Sophia chewed on her lip. I'm not sure. Doya marked a path, but... She looked flustered. I knew Sophia wasn't bad at maps, which meant that she was getting nervous. What would you do without us? Imogen sighed. She took the map from Sophia and looked it over before she pointed to the left. There, that way should be safe. Are you sure? I asked. Imogen gave me a scathing look. I'm not sure, but this is where Doya told Sophia to go. Good enough for me, I said. I went through a door and led the way down to the next room. The stairs went downward, though, instead of up, which confused me. Why are we going down if we need to get to the top? I asked. Different chambers lead to different places. There's only one right way to reach the summoning room, Sophia said. You have to go a certain way, otherwise you'll just end up wandering through the Anichi Temple forever. This place is a maze, I muttered. Jonah had a point about not getting lost. Doya said nobody has been inside for years. We're the first elementi to enter in probably decades, Sophia said. We reached the end of the stairs, which led to, you guessed it, another heavy-ass door. Jonah, Squeaks, and I had to ram ourselves against it in order to get it open. I looked. The room inside was completely empty and about 50 feet across. Once we finally managed to get inside, the door that had been so hard to open immediately shut behind us of its own accord. All of us jumped. Before we had time to react any further, I heard the sound of rushing water. I faced the center of the room and watched in horror as water began streaming into the room through pipes that were embedded in the ceiling. It came pouring down and within seconds was up to our ankles. What the hell is going on here? Jonah asked. This isn't right. Doya said there weren't any traps besides the ones Coigny set, Sophia shouted. The other tribes must have put booby traps in here too, to try and stop any elementi from getting through the temple that wasn't of their tribe. Imogen spoke quickly, her voice panicked. Jonah turned on the door. He started pulling on the handle, and Squeaks kicked at it quickly with her hooves, but it didn't budge. The door won't open, Jonah said in a high-pitched voice. He backed against it, looking scared at the rising water. We glanced frantically around the room, but there were no windows or exits, just a door 20 feet above us with a platform that led to it. Jonah flew himself up to the platform using his air, but no matter how hard he and Squeaks tried, magic or brute force, that door wouldn't open either. It won't budge! We're trapped in here, Jonah screamed. He could barely be heard over the sound of the water coming in. Stand back, guys. I've got this, I said. I raised my hands and forced the water back to the other side of the room and froze it there in a large ice wave. But although I could push the water back, I couldn't do anything else. I tried to freeze the pipes so no more water could get through, but the force of what was coming in made that impossible. No matter how much I froze or how much I commanded the water to stop flowing through the pipes, it wouldn't. I let cold water come splashing backwards, and it soaked our clothes. This was freaking me out. I'd never had water disobey me before. This kind of stuff came easy for me. I didn't know what to do. The water's coming into the room faster than I can control it. There's nowhere for it to go, I said. An edge of alarm entered my voice. The water was almost to our knees already. Sophia was holding up Essis, and Imogen clung to Sassy. It wouldn't take but a few minutes for the entire room to be filled with water. Once it hit the ceiling, it'd black out all the torches and we'd all drown. And I'd go last. I'd have to watch all my friends die. Get me out of here, 
Jonah lost all sense and started pounding on the door he was near, trying to get out. Squeak sensed his panic and lost it too, throwing herself against the door over and over, pounding her hooves against the stone. Imogen was shaking and holding Sassy, who was barking over and over. There was so much going on, it was hard to handle. Liam, what do we do? Sophia yelled. Essis was squeezing her for dear life, watching as the water rose higher and higher. By now, we'd all dropped our torches, and they were floating in the water. All it took was their screaming voices to put me right back in the elemental cup. My team was freaking out, and they needed someone to lead them. I had to take control of the situation. We need to figure out a way to stop the water from coming in, I said immediately. I scanned the room for clues. This was a water task. The Toakwa elders had to have put this here, which meant they'd put in a way of escape for someone who was a Toakwa. How the hell are we supposed to do that? Jonah cried. He wasn't helping. I ignored him and tried to block out the sounds of the water as I looked around. The room was completely empty. There was nothing in here we could use, except... Up near the top, just below the torches, were four large square buttons the size of my head, decorated with artwork that didn't quite fit into the rest of the temple. A portrait of a water droplet symbol. It was Toaqua, not Anichi. There! I immediately focused on hitting those buttons. I shot a water ball at one of the buttons, and once it hit, the button sank in and made a low sound, like a note coming from an organ, though it rose back out almost as fast as I had hit it. I tried another button, and when my magic hit that, the button sank and made a similar sound, though the tone was different and the pitch was higher. I tried using my water to shoot out different jets that would hit the buttons in succession, but it didn't do anything except make a lot of noise. It sounded like someone was playing a bunch of piano keys at the same time. I think we have to press them all at once, Imogen said quickly. Together, everybody use their elements to hit the buttons, I instructed. Sophia, you take the one on the left. I'll take the one on the right. Imogen, you've got the far left corner. Jonah, you've got the far right. Jonah was shaking. I hoped he could do this because if he couldn't, we were fucked. The girls pulled themselves together, holding on to a ray of hope. On the count of three, I shouted. One, two, three. We all shot at once. But although we managed to push all the buttons down at the same time and all the tones rang out together, nothing happened. The buttons returned to their original position and water kept coming in. It was getting close to my shoulders and had already risen to Imogen's neck. It didn't work, Jonah wailed. I wasn't ready to give up yet. Try it in different patterns, I suggested. I was just pulling stuff out of my ass now. The water had gotten up to six feet now, and we had to tread to stay afloat. Sassy struggled to swim, and Essis clung to the top of Sophia's head, looking nervous at the water coming in. Squeak swooped down and grabbed both of them, bringing the familiars back up to the platform with Jonah, but they'd only be safe for so long. The four of us tried a bunch of different versions of hitting the buttons at the same time, but nothing worked. Although it was nothing for me to tread water, I noticed Sophia struggling to stay afloat. This had to work. We had no backup plan. Maybe there really was no way out of here. As we were experimenting, I noticed something. The tones playing together. It sounded like the song of the tribe. Stop! I yelled, and everyone halted using their magic. We were only a few feet away from the ceiling now, almost to the platform where Jonah was. Earth, water, fire, and air, gifted to us by breath of a prayer. Singing isn't going to help us right now, Jonah screeched. Shut up! If we can match the tone of the buttons to the pitches in the song, I shouted. Yes, Liam, that's brilliant, Imogen cried back. Imogen, you're the first tone, then me, then Sophia, then Jonah, I said quickly, trying to match up the sounds in my head. I hope this worked. We were running out of space and oxygen. Sophia sputtered next to me. She was losing strength. She spat water out of her mouth and gasped before her head dipped down under water and back up again. I immediately swam to her side and grabbed her around the waist, lifting her upwards. 
I was able to keep both of us aloft in the water with my magic, but soon there wouldn't be anywhere else for us to go. In moments, we'd be able to touch the ceiling. Those pipes filtering water were only a few feet away. Come on, Soph, stay with me, I muttered in her ear. She managed to hold one arm aloft and out of the water. She struggled to conjure fire, but after a second try, a fireball blazed in her hand. We have one shot at this, guys, I yelled. Imogen, now! Imogen sent rocks from the temple floor hurtling at her button and hit her target. I used the hand that wasn't holding Sophia up to blast the button on my right. Sophia hit her button with her fireball, and after a split second of hesitation, Jonah seemed to realize this was do or die and pushed his button down with air. The sounds echoing around the room sounded exactly like the tribal song. This time, the button stayed down. The water stopped filtering in from the pipes and shut off. I heard a draining sound, and the water level dropped. We started drifting downward. Eventually, all the water filtered out of the room, leaving us soaking wet and shivering. Is everyone all right? Jonah called from the platform. Now that the threat was gone, it looked like he'd gotten himself together. Everyone was breathing really hard. I checked the girls over, then called out, Yeah, Jonah, we're fine. I dried us and the torches off, and Jonah levitated us up to the platform where he was. This time, the door opened easily. We proceeded through it, the stairs going upward this time. Nobody said much. We were still spooked from what had happened back there. I told you guys this was dangerous. I didn't want anyone coming with me, Sophia said sourly. Esses sat on her shoulder, his hair standing on end. Imogen opened her mouth to say something, but I got there first. If we hadn't gone with you, you'd probably be dead, I snapped, before I made a sarcastic noise. You think I want to be here? The last thing I wanted to do today was go through the Elemental Cup Part 2. This isn't as bad as the cup, Liam. Quit being so negative. Sophia was getting irritated with me. We'd been at each other's throats since we'd gotten in here. Easy, guys, Jonah said. We still have a lot of temple to get through. I hated that he was right. We just started making our way through this temple, and we had no idea what kind of traps lay ahead or what house they'd been placed by. The whole thing was freaking me out. What exactly was in here that the tribes didn't want anyone to discover? Chapter 22 If I thought I could do this alone, I was fooling myself. There was no way Essis and I would have made it through the Toakwa's booby trap on our own. I didn't say it, but I was grateful my friends had followed me. Even though I was dry now, I still shivered from the cold. I held Essis tightly to me and walked beside Liam, holding my torch with my other hand. I was close enough that I could feel the heat coming off him. I wanted to reach out and touch him just to show how grateful I was he saved us back there but my hands were full. When we reached the top of the stairs, we found ourselves in a long hallway lined with empty torch holders. I'd relit them so we could see that the hall came to an abrupt halt 20 yards ahead of us. Dead end, Jonah said, stating the obvious. Maybe we missed something back in the chamber. Jonah turned to start back the way we came, but Imogen placed a hand to his chest to stop him. We didn't miss anything. It's another obstacle. Imogen started forward until she stopped just a foot away from the wall at the end of the hall. It was covered in 24 stone tiles, each at least four inches wide and set into a square. There would have been 25, but one was missing in the top right-hand corner. Each tile had a different pattern cut out on it, but they didn't match up. It was as if someone had placed them into the wall at random instead of in the pattern they were intended. Imogen reached out and touched the tiles, running her fingers over the designs. Sassy stood on her hind legs and sniffed them. What is it? Liam asked. It looks like someone glued the tiles on wrong. Imogen shook her head without taking her eyes off the wall. The way she looked at it made me think she knew exactly what this was, like it wasn't a mistake at all, but intentional. That's when it hit me. It's a puzzle, isn't it? I asked. 
Imogen nodded. That's exactly what it is. This must be an Avita obstacle. Jonas stepped forward and studied the puzzle, but the furrow in his brow told me he didn't have a clue what he was looking at. You think so? Navita value knowledge, Imogen said. We read books and do riddles. It's our thing. I think we have to solve this puzzle to get through. But there's a tile missing, Jonah pointed out. We'll never solve it. It's supposed to be missing, Imogen told him. Okay, then. Sounds easy enough. Jonah grabbed one of the tiles and tried to pry it out of the wall. It didn't budge. Not like that, you dummy, Imogen swatted at him. You have to slide the tiles to complete the picture. Jonah frowned and stepped aside. Well, that's dumb. We all know I won't be any help. Imogen tapped her finger to her chin. It just... it can't be this easy. What do you mean? Liam asked. This puzzle looks complicated. The last obstacle could have killed us. We could have drowned. This is just... too safe. Well, Navita aren't known for being cruel, I pointed out. I guess you're right, Imogen agreed. You all can just chill for a couple of minutes. This shouldn't take me long. Imogen reached for the top tile and slid it over into the empty space. Suddenly, grinding noises from all around us filled the air, and then came a heavy, resounding thud. We all whirled around at the same time to see that a stone doorway at the top of the stairs had fallen from the ceiling, blocking our way back. Twelve compartments within the door had opened, revealing long, narrow sticks with holes straight through them like straws. My heart leapt to my throat, and I squeezed Essis closer to my chest. Jonah jumped behind Squeaks and ducked down. What the hell is that? Uh-oh. Imogen's eyes widened. Uh-oh what? Liam demanded. What are those things? If I had to wager a guess, I'd say poison dart throwers. Imogen sounded pretty sure of herself. They're very ancient Hawkeye weapons, from before they settled in this area. I finally tore my gaze off the darts and looked to Imogen. How much time do we have? Just as I asked it, I noticed a small door only a few inches high had opened just above the puzzle tiles. Inside was a compartment no bigger than a safe, where an ancient-looking hourglass stood. Sand rushed through it, counting down the seconds we had left. Imogen glanced up to the hourglass. Ten minutes, I'd say. Liam leapt straight back into captain mode. Get to work, Im. Jonah, let's see what we can do about disabling these darts. Liam started down the hall, but Imogen stopped him. I wouldn't do that if I were you. Why not? He asked. Imogen had already placed her torch in one of the empty holders next to her and was moving tiles around the puzzle. She didn't look back at him when she spoke. Navita's the smartest house. We anticipate alternatives. They probably set up second booby traps that'll go off if you try to tamper with the darts. Liam huffed. Maybe we can all lie down, Jonah suggested. He made a wide, sweeping motion with his hands. We'll all just lie flat so that when the darts come at us, they'll just fly over our bodies. Look at how spread out those things are, I said. Essis and Sassy are the only ones small enough to avoid them. You and Squeaks will be hit no matter where you stand. I'll lie down like this. Jonah shoved his torch into Liam's hands and lowered himself to the floor. He pointed his toes and fingers like he was mimicking a plank. And you'd be poisoned, Liam assured him. Jonah glanced to the dart throwers. No, they'd just whiz right over me. Zip. He waved his hand quickly over his nose to demonstrate. Dude, Liam pressed. There's a dart thrower pointed directly at your junk. Huh? Jonah took a second to process what Liam said, then quickly threw his hands protectively over his package and jumped to his feet. Relax, I said nervously. Imogen will figure it out, won't you, Em? Imogen bit her lower lip, concentrating hard as she slid tile after tile across the puzzle surface. Sorry, kind of busy. See, I said hesitantly. 
She's got this. I hoped. The following eight minutes were agonizing. I sat next to Squeaks on the ground, who had curled up to wait patiently. The only sound I heard was the tiles sliding against one another, and my own pulse in my ears. I'd placed my torch in the holder above me, and stroked Essis while I watched the sand in the bottom half of the hourglass slowly rise. We were running out of time, and judging by the image starting to form in the puzzle, Imogen was only half done. Liam paced back and forth in front of me. Come on, Imogen. We only have a minute and a half left, if that. Don't rush me, she shot back. Okay, I give in, Jonah said with a sigh. Squeaks and I will create a barrier. You can all hide behind us. We'll take the darts for you guys. Jonah, no! Imogen turned from the puzzle for a moment to shoot him a dirty look. Come on, it's the only way, Jonah said. Squeaks and I are too big for anyone to help us. The rest of you need to find a way out of here. Imogen turned back to the puzzle. I still have a minute left. You are not giving up on me just yet. Yeah, Jonah said. We have a minute to prepare. Sophia, you stay right where you are. Liam, go snuggle up close. No, I shot to my feet. No one's sacrificing themselves. Imogen will figure it out. I glanced up to the hourglass. It was draining so fast that sweat began to break out across my brow. Im, do you need help? No, I've got this, she replied, without looking up from the tiles. She moved three of them, only to move them back to their original position a moment later. Im, Liam cried. You have less than 30 seconds left. If you don't get this, we'll all be- Stop rushing me, Imogen shouted. Another tile slid into place, and I realized what image she was forming. It was a sapling with two leaves, a symbol of the Navita house. But there were still four tiles in the wrong spots and only seconds left. My heart hammered, and I leaned into Liam. He draped an arm around me and pulled me and Essis close to his chest. I buried my face between them. I couldn't watch. It's not your fault, Im. I told her. You didn't know. Shh, she hissed, hushing me. I dared to steal another glance up at the hourglass. Essis looked too, and he seemed just as frightened as I was. His ears pressed back, and he clung to me tightly. Ten. Nine. Eight. Liam took my shoulders and positioned me in front of him. He tried to be subtle about it, but I knew exactly what he was doing. He was acting as my shield. I tried to step out of the way. I couldn't let him do it. But he held me in place so I couldn't budge. The sand was so close to the end now. Every muscle in my body tensed. I sucked in a deep breath and held it. Five. Four. Three. Two. Imogen quickly arranged the final three tiles. Done! A second later... A series of loud clicks sounded all over the room. The door on the hourglass compartment slammed shut, and the dart throwers retracted back into the entrance on the other end of the room. The door raised back into the ceiling, opening the hall back to the stairs. In front of us, the wall with the puzzle slid aside to reveal a dark room ahead. I let out a sigh of relief as my heart slowed. Im, you did it! I rushed forward and pulled her into a hug. I told you I would! She squeezed me back. Essis was squashed between us. Jonah threw his arms around us, picked us both up in his arms, and spun us around. Thanks, the ancestors! Imogen laughed as he set us down, then gestured to Liam to join us. Liam sighed, but stepped forward and joined in on the group hug. Shall we? Imogen asked once we parted. The four of us grabbed our torches and stepped inside the next room with our familiars at our sides. The room wasn't very big, about the size of a large bedroom, but it had three wide passageways splitting off in each direction. All around us, the room was overgrown with vines and roots growing in from little cracks all throughout the walls. Rocks of various sizes were piled neatly in the corners, 
like the Navita who'd set up the last booby trap had left them behind to show they'd been here. Which way? Liam asked. I dug inside my bag and showed Imogen the map Doya had given me. She studied it for a moment, then said, It looks like we need to take this tunnel on the right. Before any of us could move, the sound of footsteps padding lightly across the floor met our ears. I shined my light toward the tunnel in front of us. For a second, time stood still as I held my breath, staring at the strange creature that stepped out of the shadows. It wasn't much bigger than Sassy, but it was terrifying. It had a lizard-like body with black and red stripes across its scales. Sharp, bony spikes grew several inches out of its elbows and spine, trailing all the way down its tail. A pointed barb stuck out of the end of its tail, like it was some sort of giant, mutated lizard scorpion. It gazed at us with haunting, midnight black eyes. Shit! Imogen screamed. Nobody hesitated. We all took Imogen's cue and ran, sprinting down the hall she'd pointed to. My heart pounded a million beats per minute, and Liam breathed heavily beside me. I dared to steal a glance over my shoulder and saw that the lizard scorpion was pursuing us quickly. He was only several feet behind Squeak's hooves. Everybody turn your lights out, Imogen shouted. But we won't be able to, Jonah started. Just do it, she cried. Jonah sent a strong gust of wind through the tunnel, and our torches flickered out. But we didn't slow down. Pitch blackness enveloped us, and my panic went into overdrive. I wasn't afraid of the dark, per se, but I was so not prepared to race through unfamiliar ruins without all five of my senses. We could run into a pit or something and fall to our deaths. My arms shook, and my breaths became shallow as my legs moved quickly beneath me. Imogen, why are we- Ugh! Liam's body slammed into something hard, giving me a warning a second before I ran into the same wall. Imogen screamed from beside me as she too ran into it. All at once, Jonah grunted, the same time Squeak's feathers rustled. Imogen screamed, and Sassy let out a bark. Torches clattered to the ground. I stumbled backward, feeling the impact across the whole front of my body. I had to rely only on sound to make sense of my surroundings. On my left, Imogen and Jonah groaned from the ground. On the right, the legs of Liam's jeans brushed against each other, and it sounded like he was getting to his feet. He grumbled and let out a few curse words under his breath. Get off me, Imogen said, followed by the sound of her slapping Jonah in the leg. I'm trying, he shot back. Squeak's big butt is in the way. Squeak's squawked. Then came the sound of her heavy hooves against the stone floor. Based on the way their voices echoed off the walls, I had to guess we'd entered a room not much bigger than the last. Can I use my light now? I asked Imogen urgently. Just a flash, she warned. In case it's still following us. Essis climbed onto my shoulder and settled himself on top of my backpack. I held my palm out and shot a high flame into the air for a second before it disappeared. All I saw was a wide doorway leading out into the hall, and the lizard scorpion standing in front of it, with its eyes on us like it was ready to pounce. My entire body tensed. Gathering my magic again, I shot a fireball across the space between us. Flames whizzed through the air, but the lizard was already on the move. I missed him by a long shot. Don't let him touch you, Imogen cried. I took a step back until I was pressed up against the wall. Liam did the same beside me. What is it? He demanded of her. I shot another fireball across the room, but the lizard was three feet ahead of my aim by now. I threw another three in rapid succession, trying to stay ahead of it, but it was like it could anticipate my moves and darted in the other direction. Stop it, Sophia, Imogen insisted. I didn't listen and threw another fireball. The lizard was only ten feet or so from us now, and that was far too close for comfort. At least the fireballs distracted him enough to hold him off for a bit. Imogen, it's freaking me out. 
Jonah, try to immobilize it, Liam instructed. Jonah took a deep breath, and a breeze passed through the room. The sound of scurrying feet zigzagged across the floor. I couldn't tell where the thing was. I can't find him, Jonah cried. There's not enough water in the air, Liam said. I can't do anything. Im? Shh, hold on, she said. Everything went silent, apart from the sound of Squeak's tail brushing against the wall behind her. The scurrying of feet had stopped. I couldn't hear the lizard at all. Did it work, Jonah? I whispered. I didn't do anything, he replied in a low voice. Do you think we scared it away? I asked. I hope so, Jonah said. What was that thing? A hunpudskin, Imogen answered. Hump what? Jonah asked. Hunpudskin, Imogen replied. A Mayan beaded lizard? She was only met by silence. Seriously, do you guys read? They're so lethal that if they touch you, you'll die within minutes. Then what are we doing sitting here in the dark? Liam snapped. Hunpits can target your shadows, Imogen explained. If they bite or sting your shadow, you'll get a headache so bad that you'll kill yourself just to make it stop. That sounds better than instant death, Jonah bellowed. True, Imogen admitted. Let's get some light, Sophia, Liam said. Maybe it's gone. Holding out my palm, I used my fire to light the room. For the first time, I had a chance to look around. The room was small, but all along the walls on either side of us were displays carved out in the stone, where statues of various familiars stood. The rest of the room was empty. Wow, Imogen said breathlessly, taking in all the statues. This must have been the familiar healing chambers. It's a very sacred room. Cool, Jonah said flatly. Can we maybe focus less on the statues and more on keeping our eyes peeled for the humpty thing? The rest of us scanned the room, and I finally relaxed when I saw no sign of the hunpit skin. Can they really sting your shadow? I asked skeptically. That sounds- Imogen, look out! Liam shouted. All eyes darted to the ceiling to follow his gaze. The hunpit skin was hanging there like a gecko. Its eyes locked on Imogen's head and it took aim. Everything happened so fast that I could hardly process it. Liam jumped forward to knock Imogen out of the way, and then a stark white blur flew through the air to intercept the lizard. Sassy's bark echoed around us. My flame died out for a second before I lit my palm again. I gasped, and Essis chirped from my shoulder like he was pleased. Sassy's bright red fur was nowhere to be seen. Instead, a pure white fox with nine tails stood in front of us, baring its teeth at the hunpit skin. Golden streaks ran through her vibrant fur, and ivy vines wound around her body. Her body glowed with a strange white light that lit up the chamber. She was bigger than Sassy had been, nearly the size of a wolf instead of a fox. Liam and Imogen laid on the floor. After a moment of disorientation, Imogen lifted her gaze and propped herself up on her elbows. She drew in a sharp breath, and her jaw dropped like she couldn't believe what she was seeing. None of us could. Sassy? Imogen asked. Sassy, or the white, nine-tailed fox that was Sassy, didn't respond. She was too focused on the hunpit skin, who cowered in fear of her. Sassy advanced forward, and the lizard creature stepped back. When Sassy barked, the sound was high-pitched and clear, echoing with magic. The hunpitskin flinched, but it didn't move apart from the eyes. Its gaze darted toward Imogen, and Sassy lost it. Her nine tails stood straight up, and her fur fluffed all around her, making her look almost twice her size. The vines around her body grew, curling out toward the hunpit skin until, whip! Vines thrashed through the air, zipping toward the hunpit skin like a collection of angry tentacles. They moved so fast that I barely saw them touch the creature. Whip marks marred his scales, 
and blood oozed out of the wounds. It inched away with every whip, but tried to jump back at her a second later. It didn't get far before she whipped it again and it was forced to retreat. I could barely believe what I was seeing. Sassy growled, and bricks that had fallen out of the side of the temple that were lying disregarded on the floor rolled together until they had formed one giant mass of earth tumbling toward the hunpudskin at high speed. The reptile had to jump out of the way to avoid getting hit. When the hunpudskin managed to leap away from every boulder, Sassy took a deep breath and screamed at the creature. The vibrations from her loud voice were so powerful, they sent the reptile flying backward. That's my girl, Sassy, Imogen cheered. At the sound of Imogen's voice, Sassy whipped harder and faster until the hunted skin gave up and raced out of the room into the dark hall. Sassy chased after it, yipping as she whipped the creature with her ivy vines. Sassy, come back, Imogen cried, scurrying to her feet and going after her. Jonah caught Imogen by the arm before she could get out of the room. That thing is dangerous. You said so yourself. Exactly, Imogen stated. Sassy could get hurt. Imogen tore her arm from Jonah's grip, then started for the door. But before she could disappear into the shadows, Sassy came back. She was back in her usual form, a regular red fox with only one tail, and she was dragging the hunpudskin by its tail across the floor. Its rosy pink belly was on display, and its eyes stared upward lifelessly. A trail of blood followed behind it. Sassy dropped the creature at Imogen's feet, and then sat, staring up at her proudly. Sassy, you were amazing, Imogen praised. Is she okay? I asked, concerned. If what Imogen said about the creature was true, Sassy might have been poisoned. Imogen took a knee and ran her hand through Sassy's fur. She looks fine. She must be immune to their poison. What happened to her? Liam asked curiously. He still sat on the ground, with one knee up and an elbow rested on it, trying to catch his breath. Imogen scooped Sassy up in her arms and stood. Isn't it obvious? The three of us stared back at her blankly. Imogen shot us all a broad smile. Guys, Sassy's a kitsune. A kitsune? I repeated. Yes, they're clever, powerful foxes with nine tails, Imogen explained. They were mentioned in Chapter 9, Page 2 of our Ancient Familiars textbook. Don't you remember? No, because we weren't assigned that chapter. I ignored the question and instead asked, How long have you known? I didn't, Imogen replied joyfully. I had no idea until now, but this is great news. Jonah reached out to scratch Sassy under the chin. She relaxed under his touch. That could have been helpful during the tournament, girl. Why didn't you tell us you had powers? Sassy just curled into his fingers like she was enjoying the massage. Essis jumped from my shoulder and into Imogen's arms, right on top of Sassy's belly. He threw his tiny little arms around her and gave her a hug. Squeaks came up to both of them and shoved the crown of her head into Sassy's fur to show her affection. It was sweet. I glanced to the dead Hunpudskin. Well, it looks like we're safe now, all thanks to Sassy. Should we light our torches and get moving? Liam took a deep breath, picked his torch up off the ground and stood. Might as well get this over with. I lit his torch, then mine. Hopefully that's it for booby traps. Jonah scoffed as he picked up his torch and held it out to me. Sweetheart, if there's one thing I know about you, Pluma, it's that we never miss a party. Hold on to your hats, boys and girls. I'll bet anything air is up next. Chapter 23 With another look at the map, it seemed like we were three-fourths of the way through the temple, we only had one more room to get through before we reached the summoning room at the top. After everything we'd been through already, I was not looking forward to getting through the next room. Guys, I think it's time we turned around, I said as we made our way down yet another hallway. We've almost died three times now. Don't you think we've had enough? You can go back if you want, Sophia said. I'm not quitting. Like hell, 
I shook my head and jogged to catch up with Sophia. There must be another way. We can convince the Coigny elders that you did the ceremony, make up some shit. We can buy ourselves some time. There is no other way. Sophia was set on it. Her eyes were fixed forward, straight ahead like she was on a mission. On her shoulder, Essis looked similarly serious. I think we should keep Sassy's real identity a secret, Imogen announced. She stooped down to pet her fox as we walked. At least for now, until we have to show our hand. I nodded. Right. Kitsunes were super rare. I'd never seen anyone have a familiar like Sassy before. Imogen would become a target if people knew Sassy wasn't just a normal vixen. But I didn't like the way Im was talking either. She was making it sound like we had to be careful. But of course, we were in deep water. We were associated with Sophia, and the elders all knew it. There was no turning back now. We were in this together, and from this moment on, we'd have to watch our backs. We got to another door. Everyone stopped in front of it and looked at it. It had the Yapluma house symbol on it, though you wouldn't notice it if you weren't actively looking for it, which we were now. The symbol was so small you had to squint to see it in the door's design. Nobody wanted to be brave enough to push it open. Well, I crossed my arms. Who's going to take the bait? I'll do it, Jonah offered. It's probably a Yapluma trap. I bet the task is to drink a fifth of vodka or something in five minutes. Squeakers and I got you. Squeak squawked in agreement and clacked her beak at the thought of chugging alcohol. Jonah pushed open the door and we followed behind him. We entered onto a balcony with steps leading to the room below. The room was about 120 yards wide and filled with a maze with high stone walls that ended at the balcony's height. In the middle of the maze was a square open section, he had to go through the maze to get to the other side, where stairs wound up to the second level and to the next door. Beside the maze, the room was entirely empty. I wasn't sure what I was expecting, but this wasn't it. It seemed too simple, and too complicated to be made by a Yapluma, no offense. I have an idea, Jonas said. Squeaks, try flying across. Squeaks pumped her wings and attempted flying over the maze, she made it halfway before she collided with something invisible and went tumbling down into its walls, disappearing from view. Squeaks! Jonah shouted. He took off running down the stairs, rushing into the maze. Jonah, stop! I yelled. We sprinted down after him, but when we entered the maze, we found that the path split into three different directions instead of one. Which way did he go? Sophia asked, frightened. Sassy stuck her nose to the floor. She sniffed a few times before she jumped up and down and yipped, catching the scent. Good girl, lead the way, Sassy, Imogen said. Sassy darted ahead. We followed her, but the maze was confusing. It went around in circles, and the walls were covered with a reflective surface that looked like mirrors. I slammed into them a few times, thinking I was going the right way when I wasn't. Imogen and Sophia had the same problem. Imogen slammed head first into a wall, and I managed to grab Sophia at the last minute before she went down the wrong way and got separated from us. Essis had jumped down from her shoulder and was spinning in place, looking dizzy. This way, guys, Imogen said. She pointed in the direction Sassy was heading. I caught my breath and looked at her. In the next second, Imogen had literally vanished from the spot. Sophia screamed and jumped, clinging on to me. I was stunned. Imogen had just up and disappeared. Then, in a different spot from where Imogen originally had been, she reappeared. She stumbled as she came into view again. Sassy gave a bark of alarm, and Sophia yelped. She was squeezing the life out of my insides. I didn't do that, Imogen said. Her face went white. We didn't have any time to talk about it, because in that moment, Sophia and I vanished too. We were standing on the right side of the hallway of the maze one second, then we reappeared on the left side. Essis jumped three feet into the air in terror, and Imogen backed up against the maze wall, pressing herself into it and looking horrified. It didn't hurt, but it had been fucking freaky. 
You were just there, Imogen peeped. She pointed to the spot we'd been at. Now you're there, she pointed back at us. This place was fucking with our heads. How were we going to find Jonah in here? Girls, hold hands, I commanded. It's too easy to get lost in here. I grabbed onto Sophia's hand and she took Imogen's. Essis jumped down and hung on to Sassy's tail. We made a chain as we wound our way through the maze, looking for Jonah. At least if the three of us vanished again, we'd all end up together. I don't like this, Imogen commented. If there was one hunped skin, there's another. They probably breed down here. Great, I said. That's all we needed. Sassy yipped again, and she darted down a zigzagging hallway, dragging Essis behind her. We followed her, and to my relief, we found Jonah sitting in the large open area in the middle of the maze, kneeling by squeaks. She was lying down and swinging her head around, dazed. Jonah, Sophia cried, and she ran to him. Is Squeaks okay? Imogen asked, immediately concerned. Sassy started licking Squeaks' feathers, and Squeaks cooed. She's okay, Jonah said, and he rubbed her head. Just a little stunned. Jonah, you know better than to run off, I snapped at him. Now that I knew he was okay, I was pretty pissed. You know the rules. Don't get separated from the group. I'm okay, Mom, Jonah said. Jeez, want to check my homework next? Shut up, I barked at him. He'd call me that during the tournament, too. Sophia snickered. You are kind of a mom. I am not, I shouted. Liam, you're such a mom, Imogen said, and she started laughing. You worry all the time. You make sure everyone's taken care of. You're always nagging us. Ancestors, Jonah fell over against Squeaks. It's so fucking true. Sophia, Imogen, and Jonah lost it. They roared with laughter, and the sound echoed around the chamber. Even the familiars joined in. Essis pointed his finger at me and laughed. I narrowed my eyes at them and thought they were being childish. Oh, shit. Maybe I was a mom. Fuck them. Ha ha, I said dryly. Can we get going? The laughter died down, but they were all still wearing silly grins on their faces. Squeaks got to her feet and shook her head, looking chipper as always. I headed toward what looked like an exit, but before I got there, a door on either side of the opening slammed shut. Behind us, similar doors appeared, preventing us from going back the way we came. We were closed off. There was no exit. Ah, oh, fuck. Every time this had happened before, it was a real sign shit was about to go down. What's going on? Jonah said. He stood up and turned in a circle. Squeaks copied him, her cheerful demeanor gone to be replaced by hesitation. Before we had time to figure out what was happening, four different walls making four different rooms sprung up from out of nowhere and separated us, appearing by magic. The walls were made of glass so we could see each other, and they opened at the top so we could still hear each other. But no matter how hard we pounded against the glass, we couldn't escape. The walls started moving inward on us. I pressed against them, trying to hold them back, but it didn't work. There wasn't enough water down here in this temple for me to use, and I couldn't climb out as the walls were too slippery. Next to me, Sophia tried melting the glass with her fire, but it didn't work. Imogen was trying to use the stone floor to put a barricade up against the glass, but that was futile as well. Even Sassy had taken her kitsune form and was whipping out her vines to try and break the glass, but her lashes didn't make a scratch. Jonah, fly out, I yelled to him. I can't, he shouted. He tried pushing upward, but an invisible force, much like the one Squeaks ran into, prevented him from going any higher. We're going to be crushed, Sophia screamed. She clawed at the glass. Essis dug his tiny nails into the glass, scratching at it frantically. This was it. We were going to be pulverized. I'd pick almost any way to go but this. Jonah looked wildly around before his eyes cleared with a moment of realization. Guys, I think I know how to stop this. We'd like to know today, thanks, I yelled. I didn't like the panic in my own voice. 
I didn't sound like that often, not even during the tournament. I didn't know what to do. Jonah closed his eyes. Then he vanished. Squeaks went with him, and there was an empty space where the two of them once were. All of us screamed at once, thinking he must have gone to a different part of the maze. Our efforts to get out were renewed. I started punching the wall, and Imogen kicked at it, with Sassy putting her paws on it to try and hold it back. The walls grew even tighter, until I couldn't extend my arms out all the way. Blood showed on Sophia's glass. She was damaging her hands in a desperate attempt to escape. Oh, fuck, we're screwed. We're so fucking screwed, I said. My organs were going to be total mush, and I thought I had at least a couple more months before I kicked the bucket. I couldn't even get Sophia or Imogen out. At least Jonah was safe somewhere. Then I heard Jonah's voice echoing over the maze. Guys, I'm on the platform on the other side, Jonah shouted. I escaped. How? Sophia's plea was desperate. I didn't like that look in her eyes. She had given up trying to get out and was clinging to Essis for dear life. Her blood had stained his white fur. She thought she was going to die. You have to think positively, Jonah shouted. Once you do, the spell will break and you'll be transported to a safe place. If you don't, the walls will crush you. What the fuck, I yelled. There's no way that works. The walls were getting closer and closer. I felt like I was being enclosed in a small box. There wasn't even enough room for me to take a step backward now if I wanted to. Imogen didn't question. Diagonally from me, she closed her eyes. In seconds, she and Sassy vanished to appear ancestors knows where. Imogen, Sophia screamed. Her eyes grew wide once she could no longer see her best friend. Where are you? Sophia, I'm out too, Imogen said. Her voice bounced off the glass wall somewhere from above. It works. Trust Jonah. Just think happy thoughts. Sophia took a trembling gasp. Then she closed her eyes and buried her head into Essis's fur. She was there for a moment. Then she was gone. Once I lost sight of her, I completely lost my shit. Ah, oh, fuck. I was alone. I was totally alone. I couldn't move. The walls were so close now that my arms were scrunched up against it in a poor attempt to hold them back. I was gonna die. This was it. It was the end. Liam, I'm okay, Sophia shouted. I felt a bit of relief when I heard her voice, but only just a little, you know, because I was only a few seconds away from being turned into jelly. We're right above you. I couldn't see any of them, but they could see me. Where are you guys? I shrieked. My terrified face reflected back at me in the glass, and it freaked me out a hundred times more than I already was. Don't worry about that. Just stop being negative, Jonah shouted. His voice sounded calm and relaxed. How, I didn't know. Just think you'll get out, and you will. I don't believe in that positivity bullshit, I screamed. It's the only way, Imogen added. Ah, oh, shit. We have to make Liam think positively, Jonah said. He's surely a goner. Liam, please think of something happy, Sophia pleaded. Think of Sophia's boobs, Jonah cried out. That's not helping. It wasn't easy to be positive when Sophia was screaming above me and begging me to not die. I tried. I tried to think about the first time Sophia kissed me, when I'd bonded with Nishoma, when we'd won the Elemental Cup. I tried to focus on all the good times I'd had with Sophia and my friends and tried to remember how I'd felt in those moments. But there was a problem. Every time I recalled those memories, it just brought up more pain. Losing Nishoma, still not being respected as a cup champion because I was sick and I'd fainted on stage. Having to worry, be afraid and sneak around in order to keep my relationship with Sophia alive. I had good memories, true, but every single one of them was still tied to the bad in some way. There was always a negative consequence to my happiness, and the bad was all I could think about. Liam! Sophia screamed. The walls were so close now I could feel them pressing me together. 
she really thought I was going to be crushed. So I tried a different way. I squeezed my eyes shut and tried to imagine something better. I made up a world where Sophia and I were older and we were married and had a bunch of kids running around. We had a house where we lived together and I felt good and people accepted us. We didn't have to hide from our tribe because the laws had changed. People didn't think less of us or less of our children. We were normal. We were okay. I was still sick, but it didn't matter because I was happy. It had been love at first sight for me when I saw Sophia, even when I didn't want to admit it. I didn't believe in that kind of thing either before it happened, but it had ended up to be true, so who was I to say that miracles didn't happen? Okay, fine. I believed I was getting out of here because I wanted to be with Sophia forever and no stupid wall was going to crush me before that happened. She was my miracle, so this trap could go to hell. Before I knew it, I stumbled out of the confining box and into Sophia's arms. I heard the walls snap together behind me just as she caught me. I had landed on the balcony across from the one we'd entered on, on the other side of the maze, except the maze was no longer there. Now all that was in the chamber was an empty room. Jonah was standing above me with a smug grin on his face. Told you. I wiped my forehead. I was sweating. What was all that? None of it was real. The vanishing, the maze, the walls. It was all in our heads, Jonah said, and he tapped the side of his temple. The purpose of the trap is to get people so scared they die of fright and for no reason at all or they just wander the maze forever and starve to death. Funny, isn't it? Hilarious, I said as I caught my breath. Yapluma had a sick sense of humor. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have watched you get smushed, Jonah added. The maze didn't vanish, and the illusion didn't break until you got out. But if it didn't really happen to him, wouldn't he still be alive? Sophia asked. She helped me to my feet, and I swayed on the spot. Fuck this temple. I wanted to go home. He probably would have had a heart attack anyway, Jonah said, and he shrugged. The illusion would have still given the simulation of getting crushed. It would have made Liam feel like he was, even though he wasn't. The mind is a powerful thing. You know a lot about this stuff, Jonah, Imogen said in admiration. I tried not to throw up. I love psychology, Jonah said. It's fascinating getting to know how the human brain works. Essis clambered from Sophia's shoulder onto mine. I tried to tell him no, but in a few seconds the pain ebbed away and I felt somewhat normal. I didn't have a lot of energy left in me to make it through this temple. I hoped it was over soon. What I don't understand is that it's a Yapluma trap. It didn't involve air at all, Sophia said. She gave a wayward glance at Esses on my shoulder, and he gave her a thumbs up back, whatever that meant. Most Yapluma are positive thinkers, Jonah replied. We are happy-go-lucky people, and we like mind games. People from the other houses wouldn't have been able to see through the trap that it is. But Yapluma don't have power over illusions. How did they even manage to do such a thing? Imogen questioned. The arcane must have set it up, Jonah said. I bet Yapluma hired them to set up the magic and the maze. Who are the arcane? Sophia asked. They're sorceresses, masters of illusion. They're the only magical race bound to shifters, Jonah said. I learned about them in my magical races and cultures class. You actually paid attention for once, I grumbled. Shifters? Sophia's face was confused. People who can change into animals. They're different from our magical creatures, I said quickly. But there's no time for a lesson on world cultures. We need to keep moving. My time was running out to see Anna. We'd already been down here for hours, more than the short walk to the top Sophia had promised. It had taken so long because we had to stop often to figure out where we were going and outmaneuver the traps we knew of, Plus, walking around this big temple in the first place was taking longer than we thought. I only had a short time left before my chance to contact Anna was over. Whatever you say, Mom, Jonah said, cracking a grin. Sophia and Imogen died of laughter. I hate you all. I almost smiled, too, because a joke was a welcome thing after that horrible shit. 
We went out the doors and found a staircase leading up to the summoning room. We stopped at the bottom so Imogen and Sophia could look at the map and I could take a breather. Jonah was petting Squeaks and still looking pretty damn proud of himself. Are we almost to the end? I'm tired of this crap, I said. It's just up there, Sophia said, and she pointed. At the top of this staircase. Thank the ancestors. Essis hopped off my shoulder and started scampering upward. The familiars went up the stairs first, sprinting toward the doors that led to our destination. Jonah and Imogen went on ahead, but I was slow going, and Sophia hung back to stay with me. You okay, Liam? Sophia asked. She looked like she was hovering between indecision like she didn't want to go through with what she'd been asked to do, but knew she had no choice. I'll make it, Polly. Though I wasn't sure I wanted to. At the start of this, I thought that Sophia would eventually get discouraged and turn back. I never thought we'd actually make it this far. I underestimated her. As always, Coigny didn't give up no matter what the circumstances. We reached the top of the temple, where the summoning room was. We opened the door, and a blast of cool air hit my face. The summoning room was a large area open to the air, with stone pillars in the shape of various magical creatures that had been carved in the Anichi style. There was a large hole in the roof where magic could be channeled, and where the ancestors were supposed to come down through. The area was covered with vines, and some of the pillars were crumbling. In the middle of the room was a large, flat stone table, big enough for several people to lie on and level with my waist. I suppose the stone table was where ceremonies were performed. Sophia started forward toward the stone table with purpose, but I wasn't going to let her get there. I walked in front of the table and planted my feet, lunging out an arm to stop Sophia from going any further. Sophia looked up at me, bewildered. I can't let you go through with this, I said firmly. I have to stop you. What are you talking about? Sophia asked. Essis looked at me and chittered. I meant what I said. This ends right now, I insisted. Liam, what are you doing? Imogen asked. Both she and Jonah looked confused. You don't get it. I have to do this, Sophia said. She attempted to push me aside, but her weak effort failed. It only cemented the fact in my head she didn't want to go through with this, and I wasn't going to let her. No, Sophia, you don't understand. I stood in front of the summoning platform and refused to move. Liam, let me through, Sophia said. She tried to shove past me again, but I wouldn't budge. I grabbed her by the shoulders and held her back, looking her in the eyes. You can't perform the ceremony, I said. If you do, I'll have to kill you. Chapter 24 Kill me? Liam had to be joking. That's just cruel, I told him bluntly, and I ripped away from his grasp. Now's not the time for jokes. What? Imogen and Jonah cried in unison over me. Liam's jaw tensed. I'm not kidding, Sophia. The water elders have plans of their own. They want me to kill you. Ancestors... Liam was dead serious. An agonizing pain unlike any other tore through my heart. Hot tears that felt like embers welled in my eyes. I blinked to hold them back, but I couldn't stop my voice from cracking. Is, is that why you went out with me? To get close to me? Suddenly, the ceremony didn't seem so urgent. Not when my boyfriend was planning to stab me in the back the second I performed it. I was so hurt by his confession that it already felt as if a knife was sticking out of my spine. My knees nearly buckled beneath me, but I held myself up by the corner of the table. No, Liam insisted. He stepped forward and reached out to touch my arm, but I jerked away. Essa snapped his teeth at him. Pain and regret crossed Liam's features. It's because I'm with you that they asked me to do it. That doesn't mean you have to, I cried. But, Liam hesitated. Bro, Jonah said, this is crazy. Imogen picked her jaw up off the floor, 
This is a violation of the elder's power. What were you thinking? You guys don't understand, Liam roared at them. He quickly quieted his voice and turned back to me. The water elders know how to bring Nashoma back. They agreed to do it if I killed Sophia. That's impossible, Imogen muttered. A tear rolled down my cheek. I couldn't imagine losing Essis, only to be given the chance to revive him. By choosing between him and Liam. But killing me? That was way too far. I couldn't believe Liam was actually considering it. My teeth clenched so hard that a headache started to form. You wouldn't, I whispered, unable to find the volume in my voice. Liam raked his fingers through his hair but wouldn't meet my gaze. I don't know, Pawi. The pain inside me snapped and turned to rage. Don't call me that, I spat. I walked straight up to him and shoved him as hard as I could in the chest. He stumbled backward a step, looking surprised. Jonah and Imogen began to protest from beside us, but I didn't hear what they said over my own voice chewing Liam out. How dare you, I screamed. How dare you call me that? I thought it meant something. I thought all of this meant something. This whole semester, I thought... My stomach felt as if it was trying to hold in a ton of rocks. I shoved him again when he didn't respond. You took advantage of me, Liam Mito. All this time, you were just planning to kill me. You're a coward. You should have kept your distance. Heat waves pulsed across my skin. Liam just stared down at me, his lip quivering. Say something, asshole! I snapped at him, smacking him hard in the chest again. Liam swallowed, then whispered, I'm sorry. Sorry's not good enough! I snarled. Don't you understand that I'm doing this for you? I already told you what the Kowigny elders would do to you if I didn't finish this. Kowigny House doesn't fuck around, Liam. He finally burst. Neither do the Toakwa elders. Sophia, you can't go through with this. We can work something else out. I crossed my arms, and Essis mirrored me from my shoulder. What's the deal, Liam? You keep me from fulfilling the prophecy and they find a way to bring Nashoma back from the dead? Yeah, basically, he replied bluntly. Then let me do this, I insisted. I'm not fulfilling the prophecy. I'm just getting answers. But Sophia, if you are the prophesied one, if, I emphasized, standing on my toes to get up in his face, we don't know anything until we talk to the ancestors. Liam leaned down until his nose was only inches from my own. His breath was cool and uninviting across my hot cheeks. You're being selfish. Selfish, I screamed. Everyone just calm down. Jonah tried to peel Liam and me apart, but I pushed him away. He jumped back from us like he'd touched a hot stove. I'm trying to save your life, I cried. Or did you not hear me the first two times I said that? You're doing this because you're curious about the prophecy. Liam spat back. So what? Maybe I am. Aren't you? Liam hesitated. You wouldn't have waited this long to say something if you weren't, I accused. I... Liam's gaze darted to Imogen and Jonah, like they might be able to help convince me. Imogen spoke up first. Sophia's right. Imogen said. I think we're all curious. Liam huffed. We don't have to do this. We can work out a solution. We can lie to the Kowigny about what happened here tonight. I stepped away from him, feeling disgusted. We can lie to the Toakwa, too. Silence hung in the air a moment. I couldn't stand it. Fine, Liam, I snapped opening my arms wide in a come-at-me gesture. You want to kill me? Then kill me. Sophia! Imogen dragged my name out like I was being ridiculous. I ignored her. Liam's eyebrows knitted together tightly and his fists shook. You can't, can you? I yelled. The fact of the matter is, Liam, the only way to save you is by completing this ceremony. 
every other alternative gets you killed. Imogen chewed her bottom lip and exchanged a glance with Jonah. I didn't realize the confession had come out until it happened. Liam gaped at me. What do you mean? Sophia, Jonah said softly, I think it's time to tell him. Tell me what? Liam's fists clenched harder. There'd never been a worse time to tell Liam the truth. But I was so sick of keeping secrets from him. There was never going to be a right time. As long as the confessions were rolling, I might as well get this one out in the open. My skin was so hot that sweat dripped down my forehead. A lump formed in my throat, but I forced the words past it. If you kill me, Essis dies with me. He's the only thing that's been keeping you on your feet these last few weeks. Imogen breathed a sigh of relief, like she'd been holding her breath for that confession for months. Jonah let out a squeak, as if it was some sort of touching moment that made him tear up. Sassy yipped at Squeak's hooves, and Squeaks danced around her. From my shoulder, Essis relaxed his hold on my ponytail and stood up straighter, like he was proud. Liam's face went completely blank, as though he needed time to process what he was hearing. What, what do you mean? He asked breathlessly. I could see the gears turning in his head as he put all the pieces together. I dropped my gaze. Essis has the power to heal. He's been treating you for months. A wave of guilt tore through me. Ancestors, why was it so hard to tell him the truth? Liam drew deep, shallow breaths, and his lips pursed tighter. The crease between his eyebrows deepened. He looked like he was trying not to explode. How long have you known? Since last semester, I confessed, unable to meet his gaze. Essis helped you through the tournament and has been healing you ever since. The top finally blew off his kettle. You just decided not to tell me? I distanced myself from him a step as his arms flailed angrily. Doesn't that seem like an important bit of information? He roared. This could change the whole course of my life. I know, I admitted sheepishly. We tried to stay away while Perot was studying you, but nothing he did seemed to help. Not like Essis could. That doesn't matter, Liam growled. He began pacing back and forth, like he was warming up for a marathon. When that didn't help, he stomped over to a statue of a bird and shoved it over. A sound like thunder filled the room, and the statue cracked into at least a dozen pieces. Imogen gasped, then cried, Liam, stop it! Bro! Jonah rushed forward to help calm him, but Liam just shrugged him off with his elbow. Jonah grunted and backed away, clutching his ribs. Liam whirled back to me. How could you keep something like this from me? Because I knew you'd react like this! I screamed back. You think I want to stand around and watch you break things? Liam glanced down to the broken statue, looking guilty. Besides, I wasn't the only one keeping secrets. I was actually trying to keep you from getting killed. I wasn't the one planning your murder. My chest hurt so bad that I thought I might go into cardiac arrest. Liam ignored my accusation. Why didn't you tell me when you first found out? I curled my arms around myself as the confession tumbled out of my mouth. I didn't want anyone finding out what Essis was. I was scared they'd take him from me. We wanted to tell you during the tournament, but if you reacted like this then, we never would have gotten through. Then the Coigny threatened me, and Perot was treating you. It was all too risky. I tried to tell you, but it was never the right time. We always got interrupted. We wanted to tell you during the tournament? Liam repeated. He turned on Imogen and Jonah, fuming. You two knew about this? Um, Imogen looked to Sassy at her feet. We did, Jonah admitted. But Sophia's right. We couldn't tell you during the tournament. You could have told me after, Liam snapped. You're supposed to be my best friend. It wasn't my secret to tell, Jonah insisted. 
You guys totally betrayed me. All of you. Liam started pacing again. I'd never seen him so mad before. He fisted his hands in his hair, then kicked at one of the pieces of broken statue. It went flying across the room and out through the space between the pillars. I heard it tumble several feet down the side of the pyramid. Finally, Liam gave up. He leaned his back against a pillar and sank down to the ground with his head in his hands. The anger was gone now. It was being replaced with total devastation. His shoulders shook in heavy sobs. I couldn't help but feel guilty for driving him to this point. Liam, I said softly, but he didn't look up. He sat as still as if time had frozen, like he'd given up. I knew I'd broken his heart, but I still had to move forward. Liam, I'm doing this with or without you. Then do it, he snapped without lifting his head. Fine, I thought bitterly. I turned my back to him, trying to forget he was in the room at all. What about you two? I asked Imogen and Jonah. Are you going to stop me? No, Imogen answered immediately, shaking her head. Jonah's shoulders slumped, and he glanced toward Liam. I think you should try to get some answers. Taking a deep breath, I turned to the summoning table. I stole one last glance back at Liam. As angry as I was with him, I couldn't let the Coigny elders hurt him. I couldn't let them touch any of my friends. Essis hopped onto the summoning table. I swung my bag off my shoulder and set it next to him, then climbed onto the table myself. I positioned myself cross-legged in the center, just below the opening in the ceiling, where the table had been stained dark. Imogen and Jonah stood beside the table with their familiars to watch. Taking deep breaths, I tried to cool down, but my pulse continued to race. I was so angry I could explode. Just forget about Liam for a minute, I told myself. I didn't have the luxury of putting this ceremony off. I'd get back to Liam later. My hands shook as I opened my backpack and pulled out a small bag of herbs Doya had given me. I tugged on the drawstring, and a strong, sweet aroma hit my nose. Doya didn't tell me exactly what was in it, just that it contained four different herbs that represented each of the four houses. I handed Essis the open bag to save for later. Reaching into my backpack, I pulled out a washcloth and a sharp pocket knife. My heart hammered at the thought of using it. Imogen drew a sharp breath. What's that for? I glanced to her to see a worried look on her face. The ceremony requires blood. Jonah turned his nose up. Just don't cut your palm. Use your arm or something where it'll hurt less. I can't use either of those. The ceremony requires blood from the ears. Imogen's eyes widened. It's a symbol to the ancestors. I explained, repeating what Doya had told me. It tells them I'm opening myself to hear from them. Are you sure about this? Imogen asked, looking frightened for me. Im, I have to. Her expression softened slightly, so I turned back to Essis. He bit his lower lip as I lifted the point of the knife to the skin just behind my ear. You know what you're doing, buddy? I asked him. Essis nodded though his blue eyes glistened with tears. You don't have to worry. I'll be fine. He nodded, but it didn't look like it helped ease his worry. Sophia, don't. Liam's voice sounded behind me, but I ignored him. Here we go, I said, taking a deep breath. Then I pressed the knife into my skin. I gasped as a sharp pain shot through my ear. Warmth trickled down my neck and across my hand. I quickly leaned over to the center of the table and watched as blood splattered across its surface. My insides twisted, and Essa squeaked nervously. I think that's enough, Imogen said. But I didn't stop. Doya had warned me about using too little blood. 
She'd said that if I thought I was done, I still had a long way to go. So I continued to let the blood pour out of me. The thick red liquid began to creep along the length of the table, spreading out in all directions. Essis stepped backward as it inched toward him. Sophia! Imogen pressed. Not yet, I replied. Drip, drip, drip. Large droplets of blood fell into the liquid already pooled beneath me, one after the other in quick succession. I couldn't even calculate how fast the blood came. It ran down my jaw and dripped off my chin. As I leaned over further, my ponytail slid across my shoulder and blood matted in my hair. I held my hair back and waited. My head began to spin, and a chill spread over my skin. Sophia! Imogen cried again. Finally, I pressed the washcloth to my wound and pressed hard. Essis, the herbs. He flipped the small bag in his hands over, dumping the herbs on top of the blood. He tossed the bag aside and scurried onto my shoulder, pressing his paws behind my ear to heal me. Meanwhile, I lit the herbs with my fire. Tall orange flames shot into the air, then quickly died down to a small fire. I reached for the totem around my neck, praying it would help give me the courage and the power to get through this ceremony. But it wasn't there. I ran my fingers across my empty chest again. Panic swept through me, but I didn't have the time to worry about where I'd lost the totem. Somewhere in the ruins, I was sure. But I couldn't go back to look for it now. The herbs were almost burnt out now, and I only had one chance to complete the ceremony. I was going to have to do this without the totem. I quickly began muttering the Hawkeye words Doya had taught me. E summa te ancestras portali e neon e hode, de sago en te sole shawana harjo. I call upon the ancestors to guide me on my path. Descend from the stars, shawana harjo. My words concluded as the last bit of embers died. Only one step left. I could do this. I threw my washcloth to the ground, then turned my palm up to the sky. I channeled all of my heat down through my arm, picturing it as a rope leading up to the ancestors. It took everything I had to push Liam out of my mind and focus on the things that brought me joy. Essis gently stroked behind my ear where I had cut myself, and his fur brushed against the back of my neck. I put all my focus on him. Liam betrayed me, but Essis never would. At that thought, heat exploded out of my palm. Lightning flashed above my head, immediately followed by a crack of thunder. I blinked several times, blinded by the light. When my eyes focused again, the first thing I saw was a pair of bare feet hovering just inches off the summoning table. Slowly, I lifted my gaze, unable to believe what I was seeing. A woman dressed in a long yellow skirt and an elaborately patterned top stood in front of me. She had long black hair secured in a braid down her back. Her body was slightly transparent, but she was more solid than my ancestors I'd met in the past like she was more physically present than they ever were. Shawana Harjo? I asked breathlessly. My heart pounded so hard I could hear my pulse in my ears. Imogen and Jonah both gasped, but I didn't look over to them. Sophia Henley, Shawana replied kindly, opening her arms to me. Her voice was melodic, like the sound of wind chimes and a light breeze. I quickly got to my knees and bowed my head so low my nose nearly touched the blood at my feet. Thank you for meeting with me. What can I do for you, child? She asked. I lifted my head. I'm told you're the Natterai who made the fire prophecy. She nodded. Can you tell me about it? I asked desperately. I could still hardly believe she was standing there. A small part of me never thought it would actually work. She smiled sweetly. What is it that you want to know? Relief flooded through me, 
and the questions spilled out. What does the prophecy mean? The faded Coigny child, born on the summer solstice in the year of the dragon, shall bring glory to the greatest house. The greatest house is Coigny, isn't it? They are the most powerful. Shawana nodded. Yes, they are. And the faded Coigny child, that's me? She pressed her lips together. I cannot answer that definitively. It does not have to be. What do you mean? The answer is yes and no, she said thoughtfully. Do you want it to be you? I hesitated. I don't know. What benefit does elevating my house give if everyone else gets hurt because of it? She didn't answer right away. Instead, Shawana knelt to my level and looked me straight in the eye. You do not have to do this, Sophia. Other Coigny children will be born. I don't? Honestly, my heart lifted in my chest a little. If there was a way out of being the chosen one, I might actually take it. Just then, a sound like falling rock came from outside the room, as if the wind had blown the broken piece of stone further down the side of the pyramid. My eyes darted in that direction, while Jonah quickly rushed to the corner of the room and peeked over the edge. Squeaks looked over with him. What was that? Imogen asked in alarm. Jonah shrugged. I don't see anything. I had hoped it would be you, Shawana said, pulling my attention back to her. You are the first child with the tools to carry the prophecy out. What happens if I don't want to? I asked cautiously. Can I prevent it? Shawana took a deep breath. There's a reason prophecies are given in such vague wording, Sophia. You must let your inner light guide you to its true meaning. If you are the Coigny child I spoke of, you will understand when you are ready. Once you find all the pieces to the prophecy, once you see what the future truly holds for your house, you will understand what has to be done. I absorbed her words as she spoke. All the pieces? The pieces the other houses are hiding, you mean? The Coigny elders had been right. The other houses had secrets, and they were each holding tight to their hand. Shawana nodded. When I delivered the prophecy, I gave a piece to each of the houses so that they could not use the information against each other. If you want to know what to do, you must reunite those pieces. That's why I'm here, I said desperately, to get the pieces from you. Shawana shook her head slowly. I cannot do that. There are lessons to be learned along the journey. Telling you them now would render the journey obsolete. You have much to learn before you are ready. The prophecy is only a destination, but there are many paths to the end. Your choices will affect the outcome. You, Sophia, have the power to determine the fate of the Hawkeye. I took a moment to consider what she was saying. It sounded like a huge responsibility, but it also gave me hope. Hope that I could change the course of our tribe's future. That's all I have to do? Find the pieces? She smiled. Yes, you already have two. Two? The faded Coigny child, she said. That was Coigny's piece. Was the second piece about the magical object? I questioned, thinking about what Doya had told me months ago. You will have to find a powerful item that will serve to fulfill the prophecy. Shawana crossed her hands in front of herself calmly. That was part of the same piece. Coigny kept that half to themselves. The second piece... She didn't finish her sentence. Instead, she lifted her gaze to look at Liam across the room. I followed her eyes to see that Liam was still slumped against the pillar, but he was watching us with interest. Liam already has the water piece, if he is willing to share it with you, Shawana said. 
Liam's eyes went wide, and he stilled. My stomach sank. After everything, I couldn't believe how many secrets there were between us. You knew there was more to the prophecy and you didn't tell me? I asked him. The hurt was evident in my tone. Liam nodded so slightly that it was barely noticeable. Tears welled in my eyes again, but my voice was gentle. I wanted to break down and cry, but I knew I had to play nice. Will you tell me? Liam chewed on the inside of his cheek, looking as if he was fighting a tough internal battle. Finally, he stood, but it looked like it caused him pain. He held onto his side and used the pillar to support himself. When he found his footing, he stepped forward with guilt and regret in his eyes. Tears began to stream silently down his face as he recited the Toakwa portion of the prophecy. The prophesied one will bring death beyond comprehension. It is she who shall cause Toakwa's darkest hour, Liam said. I pressed my hand over my mouth. Beside the table, Imogen and Jonah clung to each other. Liam gazed downward and whispered softly, That's why the Toakwa want you dead, to save our tribe. Tears began streaming down my face. I didn't want to be the one to hurt anyone, especially Liam. I would never destroy his house to save mine. I turned back to Shawana, my whole body quaking, but I couldn't find my voice. You must find the pieces each house holds, Shawana said. Then you will know. Be prepared, because if you are willing to do this, you will lose the very life you cherish. All the air left my lungs. Beside me, Imogen began crying into Jonah's shoulder. I didn't get a word in before Shawana said, That is all I can reveal to you now, my child. Tread carefully. Then she was gone, like leaves being taken by the wind. It took me several moments and Essis' chirp in my ear to be brought back to reality. My mind was still racing with everything Shawana had said to me. I lifted my head and looked to my friends. Guys, I don't think I can do this alone. I don't think you can do it at all, Jonah replied. Didn't you hear any of that? If Kawigni rules, people will die. Toakwa will face its darkest hour. How can you even be considering this? Imogen asked, looking offended. This prophecy sounds horrible. She said you were going to die if you fulfilled it. I looked to Liam, waiting for him to say something. His eyes glazed over like he wasn't really with us. He looked completely empty. I'm not going to fulfill the prophecy, I stated. I would never do that. But I still think we need to do what Shawana instructed. We should find all the pieces. So that you can go report back to the Kawigni elders? Liam asked bitterly. No, I cried. How could he think I'd do that? So that we can use the pieces against them. You heard what Shawana said. My choices will determine the fate of the Hawkeye. If we have all the pieces, we'll know what we're up against. Knowledge is power. And the more we know, the more advantage we have over the elders. We could prevent this thing from ever happening. Imogen relaxed, and Jonah looked thoughtful, like I'd made a good point. Liam looked as if he was trying to decide if I was lying or not. But none of them spoke. It was like they were all waiting for someone else to decline the offer. Look, if you guys don't want to help me, then you might as well kill me now because I can't do this by myself, I said, choked up. I was begging them now. Absolutely not, Imogen cried. We won't do that, Jonah said at the same time. I failed the ceremony, I pointed out. I didn't get what the elders wanted. The Coigny might still go after you. You might as well murder me to save yourselves. Liam can get Nishoma back, 
and the rest of you can enjoy your lives without this prophecy crap hanging over your heads. They all exchanged a wary glance. All I knew was that I couldn't do this without my friends. It was all together or not at all. I picked up my knife and walked to the end of the table, then bent to shove the handle in Liam's hands. He backed away and stared down at the blade with wide eyes. I jumped down from the table and took his hands in mine, forcing the point of the blade to the sensitive skin at my navel. It dug in, but not enough to cut skin. My heart pummeled against my chest, and I could barely breathe. Essis tugged hard on my ponytail to stop me, but I ignored him. Tears streamed down my face as I looked into Liam's pain-filled eyes. Do it, Liam. Save yourself. A muscle popped in his jaw. He shook his head. Don't make me do this, Soph. Sophia, stop it! Imogen sobbed, curling into Jonah's arms. No one's going to die! I didn't take my eyes off Liam's. His expression was filled with apology, and tears wet his face. He looked like he was in agony. Essis screamed in my ear, but I barely heard it. All I could focus on were Liam's soft, sad eyes. I would miss them, but that would be all right. I'd watch him from the stars with the ancestors. With Nashoma back, he'd get better, wouldn't he? He could live a full life, one where his tribe flourished. Liam, I whispered, finish it. No, Jonah shouted. A slew of emotions flickered across Liam's features so quickly that I couldn't read them. His fingers tightened on the blade. Ancestors, he's going to go through with it. In the blink of an eye, Liam jerked backward, ripping his hands and the blade away from me. He tossed the knife aside, and it slid to the ground and over the side of the temple. No, Pawi, he said, his chest heaving. I won't do it. I won't kill you. I... He looked to Jonah and Imogen momentarily before turning back to me. I'll help you. You will? I whispered breathlessly. Yes, he replied. We'll find all the pieces of the prophecy together, and we'll use them to beat Coigny. Toakwa will never see its darkest hour. Relief washed over me like a strong ocean wave. I was so overwhelmed that my knees shook beneath me. Imogen rushed forward and pulled me into a hug, helping keep me upright. Soon Jonah joined me at my other side, along with Liam moments later. Sassy weaved between our legs, rubbing her fur against us happily, and Squeaks spread out her wing and draped it over Jonah's shoulder. Essis threw his arms around my neck. Tears fell from my face. Liam's offer didn't earn him immediate forgiveness, but I was grateful beyond words that he didn't do what the elders had asked of him. Jonah and I are going to help you too, Imogen said. There's no way we're letting you search for those pieces on your own. We all finally drew away from each other, wiping our eyes. We just have to be careful, Imogen said. Careful how? Jonah asked. There's no coming back from what we've just done, Imogen said. All the secrets, Shawana's advice, not to mention the fact that Sassy's a kitsune. With a powerful familiar like that, people would be watching me if they knew. People are watching us already, Liam pointed out. Exactly, Imogen agreed. And if they knew we were trying to piece the prophecy together, we'd be in even more danger. We're helping Sophia, which makes us all targets. We have to be careful and watch each other's backs. Don't worry, guys, Jonah said. I've got your backs, all of you. We all looked at each other blankly, unsure of what to say next. The silence was unnerving as I waited for someone else to speak. Finally, Jonah dropped his head. Come on, guys, he said lowly. Let's go home. Knock, knock, knock. 
The door to Madame Doya's office swung open so fast that it blew Doya's fiery red hair back. Sophia, where have you been? What took you so long? Doya looked, dare I say it, concerned. She reached out into the hall and grabbed my shoulder, dragging me into the privacy of her office. It was so early that Dawn hadn't broken yet. I was beyond tired and probably looked like a mess. I seriously needed a shower to wash the blood out of my hair and the dirt out of everywhere. But I'd been instructed to report back to Doya the second I returned to the castle. We were all so tired that we split up once we made it back. I headed straight to Doya's office instead of my dorm. I dropped my bag on a sofa cushion, then plopped down beside it. Essis hopped off my shoulder to snuggle in my lap. Naomi hugged Doya's side closely. She limped on her front paw, which was wrapped tightly in a bandage. I ran into a few snags, I told Doya. She sat in the chair across from me and raised an eyebrow. Snags? There were more obstacles than you thought, I admitted, though I didn't reveal specifics. Doya's expression softened so that I couldn't read it. She leaned back in her chair. Interesting. What kind of obstacles? I shrugged. Things set up by the other houses, I guess. Puzzles and stuff like that. Nothing my fire couldn't handle. Doya crossed her legs. Her tone was skeptical. Really? You mean you didn't have any help? What the heck? How did she know? I suddenly felt more alert and awake. Doya's eyes momentarily darted toward the bandage on Naomi's paw, and I instantly understood. Naomi had followed me. The falling rock we'd heard must have been Naomi slipping as she prowled around the narrow pyramid stones. She'd hurt herself on the way down, then rushed to report back to Doya. I pulled Essis closer to me. How much had Naomi heard? Did she hear me tell Liam about Essis' healing abilities? The Coigny elders would be far too interested in that bit of information. What matters is that I got to the summoning room and completed the ceremony, I said. And? Doya pressed. And that's it, I shrugged. Shawana appeared, but she didn't tell me anything you don't already know. She didn't give you the other pieces to the prophecy, Doya asked but she didn't sound very curious. It was like she already knew. I tried to think back to when we'd heard the falling rock. All Naomi knew was that Shawana told me I didn't have to be the prophesied one if I didn't want to be. No, she didn't, I answered truthfully. Then you didn't try hard enough. Doya's accusation was like a slap in the face. I leaned forward, my skin heating as I stared her down. I did everything you asked of me and more. Don't you think Shawana would have given me the pieces if I was the prophesied one? True, she agreed. But who knows what you might be hiding? Was she serious? But, Doya emphasized, I think you still have greatness in you, Sophia. So don't think you're completely off the hook just yet. Oh, wow. What a compliment. I guess I never expected anything less from Madame Doya. I have to say, I expected more from you, Doya said coldly. I scoffed. Like I haven't heard that one before. Why can't you just accept me as I am? Doya went completely still at the question, like I'd hit a nerve. Finally, she uncrossed her knees and leveled me with a heavy stare. Just don't get too comfortable, Sophia. I stood with Essis in my arms and walked to the door. I didn't have to take this. Don't worry, I won't. Oh, and next time? Maybe try preparing the prophesied one a little more than you prepared me. Doya smirked. I'm sure the Coigny elders won't make the same mistake twice. I paused with my hand on the doorknob. Our deal is still good, right? I did what you asked, so my friends are safe. Doya nodded. 
As long as you are telling the truth. Naomi heard the same thing I did. Why don't you ask her? I asked snidely. Doya looked at me with such disgust that it turned my stomach. In that case, you might as well know that the Fire Council has already convened. Chiefess Wes Phoenix and the other elders are furious that you've failed. We should have known you weren't the chosen one when you bonded with that weak familiar. Pitch! I whipped the door open and stomped out of her office. At least now I knew Naomi didn't hear about S's abilities. I walked for a while, heading back to the Coigny dorms. Around the corner, I nearly rammed into Liam. He straightened from where he leaned against the wall, looking alert. Essis bared his teeth at him. You can relax, I told him with a sigh. I didn't know what to say to Liam, or how to feel. It was like I was looking into the eyes of two different people. The Liam I loved, and the Liam who had vowed to kill me. It tore my heart in two. I could literally feel the pain clawing away at my chest. I didn't tell Doya anything she didn't already know. The Coigny elders don't think I'm the prophesied one anymore. They've lost interest in me. They don't know about Essis. Liam shoved his hands into his pockets. That's not why I'm here. Oh, I asked curiously. Then why? Then... I knew. I already knew what he was going to say before he opened his mouth. I could see it in his eyes. Because this can't wait, Liam said. We need to talk. Chapter 25 Sophia's face hardened as she looked back at me. Fine. Where? Probably somewhere private. I led her to an empty classroom, the one where we'd talked about putting some distance between each other in order to stay safe. I'd had enough time to think about what I had to do. I'd made up my mind. This was the only way, and I was done with fooling myself, done with getting hurt. I felt so numb. All that was inside me was emptiness. It was hard to feel anything anymore. I entered into the empty classroom, and Sophia came in behind me. She put Essis on one of the desks as I shut the door. I didn't bother waiting around. I needed to get the words out before I lost my nerve. I have to end our relationship. It's over, Sophia. We're done. Her face changed. A bunch of emotions crossed it all at once. Rage, confusion, and the one that hurt me the most, absolute heartbreak. Her mouth dropped open. Are you serious? You just put me through a night of hell and now you're breaking up with me? What else are we supposed to do? I asked her. Do you see any way to fix this? We should just take a break, not break up. She stepped forward and put her hands on my chest. We just need some time to think. Please, Liam. I took her hands off of me and gently pushed her away. Her face fell again. It was practically like I could hear her heart crack. Her expression was one of total disbelief before it turned to anger. I knew it, she snapped. I knew you were just waiting to throw in the towel. You wanted to give up on us. I told you that by the waterfall. It's not like that, I mumbled. It seemed like a shitty excuse. Essis looked between us, back and forth, he seemed so desperate, like he wanted the fight to stop, but didn't know how to make us. I know today was rough. I don't really want to be with you now either after what you did, but I still don't want to give up on us, Sophia insisted. There is no us, I shouted. Look at what we did, Soph. We lied to each other for months. I had good reason to. Did you? Did I? I raised an eyebrow at her. Because I realized that I didn't, and I think deep down you know you didn't either. Sophia chewed on her lip, thinking. She was trying to come up with a way to salvage what we had, trying to stop this. I just, I can't believe you did this to me. All of it, she whispered. I know you wanted Nashoma back, but this is just cruel. What if Essis died? What if someone came to you with the opportunity to get him back? You'd just have to kill me first, I asked. 
I hope you would take that chance, Sophia. You don't know what it's like living like this. I thought I meant more to you than that. The tears started coming. They were pouring from her eyes so fast they outnumbered the rain. I longed to step forward and wipe them away, but I held myself back. It's not like that. I didn't have a choice, I shouted. They would have sent another assassin after you if I hadn't agreed. I bought you time. Don't you understand that? Are they still going to kill me? Sophia's tears didn't stop, but she took on a fierce look that said she'd like to see them try. Not if I report that you aren't the prophesied one, I told her, and I stood up straight. I'll tell them you failed the ceremony, and that the Kawigny elders no longer think you're going to fulfill the prophecy. Then they'll leave you alone. Are you going to tell them about the pieces I have to find too? After all, you're their errand, boy, she shot at me. My mouth fell open. Who do you think I'm more loyal to, I asked. Everything I've done this past year has been for you. Yes, even the bad stuff, I said when she opened her mouth. I lied because I was trying to protect you. My tribe abandoned me, and you didn't. But you're still breaking up with me. Like that makes sense, she let out a skeptical noise. Because there's no other option. Relationships are built on trust. We don't have that anymore. I don't think we had that from the beginning. I shook my head. We totally betrayed each other. Both of us are to blame. It doesn't matter which betrayal is worse. What matters is that it happened, and neither of us said anything until the information came out on its own. You weren't trying to protect me. You were looking out for yourself, she said bitterly. You didn't want to risk getting hurt by telling me the truth. You're being rather hypocritical, I said bluntly. You had all semester to tell me about Essis, and you didn't say a damn thing. Her face remained stony. It was wrong to keep that from you, but I wasn't trying to actively kill you, she hissed. That was never my plan. Not from the beginning, I said. I never wanted to kill you. I didn't consider it an option. You did tonight, she said. I saw the look in your eyes. You were considering it. And I still couldn't do it, which should tell you something, I spat back at her. I couldn't kill you, Sophia, not even for Nashoma's sake. You were right from the start when you said I could never hurt you. I've been trying to save your life all semester. What do you mean? She sniffled, looking confused. This was it. Time to reveal more secrets. I've been sabotaging you, trying to make it seem like you weren't as powerful as Kawigny thought, so that the Tawakwa elders would lose interest and leave you alone, I said. The only way to make sure that I didn't have to kill you was to convince the elders you weren't a threat. Your dad put you up to this, didn't he? Sophia asked. I knew he hated me. When you took me to your house to meet your family, was it all an act? Don't talk about my family like that, I said viciously. All this shit is way out of our control. My dad was only doing what he thought was best for Toakwa, and my mom and siblings don't know anything about this, not even Ezra. This was my burden to bear. What did you do to me? Her voice was getting high-pitched and squeaky. She started crying again. I could barely understand her. I looked at the floor. I couldn't even look at her as I admitted it. I poisoned the roses. The ones I gave you on Valentine's Day. I put an herb in them that weakens a Coigny's magic. She started crying harder. I can't believe you, she yelled. Do you realize what Doya put me through because of that? I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought it was my fault. She put a hand over her mouth. Did you fuck with my camera too? No, I said immediately. That was a gift, a real one. He must have bought it out of guilt. Essis reached up to wipe away the tears from her eyes. She leaned down to let him. I didn't, I said weakly. The anger was fading from me now to be replaced with guilt. I'd done so many bad things. I just... I wanted to make you happy. Well, you did. She sobbed and forced out. Too bad it was all a lie. It wasn't a lie. My voice was getting desperate. Fuck, I was seconds away from crying too. I cried enough tonight. I didn't want to break down again. I still love you. 
And I did what I did because I love you too, Sophia shouted. Essis is the only one keeping you from dying. But what he can do isn't a cure. It's never going to be able to fix you. It might even stop working. I couldn't give you false hope. Sophia, I said gently. I moved forward and grabbed her chin gently in my hand, then lifted it so she could look at me. I would have been okay with taking that risk. She pulled away from me. I wanted to tell you about the Coigny elders, but how could I? If I had said anything, they would have hurt you. I've had to go through this the entire semester alone. It felt like a knife was twisting into my gut as I watched her sob. I realized how lonely she had felt this entire semester, bearing this burden on her own. The signs had been staring me in the face that she needed someone to be there for her, but I ignored them. I was the one who had made her feel alone. I'd known the Coigny elders had put her up to something, but I'd never asked. I'd barely tried to find out. That was on me. We could have worked something out, I said. I tried to keep my tone as soft as possible. I couldn't bear to yell at her anymore. Instead, you chose to keep quiet and play with fire. You trusted Doya more than your own friends. You spied on me and Doya? She hardly reacted. It was like she was expecting the blows to keep coming. Yes, and when I reported back to Bane, Bane's in on this too? Her eyes popped out of her head. Shit, there were so many secrets I'd forgotten them all. I pretty much lived in a twisted web of lies. He's on the Tawakwa Council. My dad assigned him to help me with my mission. My words faltered. I've been misleading him all semester, so he didn't force me to... My voice dropped off. I can't even trust my own teachers. She started bawling harder than before. This was unbearable to watch, but I couldn't look away because she deserved more from me. Sophia's tears ebbed as she let out a sarcastic noise. You know, you might have been assigned to kill me, but it sure didn't prevent you from fooling around with me on the side. That was special to me, too. I felt deflated. I don't mess around with just anyone. I meant every word I ever said to you. It wasn't about getting off or... I never should have shared those moments with you. They were a mistake. Sophia cut me off. I'm glad I didn't have sex with you. I regret letting you even touch me. When she said those words, those few short sentences, the pain was worse than anything my body could put me through. I couldn't say anything in reply. The air felt so heavy. In that moment, it was difficult to even breathe. I felt a huge weight on my chest, like I was being crushed. I'd felt it before, when Mia had broken up with me. But that pain felt like nothing when it came to losing Sophia. It was an afterthought. This was a million times worse, equal to losing Nishoma. This semester has been so hard, she wiped back strands of hair that had fallen in front of her eyes. I thought the one good thing about it was you. You're not the only one. I forced myself to meet her eyes. To me, you were the best part of Arenda Academy. Then why? Do you know how much I've suffered these last few months? I asked. My voice was starting to break now because I never admitted it to her, never admitted it to anyone, but I'd been in so much pain, and she'd seen that and said nothing. I didn't know what was wrong with me. One week I was fine, and the next I was terrible. I thought I was dying. I spent weeks trying to figure out how to say goodbye to my family, say goodbye to you, and none of that was necessary because you were able to help me the entire time. You just didn't. I did help you, Sophia insisted. Essus healed you as much as he could. Without my knowledge, I said. You treated me without asking permission first, without telling me what you were doing to my body. That's fucked up. My body is the one thing I still have a say with, doesn't matter if it works right or not. I crossed my arms and turned away from her. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I still don't really know. I had the opportunity to figure it out tonight, but I lost my chance to talk to Anna because I was helping you. This was such a soft spot. Even talking about it was agonizing. That's why I never brought it up. 
I didn't mean to hurt you, she insisted. No, you had the answer to the most painful problem in my life, and you never said a word. That fucking hurts, Sophia. I finally broke. Tears started coming out of my eyes, and I couldn't stop them. I fucking hated this. Her expression was shocked, like she didn't know how badly she'd hurt me. Her face was conflicted. She didn't know what to do. I kept my back turned to her so she couldn't see. Now we were both crying. Shit, this was a mess. Sophia's sobs lessened and became quiet. I heard her footsteps behind me. She laid a warm hand on my back. I let her touch me. Please don't cry, she whispered. I'm trying not to. I wiped my face and pulled myself together. I wanted to kick something, but I was trying to show her I could remain in control of my emotions. It was barely working. I stepped away from her so her hand was no longer on me. It was like pulling an ax out of my back. I turned back to face her. I needed to change the subject because if I kept talking about my health, I was going to lose it completely and I didn't want her to see me break down. My voice steadied when I went back to business. There's one last thing you should know. There's a weapon out there that could eliminate the entire tribe. Bane's been looking for it for years. Tawakwa thinks that you're going to find it and use it against them. It's called the Aza Imperii. It's a weapon that can control the ancestors. Sophia shook her head and took a step back. Even if I found the Aza Imperii, I wouldn't use it. I know that, I responded quietly. But other people don't. She looked at me. Are the Toakwa elders going to bring Nashoma back, now that you've proven to them I'm not the one? Things in my head cleared. I... I don't know, I said breathlessly. I hope so. I hadn't thought about it, but I had completed my mission. I'd done what they asked. They had to fulfill their end of the bargain, didn't they? I was getting Nashoma back. Today. It made me so happy that I wanted to fall to my knees and praise the ancestors. But at the same time, it was horrible because it had cost me Sophia. Not her life, thank the great spirit. Just us. Who we were together. It was a horrible sacrifice. Like everything in my life that brought me joy, it came with something bad. It came with a cost. Sophia wiped her face. I do hope you get Nishoma back, Liam. Her voice wobbled like she was trying not to cry again. I hope it was worth it. She ran off. Esses stood on the desk and watched her go before he turned to look at me. His ears were drooping and his lip wobbled. His big blue eyes were filled with tears. He didn't seem angry at me, just miserable. Esses jumped off the desk and padded after Sophia. They left the door open behind them. The moment she was gone from my sight, I realized I'd just made a terrible mistake. It was sunrise. I'd been up all night, but I had no intention of sleeping. Bane was in his office, grading exam papers. I'd never seen him up so early. It was a bit weird to find him here. He must have had a lot of work to do. I knocked before entering. He looked up, and I didn't give so much as a hello before I said, Summon the elders. I have information to discuss. It's rather early, Liam, Bain said. Most of the elders are still sleeping. It would be better to wait. I'm the firstborn son of the chief. I have the right, I told Bain. Call the meeting, now. Bain blinked at me as I left. I headed out of the classroom and started toward the beach. When I passed the cafeteria, I saw Jonah leaning outside one of the doors, looking excited. He hadn't gone to sleep either, obviously. When he saw me, he came rushing over. Liam! Liam, you'll never believe what just happened, Jonah said. I was just at breakfast. Guess what? Raynar asked me to move in with him over the summer. Isn't that great? We don't have to live together now. The apartment we were all supposed to get this summer, the four of us, had completely forgotten about it. Jonah moving in with Raynar seemed like a terrible idea, but it was his life. I didn't have any right to tell him how to live it. That's great, man. I forced a smile, but it was so small it vanished within seconds. 
happy for you. Jonah's grin vanished as he noticed my tone. You look, Jonah glanced at me up and down. He didn't finish his sentence. Did something happen between you and Sophia? We split up. The words were out of my mouth before I knew it, and I realized they were horribly true. Sophia had been my girlfriend mere hours ago, and now she wasn't. The fact would have destroyed my soul if I still had one. Oh, I'm sorry, man, Jonah said. He frowned. His tone implied he really meant it. That's okay. Things just don't work out sometimes, I guess, I said hollowly. Jonah grimaced like he didn't agree, but he said nothing. So, where are you off to now? Jonah asked. I'm reporting to the Tawakwa elders, I told him. I'm giving them the bare minimum to get them off my back and away from Sophia. I'm not saying shit about the pieces. That's for us four to know. Good luck, Jonah told me. I nodded to him and walked off. I made my way to the beach and dived in. I planned to get to Serpent Assembly before anyone else did, but I took my time. I swam as far as I could out to sea until I didn't see the shoreline and laid on my back as the sun came up. One of the reasons I loved being in the water was because of how weightless you felt. You could lie on your back for hours, and it felt like your problems literally fell off of you and drifted to the ocean floor. I thought that maybe tonight I could just swim out into the ocean as far as I could go and just float on the water until I couldn't anymore. The bottom of the ocean couldn't be lower than I felt right now. Just sink. But Nashoma was waiting for me, possibly even this very moment. The only thing right now that could possibly make me feel any better was to have him go rushing into my arms. I held my breath and dived downward. I rocketed myself toward the assembly and entered through its double doors. I didn't even bother to dry myself off as I entered. The elders began arriving one by one, taking their place in the benches above me. They appeared disarrayed and frazzled, as if they'd just gotten out of bed. Most were confused. Dad seemed to know what the meeting was about, though. He wouldn't meet my eyes. Elder Mallison sneered at me with his old, decrepit face and said, You'd better have a good reason for calling us at this early hour, boy. I'm here for my reward, I said. I did what I was asked to do. Now I want Nashoma back. Dad shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Mallison let out a humorless laugh and said, You haven't yet delivered on your promise. I followed Sophia to the Anachi Temple last night, I began. She performed a ceremony to talk to the Nadirai that made the prophecy, but she failed. Shawana Harjo refused to tell her how to fulfill it. The Kawigni elders have lost interest in her. They no longer consider her the chosen one and are already looking for another. A likely story, Mallison said, but Wells shushed him. Madam Wells stared at me intently, giving me the floor. I saw it with my own eyes. Sophia Henley told me all of this herself, I said directly. I have no reason to lie. She's no longer a threat to you. Now give me what I came for. We had a deal. This is preposterous, Mallison complained. You can't believe we'll take you at your word. Liam is right. We've wasted our time, Bain took my side. He pounded his fist into the desk, looking frustrated. I, for one, am ashamed that we focused our intentions on hurting an innocent 18-year-old girl. She is far from innocent. She is coigny, Mallison argued. Birth does not assign guilt. I will have no more part in it, Bane yelled. My duty is to protect the students of the institution where I teach. Sophia Henley is blameless, and I will not move to strike against her. Treason! Treason against the tribe, Mallison bellowed. Dad waved his hand to silence them. Everyone in the room looked to him. My son speaks the truth, he said wearily. But we are no further along than we were months ago. We need security, Mallison said. He did do as he was asked, Elder Poole said meekly, though he shrunk down in his chair as he said it. It doesn't matter, Mallison focused his sniveling gaze on me. The agreement was the Henley girl's life for your familiars. 
You still have to kill her. Do so or you'll leave here empty-handed. Make your decision, boy. I looked desperately to the faces on the council. Dad, Wells, Poole. But no one on the water council moved to say anything against Mallison. Not even Bane. All the elders looked at each other with shifting eyes, as if they were hiding some sort of unspoken pact. Everything I did over the past semester didn't matter. To the Toakwa elders, there could only be one outcome. Sophia could have nothing to do with the prophecy, but she was coigni, which meant in their eyes she deserved a death sentence. They still wanted me to execute her. They wouldn't bring Nishoma back until I did. I'd been a fool to not see it from the beginning. I had to make a decision, Nishoma or Sophia. But too late. My heart had already made it. You can take your deal and go to hell, I told them lowly. I'm done being used by you. Then I did it. I turned around and walked away from the last chance I'd ever have to bring Nishoma back to me. My footsteps were the only sound echoing through the shocked room. Treason! Mallison cried again, but no one moved to arrest me. I freely walked away and grabbed the double doors. Liam! Dad cried after me, but I barely heard him. I opened the double doors and blasted through the air chamber on the other side, ricocheting into the ocean. The water rushed around me as I forced my element to get me far, far away from here, as far as it would take me. I'd turned my back on my chief and my tribe. For what? I didn't really know. But it seemed like the right thing to do. It was a feeling in my gut, stronger than anything I'd felt in my entire life, that told me I'd done what needed to be done. Nashoma would have wanted me to do it. He would have been proud of me. I went back to my dorm and slept the entire day away. I didn't get up until it was dark again. I noticed a lot of things were already gone from my dorm. Ezra must have snuck in and taken some stuff back home for the summer while I was sleeping. Jonah had probably told him about me and Sophia. I was glad because that meant I didn't have to. I didn't want to pack up the rest of my stuff and go home just yet because I wanted to be alone. Also because I didn't know how I was going to face my dad. The school was pretty quiet. Most everyone had already gone home for the semester. I didn't know where I was going, but my feet seemed to know. I let myself wander around the halls of the school. I tried to think, but I'd been through so much in the past 24 hours my brain seemed to stop working. I saw them sitting on a collection of suitcases by the door near the grand entryway. Sophia and Imogen. Sassy was curled up on Sophia's feet, and Essis was on her shoulder, stroking her hair. Imogen had her arms wrapped around Sophia and was comforting her. The entryway was empty, except for them. I ducked behind a wall quickly so they couldn't see me. I knew I needed to walk away, but I couldn't help overhearing, and I already missed Sophia's voice, so I stuck around for a couple of minutes, just to try and record the memory of the sound so I could hold on to it a bit longer. Sophia was crying again. This is so awful. I feel like I'm dying. I can't believe he dumped me like that after everything. I hate him. I winced. Ouch, that hurt. You don't hate him, Sophia. Imogen paused. I wouldn't say this to just anyone after a breakup because I don't want to give you false hope, but I don't think you and Liam are going to be apart forever. You'll be together again someday. He loves you too much to stay away. I don't know if I want him to come back, Im. Sophia started sobbing harder. He broke my heart. He betrayed me in the worst possible way. I don't think we could ever be together again after all of this. I know, but a lot of couples go through stuff like this. They break up and get back together later when they're ready. It'll be all right, Imogen encouraged. Do all couples hide that they're trying to kill each other? Sophia wept. Well, no, Imogen admitted. But you two are different. You've got something special that only comes around once in a lifetime. You just need space right now. I don't know, Sophia sniffled. I don't know how to feel. Just give it time, Imogen said. 
Sassy yipped like she was in agreement. Liam will come back to you and you'll forgive him. You guys just need to find yourselves first. I couldn't listen to more. I forced myself to get away from there. I took a back door and headed outside. For whatever reason, my body led me to the mountains. Imogen's words repeated in my head as I walked up the path to the ancestral mountain, but it was hard to feel any emotion about them. I didn't know what the future held for me and Sophia. Right now, I couldn't imagine any possibility of us getting back together. We'd hurt each other so much. But I still hoped, and I hated myself for that, because I was the one who had ended our relationship in the first place. I was already regretting breaking up with her. It was the worst decision I'd ever made. But it wasn't like I could reach out to her and ask her to take me back now. She'd throw me out. She didn't want me. I'd broken her too badly. Like I'd said earlier, there was no coming back from what we'd done to each other, from what I'd done. I wanted to fix it. I just didn't know how. I sat on the edge of the mountain once I got to the top and looked down on Kinpago, lit up against the blackness of the night. Two dragons flew overhead having a flaming duel, and a few peritons sparred in the skies above Arenda. The castle looked especially pretty, glowing against the outline of the mountain range and the sea behind it. Liam? A voice I didn't know said my name. I turned around and I saw Carter standing there, Tiara was behind him, her purple scales glinting in the moonlight. The Yapluma and the familiar who came back from the dead. I had questions. Maybe Carter could help. Maybe he could tell me how the Tawakwa elders raised him back to life. Maybe how I could do it myself. I've been looking for you, Carter said. I need to tell you something. I got up from my spot on the ledge and walked over to him. Hey, what's up? He glanced down. I overheard your meeting with the Toakwa elders this morning, he said. They've been keeping me and Tiara prisoner in Serpent Assembly for the past few months. I just escaped, or rather your dad let me out without telling the other elders. He covered for me. I blanked out. I thought you were just in hiding so your house didn't discover you were still alive. No, Carter shook his head. But that's the thing, Liam. I never died. I had to repeat his words several times over in my head because they didn't translate right away. Huh? It was all a story. I'm really sorry for misleading you, but the Toakwa elders said they were going to kill me if I didn't tell you what you wanted to hear. Carter's voice shook. It was like he was afraid of telling me what was really going on. I needed to get to the bottom of this. Explain. Carter took a deep breath. Well, you see, when Tiara and me crash-landed in flight class, we were really hurt, critically injured, you know? Tiara was taken to the hospital, but I knew if she died, I was a goner too. I figured we were both going to die. He gave a shaky sigh. But then something weird happened. One moment we were in the hospital, and the next we both blacked out. When we woke up, it was a few months later, after the tournament in December. We'd been in a coma for weeks and had been treated by Tawakwa medicine men and women. Tiara was mostly healed and I was okay, though we still had some substantial injuries that took some time to recover from. Carter shook his head. I didn't realize until later that we'd woken up in serpent assembly in some sort of medical prison. Tawakwa had staged our deaths and made it look like we died, even to my parents. But we never did. Tiara made a purring sound in agreement. I was still having trouble comprehending. I don't understand. Liam, don't you get it? Carter asked. The Toakwa elders never had the power to bring back people from the dead. They knew you had seen Tiara fatally injured and faked my death. They used me to get to you. You were just a pawn. Ancestors. My father had lied to me. Bane had lied. The Tawakwa elders never had the power to bring the Shoma back. They'd used me, and I'd fallen for it. I'd lost Sophia because of it. The reality was so heavy that I stumbled against the mountainside, falling against the side of a boulder. Ancestors, I repeated. I'm really sorry, 
Carter apologized again. But they said if I told you the truth, they'd kill my entire family. My dad too? I asked. He was in on it. I don't know if it was his idea, Carter admitted. I know the chief's your dad, Liam, but he did help me escape. I think he's sorry for what he did. This was so incredibly hard to believe. Bane was supposed to be my mentor. My dad was supposed to be the one person who always protected me no matter what. And both of them had willingly gone along with a plan to deceive me in the worst possible way, to achieve a sadistic goal. I brushed my hair back and looked at Carter. What are you going to do now? I asked. I'm going on the run. I'll reach out to my best friend James and see if he and his familiar want to come with me, Carter said. I've already told my family I'm alive. They're leaving the city as soon as they can. Leaving the city, I repeated. Fuck, I felt so dumb right now. I was being slow on the uptake, but my mind just couldn't comprehend anymore. Yes, Carter nodded seriously. And if you're smart, you'll take your family and friends and get out of Kinpago before it's too late. What do you mean? I asked. My heartbeat picked up speed. The tribes always talked of war, but now it's getting... serious, Carter said. My jail cell was right next to the council room. I listened in on a lot of Tawakwa meetings. Liam, it's gonna get bad. People are gonna die. How can we stop it? I asked. You can't prevent it. The tribes are just waiting for an inciting event to make the next move, Carter said. It could happen any day now. Carter's words were heavy. I knew there was truth to them. Things had been different in Kinpago ever since Sophia had shown up. But I didn't think I could abandon my tribe. Not the Toakwa, because screw them, but the Hawkeye themselves. I couldn't abandon my people. If there was a chance I could save them, I had to fight. There must be some way, I insisted. Things are getting dark around here, Carter said. Arenda Academy is safe for now, but it won't be for much longer. Choose your side wisely. Carter turned and headed into the night, Tiara behind him. He looked over his shoulder and moved quickly, as if he thought he was already being chased. I slumped against the boulder and sank down to the ground with my hands cradling my head, struggling to comprehend the situation. I couldn't trust my dad, Bane, or anyone in my tribe. Carter was certain there was a war coming, and he acted like it would be the war that would end the Hawkeye for good. Like the only thing left for anyone to do was to desperately try to save themselves. Sophia had wanted to change things. I never thought we could, but now I saw that we had to. If the tribes didn't adapt, they were going to destroy each other. We were all going to die. I sat on something hard and fished in my pocket. I pulled out a small totem, the totem Sophia had dropped in the temple while we were running from the Hunped skin. I picked it up and meant to give it back to her later, but so much had happened that I'd completely forgotten about it, and now that we were broken up, I didn't know if I had the courage to face her again and return it, though I knew I had to eventually. I put my head back against the cool rock and looked up at the stars. Nishoma, what do I do? I didn't receive an immediate reply back, only silence. I closed my eyes, and I thought I heard a howl on the wind as, unexplainably, I drifted off to sleep. I heard the sounds of drums and flutes. I was wandering through the forest, but everything was painted in sharp colors. A black wolf was ahead of me, and he ran. I darted to keep up with him, moving throughout the shapes that formed the trees around us. Nishoma led me to a mountain. We climbed it, heading upward toward the skies. The sun and the moon chased each other up above, trying to unify in the heavens but never able to truly come together. There was a glowing light coming from inside the mountain. It was so similar, like I'd done this all before. I'd seen that light more than once. I jumped down the rocks to get to it, scaling the mountain, and Nishoma leapt after me. Our actions caused a landslide, and the rocks came barreling toward Nishoma. I screamed his name as the landslide came down. I immediately started awake, breathing hard. Sweat ran down my forehead, and I was gasping for breath. The totem was still clenched tightly in my hand. I put the pieces together quickly. 
It was a dream. A lot of people wouldn't make anything of it, but a true Hawkeye knew what it meant. Ancestors communicated in dreams. Nishoma was trying to tell me something. The totem. That's what I'd been pulled to the day Nishoma died. It had been the mysterious light I'd followed down the mountain, the strange force I couldn't pull away from. The tunnel Sophia and I had traveled through and found the totem in during the tournament had been the same mountain Nishoma had perished on, just different entrances. I didn't recognize it as the same place because there were two separate sides. I'd been trying to get to the totem that day he sacrificed himself for me. I hadn't realized it until now. Everything in my life had been shattered into pieces only minutes before, but now all the broken parts were falling into place. Nishoma was gone because his purpose had been fulfilled. Mine had yet to begin. Sophia. This was bigger than all of us. I didn't have anything left to live for except her. It didn't matter that we weren't together. It had always been her. I was a man with nothing to lose. That made me dangerous. I wasn't going to be a puppet for anyone anymore. From now on, I made my own decisions. Sophia was my decision. I'd promised to help her find the other pieces of the prophecy. I'd promised I'd help her fulfill her destiny, whatever that was. Nishoma had given his life to make sure that happened, and I wasn't going to let that sacrifice be in vain. When the time came, I'd return the totem to Sophia and keep it safe for her until then. She was my reason for existing. I was still here because the ancestors had chosen me to help her bring forth or stop whatever hell the future had in store for us. That's why I hadn't died when Nishoma did. It wasn't yet my time. I still had work to do. A war was coming, and Sophia was going to be right in the middle of it, along with all of my friends. Damn the consequences. Sophia Henley was more than just my destiny. She was my legacy, and I'd die to defend that. So help anyone who got in my way. This story will continue in The Earth Legend, Academy of Magical Creatures, Book 3. A note from the authors. The Academy of Magical Creatures series is part of the Hidden Legends universe, a paranormal fantasy world created by authors Megan Linsky and Alicia Raddis. Included in this universe are the following series, the University of Sorcery series, the College of Witchcraft series, and the Prison for Supernatural Offenders series, with more to come. Each Hidden Legends novel features magical romances with disabled characters fighting for a better world. You can find out more about the Hidden Legends universe by going to www.hiddenlegendsbooks.com. This has been The Water Legacy. Hidden Legends, Academy of Magical Creatures, Book 2. Written by Megan Linsky and Alicia Raddis. Narrated by Jennifer Gilleraya and Graham Halstead. Copyright 2019 by Megan Linsky and Alicia Raddis. Production Copyright 2019 by Tantor Media, a division of Recorded Books. Recording Copyright 2021 by Megan Linsky and Alicia Raddis.